In the spring of 2021, a pair of police officers from the NYPD's 106th precinct in Ozone Park became ensnared in an internal sting operation that ultimately lost them their jobs. Officer Michael Sardoni initially became the target of an investigation in February of that same year. An undercover officer reportedly approached him under the pretense that she was a high-end escort. She asked if Sardoni would be willing to drive her and some other women to their various meetups that night, as their regular driver was supposedly sick. The officer agreed to provide the escorts with transportation for $1,000 in payment. Sardoni also indicated that one of his colleagues, Officer Thomas Diorio, would be willing to assist them as well. On three separate occasions in April and May, Diorio and Sardoni allegedly met the escorts in the parking lot of a local diner before driving them to and from hotels in Manhattan and Queens, receiving multiple thousands of dollars for their service. On an evening in mid-May, the two officers were told by one of the women that they might need to come up to the room to defend her in case things went awry. Diorio and Sardoni reportedly agreed to the plan. Shortly thereafter, the cops received a text message indicating the woman's client was refusing to pay. They went up to the room to sort things out, and the uncooperative client ultimately acquiesced because he thought Diorio looked like a tough guy. One of the women then took several baggies which she identified as coke into the car with the policeman. Sardoni, who was once named Cop of the Month back in 2015, retired from his position when the details of his misconduct came to light. Diorio, meanwhile, faced a disciplinary hearing which culminated in his dismissal from the force. Number 6. Zoe Phillips and Andrew Perry In September of 2020, a disciplinary hearing was held in connection with the alleged misconduct of two officers from the Gwent Police Force in Caerphilly, Wales. 32-year-old Zoe Phillips, a school liaison officer, and 35-year-old Andrew Perry, a traffic specialist, were accused of repeatedly engaging in intimate activities while on duty. The two police constables' physical relationship reportedly began in early 2018. On a number of occasions thereafter, Phillips, a mother of one, and Perry, a married father of three, met up for secret trysts on company time. They would drive separately to an agreed-upon location, often somewhere remote, where they would have relations with one another inside police vehicles. During the resulting hearing, a panel heard that Phillips and Perry had their ability to respond to emergency calls severely inhibited by their remote rendezvous, an anonymous tipster informed the constable's superiors of their affair, leading to an internal investigation into the matter. After their misconduct had come to light, Phillips and Perry resigned from the force. The disciplinary panel ultimately ruled that the pair's actions amounted to gross misconduct and consequently barred them from serving in law enforcement positions in the future. Number 5. Michael Cheff The ringleader of a so-called robbery squad within the Patterson Police Department in New Jersey ended up receiving a multi-year prison sentence for the crimes he committed on the force. Michael Cheff, at the time in his late 40s, was a Patterson Police Sergeant who'd been on the job since 1996. He reportedly oversaw a group of officers who routinely violated the rights of citizens and robbed them under the guise of police procedure. As was detailed in court, Chef's robbery squad would often stop and search vehicles without any justification before stealing cash and other valuables from the occupants. The corrupt officers would also seize money from random people on the street or in buildings around Patterson. The illegal activities continued without any suspicions being raised within the department because of Sergeant Chef's willingness to cover for his subordinates. Chef would submit inaccurate police reports that omitted or falsified the officer's actions. For his role in covering up the scheme, the man would receive a portion of the money stolen from innocent people. On November the 14th of 2017, Chef personally joined three members of the robbery squad for an illegal seizure. The officers arrested an individual before going to their apartment and fraudulently obtaining a consent to search form by lying to the individual's mother. When the policeman rummaged through the apartment, the arrestee was left handcuffed in the patrol car. Chef allegedly pilfered money and narcotics from a safe inside the residence. An internal investigation eventually led to the discovery of the robbery squad's activities. Chef was consequently charged with conspiracy to deprive persons of civil rights and falsification of a police report of which he was ultimately found guilty. The other members of the robbery squad were identified as Yudi Ramos, Daniel Pent, Jonathan Bustios, Matthew Torres, and Frank Toledo. They were each arrested 
and later entered guilty pleas. In September of 2022, Chef was sentenced to 33 months behind bars for his crimes. Number 4. Caitlin Howarth 21-year-old Caitlin Howarth, a West Yorkshire police constable, was suspended in November of 2021 following the emergence of allegations that she had an affair with her married commanding officer, Chief Superintendent Daniel Greenwood, aged 38. The latter was likewise suspended, pending the findings of an investigation by West Yorkshire Police's Professional Standards Directorate. At the time, Howarth was reportedly working as a probationary officer. Anti-corruption detectives began investigating her after it surfaced that she'd previously dated a drug kingpin, now behind bars for dealing heroin. The young constable's family challenged reports that she was seriously involved with the criminal, claiming she'd only gone on one date with him. Howarth's uncle, Michael Chapman, told the press that she had no knowledge of the man's criminal activities. During the course of their brief involvement, nevertheless, her fling with the unnamed heroin dealer ultimately shed light on her affair with Chief Superintendent Greenwood as well. Updates provided in January of 2023 indicated that internal investigators from the West Yorkshire Police Force were still looking into Howard's relationship with her superior. Number 3. Rebecca Swanston English policewoman Rebecca Swanston from Portsmouth, Hampshire, was dismissed from the force in November of 2012. The 28-year-old, it emerged, had been engaged in intimate relationships with suspected and known criminals in Southampton. An internal investigation found that Swanston had accessed intelligence from police information systems while based at Southampton Central Police Station. She then used that information to advise criminal associates about their notoriety and police tactics, thereby allowing them to avoid detection. It was later reported that at least two men had confided in Swanston about their criminal activities, including a machete attack, but she allegedly neglected to pass the information along to her colleagues. The accusations against Swanston had far-reaching consequences that extended beyond the termination of her career in law enforcement. The revelation of her corrupt activities reportedly led to a case against two suspected drug dealers being thrown out because her evidence had served as a key part of the prosecution's case. One of the dealers then went on to supply drugs to an individual who died after taking them. Swanston was fired after incriminating conversations with criminal associates were covertly recorded in her home. At Winchester Crown Court, she pleaded guilty to three counts of misconduct in a public office between January and October of 2012 and was consequently jailed for three years. Number 2. Shonton Harris, Kelvin Harris and James Archibald on October the 23rd of 2018, Florida officials announced that a trio of Miami police officers were facing federal narcotics charges after a citizen's complaint led to an FBI and internal affairs investigation. The corrupt cops were identified as Shonton Harris and Kelvin Harris, of no relation, as well as James Archibald. The officers allegedly took part in an elaborate scheme to shield money launderers and drug traffickers from law enforcement scrutiny in exchange for cash providing them with protection and transportation. Additionally, Shonton Harris was accused of both using and distributing illicit substances. She was said to have rigged the drug testing system so that she would be able to provide a clear sample in the event that the department requested her to be tested. She also allegedly sold a City of Miami police uniform and badge to an undercover investigator for $1,500, believing the disguise would be used by a hitman to kill someone on behalf of a drug dealer. In a press conference, U.S. Attorney Ariana Fajardo Orshan heavily criticized the officers' actions, saying they committed the very crimes that they have a duty to investigate, to report, and to help prosecute. Orshan went on to detail that Shonton Harris had received $17,000 for providing police protection to criminals, while Kelvin Harris received $10,000 and Archibald received $6,500. The three accused officers were charged with conspiracy to possess cocaine with the intent to distribute, attempting to possess cocaine with intent to distribute, and using a firearm during and in relation to a drug trafficking crime. They were each held in custody on $200,000 bonds. In April of 2019, a Justice Department press release revealed that Shonton Harris had been sentenced to 15 and a half years in prison after reaching a plea deal with prosecutors. Kelvin Harris and Archibald brought their cases to trial where they were both ultimately convicted, Harris received a prison term of 27 and a half years, while Archibald was ordered to spend 10 years behind bars. 
number one, Gerald Goines. In January of 2019, Officer Gerald Goines from the Houston Police Department attempted to obtain a no-knock search warrant for a residence on Hardin Street in the Pekang Park area of the city's East End District. The department had received a tip from a local resident that Dennis Wayne Tuttle and Regina Ann Nicholas, who lived together at the home in question, were in possession of illegal drugs and machine guns. As it would later emerge, the tipster was actually just a disgruntled next-door neighbor who'd fabricated the allegations in retaliation for past disagreements with Tuttle and Nicholas. Nevertheless, Officer Goins pushed hard for the no-knock warrant, even going so far as to lie about having a confidential informant who could verify the accusations. After securing the warrant, Goins arranged the heavily armed and high-stakes Harding Street raid for January the 28th. Upon entering the home, officers gunned down the couple's dog before fatally shooting both Tuttle and Nicholas as well. There were no drugs or weapons found at the residence. In the aftermath, Officer Goins and other members of the Houston Police Department faced heavy backlash for the raid, with the Houston Chronicle describing the incident as one of the worst scandals to hit the HPD in years. During the summer of 2019, a grand jury indicted Goins on two counts of felony murder, as well as counts of making false statements and depriving the victim's constitutional right to be secure against unreasonable searches. As a direct result of the controversy, Houston police conducted a systematic review of approximately 14,000 cases which had been handled by the officers in Goins' unit. Houston man Frederick Jeffrey had previously been sentenced to 25 years behind bars for possessing five grams of methamphetamine. Following the Harding Street raid fiasco, Jeffrey was released from prison after it was determined that Goings had falsified evidence and perjured himself to secure a conviction in the case. In early 2023, Native American actor Nathan Chasing Horse, who was born on the Rosebud Indian Reservation, was accused of assaulting indigenous girls over the course of roughly two decades. 46-year-old Chasing Horse, best known for his role in the Kevin Costner-led Best Picture winner Dances with Wolves, gained a reputation as a so-called medicine man and holy person among tribes across the United States and in Canada, claiming to perform healing ceremonies. According to investigators, he used his power and influence to create a cult-like group called The Circle, which he used to prey on young women. The assault allegations against Chasing Horse dated back to the early 2000s. His followers reportedly offered their teen daughters for him to take as wives. Following an investigation in late 2022, SWAT officers raided the man's North Las Vegas home on January the 31st of 2023. During the course of the raid, officials seized memory cards containing videos of the assaults, multiple firearms, 41 pounds of marijuana, and psychedelic mushrooms. Chasing Horse was subsequently arrested and booked into the Clark County Jail, with his bond later set at $300,000. On February the 8th, he was charged with exploitation of children, among other serious offenses. Two weeks later, a Nevada grand jury indicted him on 19 charges that included kidnapping, lewdness, drug trafficking, assault, and child abuse. As of the latest developments, Chasing Horse had pleaded not guilty to assaulting two women in Clark County and was facing criminal prosecution in both Montana and Canada. Number 8. Lonnie Willison After a tumultuous two-year marriage between former Baywatch actor Jeremy Jackson and fitness model Lonnie Willison, the latter appeared to be homeless as she was spotted pushing a shopping cart through the streets of Los Angeles. In December of 2012, the 29-year-old woman tied the knot with Jackson in Laguna Beach. While the 32-year-old actor was intoxicated in August of 2014, he allegedly strangled and beat Willison in their bedroom during the course of an argument. Willison was left with two broken ribs, an injured neck and scratches on her face and body in the aftermath. Los Angeles officers were called to the scene and arrested Jackson, who was consequently accused of attempted murder. However, the case was dropped when Willison decided not to press charges, saying she was scared of a potential retaliation on Jackson's part. After their divorce, Willison reportedly suffered a mental breakdown worsened by addictions to alcohol and crystal meth. In 2018, she was barely recognizable, as images of her rummaging through a shopping cart filled with her belongings surfaced online. In a YouTube interview published in May of 2023, Willison blamed her ex for her precipitous downfall. Number 7. Vanessa Marquez 
Actress Vanessa Marquez's active career in the 90s eventually came to an end due to serious mental health issues, including bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and agoraphobia. In 2018, she was reported to also be suffering from celiac disease, fibromyalgia, seizures, and depression. On August the 30th of that year, her friend reportedly called the fire department in South Pasadena, California because Marquez was experiencing seizures. The caller requested paramedics and mental health experts to be sent to the woman's residence. Responding police officers found Marquez's home in utter disarray. When they found the former actress upstairs, they urged her to go to a hospital for treatment. An argument ensued when she subsequently refused. The woman allegedly pulled a BB gun out of her purse at one point. She aimed it at the officers, prompting them to retreat downstairs. Police body cam footage revealed that Marquez pleaded with the officers to kill her as she continued to point the BB gun at them. Ultimately, two officers who thought the weapon was a real firearm shot her a total of 12 times. She was taken to a hospital where she succumbed to gunshot wounds in her torso shortly after 2.30 p.m. No criminal charges were brought against the officers involved in the shooting, who insisted they thought Marquez posed a threat to their safety. The deceased woman's mother filed a wrongful death claim against the city of South Pasadena in February of 2019. The suit was settled for a reported $450,000 two years later. Number 6. Jennifer Shah A 49-year-old American television personality from Salt Lake City, Utah, pleaded guilty to a conspiracy criminal charge in 2022. Jennifer Shah, who was a cast member of the reality television series The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, played an integral role in a nationwide telemarketing scam that began targeting people in 2012. Many of the victims were elderly people, who Shah and her co-conspirators were able to defraud repeatedly until nothing was left in their bank accounts. Following the arrest of her accomplices, the TV personality was taken into custody on March 30th of 2021, charged with two offenses related to conspiracy. A week later, she pleaded not guilty to both charges and was released on a $1 million personal recognizance bond with a $250,000 cash security. After changing her plea to guilty on July the 11th of the following year, the judge agreed to drop the additional charge of conspiracy to commit money laundering. On January the 8th of 2023, Shah was sentenced to 78 months of incarceration and ordered to forfeit $6,500,000, 30 luxury items and 78 counterfeit luxury items. She was also required to pay over $6 million in restitution. Number 5. Chris Wu A 30-year-old Chinese-Canadian singer and actor was arrested following the emergence of assault allegations posted on social media by a 19-year-old Chinese woman named Mei Zhu Du on July the 8th of 2021. Through the social media platform Weibo, Du claimed that Chris Wu took advantage of her while she was intoxicated at his home on December the 5th of 2020. She went on to write that there were seven other victims as well. Wu denied the claims, but multiple companies for which he served as a brand ambassador subsequently cut ties with him. On July the 31st, Beijing Chaoyang District Police detained Wu and formally arrested him 16 days later on suspicion of assault. In November of the following year, the Chaoyang District People's Court convicted Wu of assault and assembling a crowd to engage in promiscuous activities. He was sentenced to a total of 13 years in prison and deportation from China upon his release. As of the latest updates, Wu appealed for a second trial in February of 2023 after finding a new witness to testify against Du. Number 4. Marie Avgaropoulos In the early hours of August the 5th of 2018, Canadian actress Marie Avgaropoulos was arrested for injuring her 41-year-old boyfriend. The incident occurred while the couple were traveling along the 134 freeway in Glendale, California. A verbal argument ensued between the two, culminating in 32-year-old Avgaropoulos striking her partner several times, causing minor injuries to his head, neck and arm. The victim then called 911 and Avgaropoulos was arrested at approximately 1.15 a.m. The woman who starred in the post-apocalyptic sci-fi television series The Hundred was booked into jail on a domestic violence charge shortly before 2.30 a.m. Later that morning, her boyfriend posted her $50,000 bail and pushed for the charges to be dropped. The attack was allegedly triggered by an adverse reaction she was having to medication, and on September the 17th, she pleaded not guilty. The case was formally dismissed 
in December after prosecutors accepted that there was no intentional act of violence. Number 3. Alison Mack In April of 2018, American actress Alison Mack was accused of committing various crimes as a high-ranking member of the cult Nexium. Founded in 1998, the New York-based organization operated under the guise of a corporation that offered executive success programs. After Mack joined Nexium in 2006, she eventually worked her way up to becoming second in command to Keith Ranier. According to prosecutors, Mack created a secret female-only subgroup within Nexium that recruited other women as slaves behind the facade of female empowerment. Unbeknownst to many of the recruits, Mack would allegedly order them to be intimate with Ranier and send him nude photographs once they joined the group. In exchange for her loyalty, Mack received various benefits including money. In 2017, several former Nexium members exposed the group's cult-like operation, eventually giving way to Ranier's arrest in March of 2018. A month later, on April the 20th, Mack was apprehended by the FBI in Brooklyn on charges of trafficking, trafficking conspiracy and forced labor conspiracy. Following her release from the Metropolitan Detention Center on a $5 million bond, she was held under house arrest in California in the custody of her parents. A year later, 35-year-old Mack pleaded guilty to racketeering and racketeering conspiracy and admitted extortion and forced labor under state law. During her sentencing on June the 30th of 2021, she only received a three-year prison term to be followed by three years of probation. The maximum punishment for her various charges was reported as 14 years of incarceration. The U.S. attorney credited Mack for the detailed information she provided during the investigation and prosecution of other Nexium members. In addition to her prison sentence, she was ordered to perform a thousand hours of community service and pay a fine of $20,000. Number two, Michelle Melody. 20-year-old TikTok influencer Michelle Melody, who accumulated nearly a million followers with her online content, was arrested after allegedly stabbing her boyfriend in August of 2022. The attack in question unfolded at the young woman's apartment in Thurgau, Switzerland, during the course of a domestic dispute. The unnamed 19-year-old victim was seriously injured and rushed to a hospital where surgery was performed to mend his multiple stab wounds. Fortunately, he was discharged the following day. Melody later posted online saying, He asked me if I'm bad. I said I'm the worst. In early September of 2022, her arrest was confirmed by the local public prosecutor's office, though no further information was provided at that time. Number 1. Cara Delevingne Prominent model and actress Cara Delevingne exhibited erratic behavior on September the 5th of 2022, which landed her in national headlines and caused many of her fans to grow concerned for her well-being. On the day in question, as the 30-year-old was making her way to Van Nuys Airport in a Chevy Suburban, her feet were reportedly dangling from the window as the car made its way through traffic. She arrived two hours late for a flight on Jay-Z's private plane. Moments later, Delavine deboarded the plane for unclear reasons. She appeared jittery as she subsequently talked on her cell phone and dropped the device several times. Meanwhile, her bags were unloaded from the plane and placed back into the SUV. Footage of the incident left fans bewildered and concerned for the woman. In a comment posted online, one of her fans asked, What's going on with Cara Delavine? I feel so sad for her. Six months later, Delavine informed Vogue magazine that childhood trauma had caused her to spiral into alcohol and drug addiction. She reportedly spent most of her younger years looking after her bipolar and heroin-addicted mother, which she attributed to her damaged mental state. On March the 9th of 2023, CNN reported that Delavine was four months sober after undergoing treatment that incorporated meditation and yoga. A pair of Instagram influencers were caught driving through Alabama with $3 million worth of cocaine in their possession on June the 1st of 2023. 34-year-old singer and rapper Raquel Marie Dolores Antiola met up with 36-year-old fitness entrepreneur Melissa DeFore in Miami. According to Antiola's account, they subsequently drove to Houston for a house party where they got very intoxicated before heading to Atlanta. 
After committing a traffic violation on Interstate 110, the pair were pulled over. During the traffic stop, a canine indicated that drugs might be in their black Ford Expedition. Officers combed through the vehicle and found 216 pounds of cocaine packed in 84 bundles hidden beneath the floorboards. The car had reportedly been modified specifically to hide the drugs. Antiola and DeFour were taken into custody on federal drug trafficking charges. They were booked at the Mobile County Metro Jail on $1 million bonds. They were facing at least 10 years of incarceration as punishment. Number 8. Camilla Marodin in mid-November of 2021, Brazilian model and social media influencer Camila Marodin was arrested on suspicion of orchestrating her husband's murder. For several years, military police had been investigating a criminal organization in the coastal town of Matinhos in the Brazilian state of Parana. According to the commander of the Parana military police, the crime group was involved in such illicit activities as drug trafficking and money laundering. During the course of law enforcement's efforts to stop the organization in question, 39 weapons were seized and 14 suspects were apprehended. Police initially believed that Camilla's husband, Ricardo Morodin, was the leader of the organization, but on November the 7th, he was fatally shot in the middle of his son's birthday party. Four armed suspects reportedly arrived in a silver Volkswagen Voyage and fired multiple shots at Ricardo, who died at the scene. Following his death, Camilla was appointed head of the organization. When questioned by police, the model told authorities that her husband wasn't involved in any criminal activity and claimed that his death was probably a case of mistaken identity. Three days later, two former policemen were slain under similar circumstances. Camilla was arrested on the morning of November the 12th at her mother's residence, where a Glock pistol buried in the garden was recovered. Authorities then uncovered 13 houses worth more than half a million dollars and five luxury cars belonging to Camilla. Additionally, suspicious payments to the tune of $240,000 were discovered in her bank account, which was consequently frozen. Prosecutors accused the suspect of trafficking, money laundering, and criminal enterprise. It was unclear if she was found guilty of the charges, but in the month following her detainment, Camilla was put under house arrest, during which she was ordered to wear an ankle tag. Number 7. Damori McCoola Florida social media celebrity Damori McCoola told police that he could do whatever he wanted after leading them on a high-speed car chase on October the 29th of 2021. The 18-year-old, who had 4 million followers on TikTok, was reportedly driving his grey Dodge Challenger along State Road 54 in Odessa when he stopped at a red light. He proceeded to run the red light within sight of a nearby trooper in a patrol car. The trooper reportedly chased McCoola at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour, eventually following him back to his home. McCoola was subsequently arrested in his driveway without incident. As police read him his Miranda rights, he flaunted the large amount of money he'd been making as an influencer, as though it might make a difference in his pending criminal fight. Before being taken to jail, the teen told authorities he knew he was being chased and admitted that his lifestyle wasn't a good way to live. McCoola was booked into the Pasco County Jail and charged with eluding police with disregard for the safety of persons or property, reckless driving, and racing on a highway. According to the arrest report, he was released on an $11,500 bond the following day. Number 6. Maxim Layuti Russian authorities detained a Sochi lifestyle influencer and his partner in early 2023 after their newborn child starved to death. 43-year-old Maxim Layuti, who was known for promoting radical eating habits, wanted to raise the child on a prana eating diet, which involved going without food and water and only feeding on sunlight. When the baby boy was apparently suffering from emaciation, the blogger and his partner, 33-year-old Oksana Miranova, attempted to take him to the hospital before making it there. However, the infant succumbed to starvation and pneumonia. After looking into the child's death, Russia's investigative committee launched a criminal investigation. In March, both parents were arrested. Layuti was detained for two months under suspicion of child torture, while Miranova was placed on a two-month house arrest, accused of negligence. According to Miranova's family, she was a slave to Layuti, who was running a sect. Number 5. Mona Fires Montrage over $2 million was swindled from older American men and women by 30-year-old Mona Fayez Montrage. 
the Ghanaian social media influencer who at one point between 2013 and 2019 had around 3.4 million followers, was involved with a group of con artists from West Africa who assumed fake identities to trick people into sending them money. They trapped victims in a romance scam using emails, texts, and social media messages, making them think that they were in a blossoming relationship. Under false pretenses, the scammers would have the victims transfer money to them. In one case, Montrage allegedly duped a man who believed they were married under tribal law into sending her $89,000 through several wire transfers. The millions of dollars collected during the course of the scheme was then laundered to other members of the enterprise. The efforts of multiple law enforcement agencies ultimately gave way to Montrage's arrest in the UK on November 10th of 2022. She was charged with conspiracy, wire fraud, money laundering, and receipt of stolen money. On May the 12th of the following year, she was extradited to the US. Three days later, Montrage pleaded not guilty in Manhattan Federal Court and was set to be released on home detention on a $500,000 bond. She was reportedly required to wear an ankle monitor. Her attorney told the New York Post that she was only permitted to travel in certain parts of New York and New Jersey while her case involving six alleged victims was pending. Number 4. Ray Diaz 33-year-old California man Ray Diaz was arrested in 2019 after his own social media posts caught the attention of the Los Angeles Police Department. Rumors of impropriety had swelled around the Instagram influencer since 2018 when he posted an Instagram video of himself kissing teen model Angelica Salek. The matter came to a head when Salek ran away from home in July of 2019 and her mother accused Diaz of having something to do with it. The mother posted a horrifying video clip on July the 5th in which Diaz was screaming at Salek as she sobbed. Law enforcement executed a search warrant at Diaz's home but didn't find Salek. Days later, she safely returned to her mother's home and said she'd been with Diaz. In an interview posted on YouTube, Salek claimed that Diaz had hidden her in a secret compartment under a mattress while police were searching the home. After the interview was published, investigators looked into the claims and eventually arrested Diaz on suspicion of assault. He was booked into the LAPD jail division on multiple charges that included unlawful intercourse, dissuading a witness from reporting a crime, and injuring a cohabitant. In connection with a separate incident that surfaced involving his girlfriend, Diaz was additionally charged with misdemeanor battery. He pleaded not guilty to the charges and posted his $500,000 bail. Number 3. Natalie Hodson Shortly after 9pm on August the 8th of 2022, Natalie Hodson from Boise, Idaho was driving on Highway 55 when she collided with a pedestrian. Leading up to the incident, which took place between Beacon Light and Siemens Gulch Road, 39-year-old Christina Rowley was standing on the side of the road as she checked the back of her trailer. Meanwhile, 33-year-old Hodson was driving her minivan and failed to notice Rowley and consequently plowed into her. Hodson continued to travel north after the collision, while emergency responders found the victim badly injured. Paramedics subsequently took Rowley to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. After being tailed by an eyewitness, Hodson pulled over on Subtle Lake Drive where deputies later interviewed her. She claimed that she thought she'd hit a mailbox and that prior to the crash, she'd consumed four seltzers. She was taken into custody and booked at the Ada County Jail early the next day. She was charged with vehicular manslaughter and leaving the scene of an injury crash. The social media influencer was set free after posting a $50,000 bond. During her arraignment on December the 15th, prosecutors alleged that Hodson was driving under the influence of alcohol with a blood alcohol concentration of 0.098, which exceeded the legal limit for driving. Two weeks later, she entered a not guilty plea to the charges levied against her. After she waived her right to a speedy trial, her trial was scheduled for October of 2023. As part of the pre-trial release conditions, Hodson was required to remain in Ada, Boise or Custer counties and wasn't allowed to drive or be in possession of drugs or alcohol. Number 2. Karina Lionel Gomez Surveillance video captured 27-year-old TikTok influencer Karina Lionel Gomez and her associates carrying out robberies in Brazil. The group caught the attention of authorities in Rio de Janeiro who began monitoring them in May of 2023. Investigators said that Gomez would try to get her targets and let their guard down before another member robbed them at gunpoint. On June the 7th, 
The security team at a bank in the Rialengo neighborhood tipped authorities off about a suspicious car parked outside. Subsequently, police arrived at the scene, causing Gomez and her boyfriend, who'd also been involved in the robberies, to flee. However, officers apprehended them immediately and confiscated a 38 caliber handgun. The couple admitted to the robberies and disclosed the names of their accomplices. They remained in police custody while the investigation was underway. Number 1. Yesim Aydin and Simga Barankolu, two Turkish Instagram stars, were detained after being accused of defrauding hundreds of their followers through an online scam in 2021. Influencers Yesim Aydin and Simga Barankolu would allegedly inform social media users that they'd won a cash prize but could only claim it by paying a certain amount in taxes first. Aydin and Baron Kolu, together with their co-conspirators, gathered more than $300,000 from at least 250 victims over a six-month period. After law enforcement raided several Turkish provinces, they seized a number of mobile phones, computers, SD cards, and other equipment allegedly used in the scheme. The two influencers, along with 18 other suspects, were arrested on November the 9th of 2021. Aydin and Baron Kolu insisted that they'd only accepted offers to do advertisements without knowing it had been an organized scam. In a statement, Aydin said that she would have never taken part in any of it had she known that fraud was being committed. While Baron Kolu denied her involvement outright, as of the latest updates, Aydin and Baron Kolu had been released pending trial following a court hearing on January the 7th of 2022. On the evening of July the 26th of 2015, decapitated human remains were found near a pond at house number 10 on Dimitrov Street in the Russian city of St. Petersburg. The following day, authorities established the identity of the deceased, whose severed limbs had been wrapped in a bathroom curtain and left alongside the rest of the body. The victim was 79-year-old Valentina Nikolaevna Yulanova, a nearby resident. When they knocked on Yulanova's apartment, the door was answered by a different woman identified as Tamara Samsonova, who'd reportedly been living with the victim. Upon searching the home, law enforcement found traces of blood in Yulinova's bathroom and also noticed that the shower curtain had been torn off. Following this discovery, officers moved to arrest Samsonova on suspicion of murder. She was brought to the Frunza District Court of St. Petersburg, where she was ordered to undergo a forensic psychiatric examination. The 68-year-old grandmother was determined to be a threat to both herself and the rest of society and was therefore detained at a specialized institution while the police investigated her. During a raid of the woman's apartment, authorities discovered a series of diary entries detailing upwards of 14 other murders. Samsonova subsequently dubbed both Granny Ripper and the Baba Yaga would allegedly dismember her victims and consume their body parts. Among the individuals Samsonova targeted, according to her diary, was a tenant of hers who'd gone missing back in 2003 as well as her late husband, who disappeared without a trace in 2000. The elderly serial killer openly confessed to her crimes, indicating she wanted to be punished to the full extent of the law. Number 7. Peggy O'Neill On July the 14th of 2019, a fire broke out at a house off Chamberlain Drive in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. The blaze caused smoke and heat damage throughout the home, much of which was concentrated in the back bedroom where authorities determined the fire had started. Following further investigation, it was concluded that the fire had been ignited intentionally by the home's occupants, who'd left a lit candle next to a doll clothed in yarn. 28-year-old Ashley Barner was arrested but subsequently implicated her grandmother in the alleged plot as well. Consequently, law enforcement also took 80-year-old Peggy O'Neill into custody on the same charges as her granddaughter, which included conspiracy to commit arson and insurance fraud. They were held at the Rutherford County Adult Detention Center on a $100,000 bond each. Number 6. Hester Jordan Burkhalter and Lena Bachula Tennessee grandmother Hester Jordan Burkhalter was visiting Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom on April the 15th of 2019, when she found herself under the scrutiny of local law enforcement. According to subsequent reports, the 69-year-old was busted bringing CBD oil into the theme park. The hemp-derived substance was discovered after she placed her purse on the security table for inspection and the oil tested positive for THC. Despite the fact that Bacalta had purchased the CBD legally and even had a doctor's note indicating it was meant to treat her arthritis, she was nevertheless detained by the park's guards 
before being taken into police custody. As mentioned in documents from the Orange County Sheriff's Office, she initially faced the charge of possession of hashish, a felony in the state of Florida. The situation mirrored that of 71-year-old Lena Bachula, a Texas grandmother who spent multiple nights behind bars under similar circumstances. Back in 2018, Bachula had been caught with CBD oil at the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. Also facing a felony drug charge, the woman, an accomplished artist, spent the night in the airport's detention center before being transported to the Tarrant County Jail in Fort Worth for another night. In the end, both Burkhalter and Bartula had their cases dropped. Number 5. Edna Faye Daniels Shortly before midnight on January the 24th of 2023, a fatal shooting unfolded at 135 Meadow Street in Georgetown County, South Carolina. According to the local sheriff's office, a suspect identified as 30-year-old Ryan O'Neill Woodruff was detained at the scene and subsequently held at the county detention center on murder charges. The victim, 19-year-old Tyquise Demetrius Walker, was found lying face down in the kitchen, having sustained a shotgun wound. He was pronounced dead at the scene. In the days that followed, law enforcement also began zeroing in on Woodruff's grandmother, Edna Faye Daniels, whom they accused of helping to cover up her grandson's crime. The 78-year-old woman had allegedly tried to conceal the incident, which was committed inside her house from the authorities, and consequently faced charges of obstruction of justice and accessory after the fact to murder. At the time, her grandson was out on bond after getting arrested for an unrelated double murder in May of 2021. He'd allegedly beaten two of his relatives to death inside their home with a hammer and crowbar. As of the latest developments, Woodruff's murder charges as well as his grandmother's related charges were all still pending. Number 4. Sarah Griffin 68-year-old Sarah Griffin visited her jailed grandson, Cody Clements, at the Shelby County Corrections Facility in Memphis, Tennessee in early March of 2018. At one point during the visit, a corrections officer observed the woman hand Clements a bag of Doritos, at which point he removed a small black object from inside before giving her the bag back. The officer confiscated the object and, upon unrolling it, found several individually wrapped bags containing various illegal substances. In all, Authorities recovered 28.5 grams of methamphetamine, 11.4 grams of marijuana, 40 Xanax pills, 1.7 grams of ecstasy, and 1.1 grams of heroin from the bundle. Griffin admitted to picking the illicit package up from an unknown individual hours before her visit, but she claimed to be under the belief that it was a cell phone rather than drugs. Nevertheless, she was charged with taking contraband into a penal facility. The grandmother spent three days in jail before being released, but her charges carry a maximum sentence of six years in prison if convicted. Number 3. Ella Marie Sanders Two students from Texas High School in Texarkana, Texas, got into a heated argument and eventually came to blows on January the 31st of 2023, leading to them both getting suspended. The teens subsequently brought their dispute off campus and on February the 1st, the situation reached an escalation point. One of the students was driven to the other's house by his grandmother, at which point they were met by the rival teen and his grandmother, 71-year-old Helen Marie Sanders. At one point during the ensuing confrontation, Sanders allegedly went inside to retrieve a firearm for her grandson. She handed the weapon, a 9mm pistol, to the teen who threatened the other party and fired a shot in their direction as they retreated in their vehicle. In the aftermath, both Sanders and her grandson were arrested and charged with deadly conduct. The teen was taken to a juvenile detention facility while his grandmother spent some time at the Bi-State Justice Center in Texarkana before being released on a $7,500 bond. The other student and his grandmother weren't criminally charged in connection with the incident. Number 2. Patricia Ebel After a day at the pool in April of 2015, Florida woman Patricia Ebel got behind the wheel of her BMW and made her way back home, with her 10-year-old grandson in the back seat. At some point during the drive, 49-year-old Ebel violently rear-ended a vehicle that was stopped at the intersection of Golden Gate Parkway and Livingston Road in Naples. Fortunately, all parties involved came away with minimal injuries. Responding deputies from the Collier County Sheriff's Office immediately noted 
that the woman who was still wearing only a bikini from the pool appeared to be intoxicated. She was administered a field sobriety test which resulted in the bizarre image captured by a local news crew of the scantily clad grandmother performing the examination in the middle of the street. Ebel failed the test and smelled quite strongly of alcohol, so the officers decided to place her under arrest on suspicion of DUI. Her blood alcohol level was later determined to have been twice the legal driving limit. Ebel made headlines again the following January when she failed a sobriety test administered by her probation officer. The terms of her probation, which was implemented following the first arrest, stipulated that she needed to abstain from alcohol for a year. After her violation, she was taken back into the custody of Collier County authorities. Number 1. Jerry Diana Tata On October the 5th of 2020, Arkansas woman Jerry Diana Tata got in contact with a man who used to work as a security guard at a club where her daughter was a bartender. The two arranged to meet at a Chili's in Little Rock where Tata informed him that her daughter was embroiled in a bitter custody battle with her ex-husband. The 69-year-old woman explained that her former son-in-law had allegedly been abusive towards both her daughter and their child. She then asked the former security guard to take care of the ex-husband or find someone who can. About a week later, the man asked Tata if he could give her number to an acquaintance that might be able to help her. Tata met with the prospective hitman on October the 20th. She implied that she wanted her former son-in-law to suffer an accident while also indicated she'd already been in contact with a different hitman who'd backed out. Tata claimed to be unafraid of the potential for prison time and also clarified that her daughter was totally unaware of the murder plot she was orchestrating. She went on to offer the individual $1,500 to carry out the deed, but he demanded $2,000 so that he could purchase a clean gun. The following day, Tata gave the assassin her ex-son-in-law's address, but instead of receiving word of the job's completion, she got a visit from the police. As it turned out, the former security guard, Tata, approached about the murder for hire plot had become an FBI agent in the years since they'd originally met. After she came to him with her request, he took it to his colleagues, leading to the sting operation that resulted in her arrest. Tata consequently faced the charge of interstate commerce facilities in the commission of murder for hire, but as of the most recent updates, the case was still ongoing. The Drug Enforcement Administration opened an investigation into a narcotics trafficking operation that brought illicit substances across the border from Mexico into the US and eventually into New York City. Among those who participated in the conspiracy was 32-year-old Yesenia Jimenez, an NYPD officer living in the Bronx. According to the DEA's findings, Jimenez used her apartment to house large quantities of heroin, fentanyl, and cocaine that had been smuggled from Mexico. Along with her criminal associates, the woman helped distribute the drugs in New York and Boston, collecting hundreds of thousands of dollars in the process. Jimenez was accused of taking part in a conspiracy from at least June of 2017 until March of 2018, when she was arrested. Members of both the DEA and NYPD apprehended the suspect and an accomplice as they returned to her apartment with $52,000 in cash. It later emerged that the money they were carrying stemmed from recent narcotics transactions in the Boston area. Despite being off duty at the time, Jimenez was carrying her department-issued firearm in her purse. The woman lied to the arresting officers, telling them she was on official police business. Her claims of innocence ultimately fell on deaf ears and she was hit with a number of serious criminal charges. In March of 2019, following a week-long trial, she was found guilty of conspiring to distribute heroin, fentanyl, and cocaine, possession of heroin and fentanyl, and using a firearm in furtherance of drug trafficking. The district court sentenced Jimenez to 192 months of imprisonment, followed by a five-year term of supervised release. Number 22. Russell Maranto Law enforcement in Loveland, Colorado, received reports of a woman wandering in and out of traffic while speaking incoherently on the night of May the 20th of 2023. Officers found the woman roaming the area near North Garfield Avenue and East 29th Street. She was placed in protective custody and brought to the hospital for evaluation. Loveland police later revealed that upon arrival at the hospital, the woman was handcuffed in an examination room. 
She was accused of being verbally abusive towards medical staff and reportedly spat on both a nurse and a police officer. In response, the latter punched the woman in the face, inflicting minor injuries. Another officer subsequently intervened and removed his colleague from the room. In the wake of the incident, the officer who struck the female suspect was identified as 28-year-old Russell Moranto. He was placed on administrative leave while his actions on the night in question were investigated. The following month, Loveland Police Chief Tim Doran released a video explaining his decision to fire Moranto for what he labeled an excessive use of force in the spirit of transparency. Doran's video included body cam footage from the exam room, which showed the woman, identified as 59-year-old Angelia Hall, spitting on Moranto right before he socked her in the face. Hall was charged with third-degree assault for her actions towards the officer. Number 21. Donovan William Rojas Several Monroe County deputies in Key Largo, Florida, chased a speeding Chrysler 300 down US Route 1 shortly before 4 a.m. on June the 12th of 2022. The vehicle was traveling at speeds of more than 110 miles per hour as it swerved in and out of different lanes. Pursuing deputies tailed the Chrysler for three miles before the suspect finally stopped at mile marker 105. The man behind the wheel identified himself as a member of the Miami-Dade Police Department, revealing that the Chrysler was his unmarked agency vehicle Deputies reportedly observed emergency lights activated on the car's visor, which they hadn't been able to see during the pursuit. The motorist, who was later identified as 26-year-old Donovan William Rojas, was exhibiting signs of impairment and apparently smelled like alcohol. He refused sobriety tests, so deputies brought him to the county jail where he was booked on charges of driving while intoxicated as well as fleeing and eluding inside the Chrysler. Investigators found two handguns, a Miami-Dade police ID and badge, and a department-issued body camera. Rojas was suspended from the force without pay following his arrest. Number 20. Pablo Estrada During the early morning hours of November the 28th of 2020, Officer Pablo Estrada from the Lafayette Parish Sheriff's Office in Louisiana arrested a 23-year-old man accused of beating his pregnant girlfriend. The handcuffed suspect was transported to Lafayette Parish Correctional Center and held in a room while Officer Estrada filled out paperwork. Video footage of the two men inside the police station showed Estrada instructing the unnamed suspect to take a seat. Although issues with the camera system caused the audio to cut out at certain moments, the young man could be heard telling the officer that he wasn't trying to be difficult. He remained standing while Estrada sat behind the computer and once again ordered him to sit down. The suspect then took a step towards the officer who quickly stood up saying, have a seat, I'm not playing with you. In the moments that followed, Estrada placed two hands on the suspect and pushed him against the wall before delivering a closed hand strike to his abdomen. The man protested Estrada's use of force, stating, y'all put your hands on me for nothing, I'm not even doing nothing. The suspect would go on to be indicted on battery charges, stemming from the incident with his girlfriend as well as resisting an officer for his non-compliance with Estrada. He pleaded not guilty to both offenses. Estrada, meanwhile, wasn't charged in connection with his rough treatment of the young man. He was, however, notified of his termination from the force on February the 22nd of 2021. Estrada challenged the police chief's decision by filing an appeal with the Lafayette Fire and Police Civil Service Board. In January of 2023, it was announced that Estrada had been reinstated to the department. The board reportedly determined that he hadn't violated department policy in any way. Number 19. Robert Rosen On February 11th of 2021, the Aurora Police Department in Colorado released a statement detailing the termination of Officer Robert Rosen for using excessive force during an arrest. The incident in question occurred in August of 2020 when Rosen was called to assist a fellow officer at the King's Supers grocery store on South Parker Road. Upon arrival, the officer found his colleague on the ground with a suspect who was passively resisting by laying on his stomach and keeping his arms pinned underneath his body without first attempting lesser means of force or issuing any verbal orders. 
Rosen sprung into action by briefly trying to pull the suspect's arms out from under him. When that failed, the officer began punching the man, hitting him multiple times in the ribs. He also deployed his taser five times for a total of 27 seconds. The suspect sustained minor injuries and was taken to a local hospital before being booked for allegedly trespassing on King Super's property. Rosen's actions during the arrest were reviewed by the department's force review board, which in turn recommended that the matter be investigated by the Internal Affairs Bureau. The resulting investigation uncovered that Rosen had failed to activate his body camera when he arrived at the scene that night. He also neglected to document his justifications for the force he used during the arrest. In all, Rosen was found to have violated five department directives and was consequently fired. Number 18. James Sanders Officer James Sanders with the Social Circle Police Department in Georgia was involved in an incident on November the 23rd of 2016 that ultimately led to his termination a few weeks later. On the day in question, Sanders was on duty when he heard someone in a passing jeep yell out, F the police! Outraged! Sanders proceeded to chase the vehicle down and initiate a traffic stop, which he neglected to radio into dispatch. The officer then interrogated the Jeep's teenage occupants, ultimately determining that it was the passenger who hurled the profane insult. Sanders ordered the teen out of the car and tormented him, trying to coax the boy into a physical fight. Eventually, another officer arrived at the scene and, as shown in body cam footage, admitted that the teens hadn't done anything to warrant being pulled over. Nevertheless, the two cops searched the Jeep as well as the teens but let them go when it became clear they had nothing incriminating in their possession. An anonymous complaint to the Social Circle Police Department led to an internal review of the incident, culminating in Sanders getting fired in early December. Records indicated that Sanders had gotten into trouble before for harassing members of the public, including an instance where he allegedly threatened to taser a school administrator and blow up a building. Number 17. Gemma Dix and Adam Reed. Allegations of gross misconduct were leveled against a Welsh police constable during the summer of 2020. 28-year-old Gemma Dix was accused of having intimate relations with her superior on multiple occasions, including at various locations within Cardiff Central Police Station. The junior officer's repeated encounters with Sergeant Adam Reed, a married father of two, spanned 10 months. During at least one of their liaisons at the police station, which occurred between November of 2017 and August of 2018, Dix had allegedly been on duty. A misconduct panel ultimately ruled that her actions constituted a serious breach of professional behavior and amounted to gross misconduct that damaged the police service's reputation and community standing. After details of the affair came to light, 40-year-old Reed resigned from the force. In August of 2020, it was announced that Dix had been spared termination and was instead issued a written warning. Panel chairwoman Emma Boothroyd stated that she didn't accept Dix's claims that Reed had manipulated her into continuing their relationship. Boothroyd did, however, commend Dix for volunteering information about her encounters with Reed as well as showing genuine remorse for her behavior. Number 16. Lords hadn't felt. In February of 2019, a police officer from Des Moines, Iowa, claimed to have been hit and injured by a car that was fleeing a traffic stop. 33-year-old Lords hadn't felt had worked on the force since June of 2017, having previously served as an officer for the Perry Police Department. About 40 miles northwest of Des Moines, hadn't felt filed a report detailing her alleged encounter with a female motorist who'd driven into the middle of a snow removal operation, only to speed away from the scene when confronted. The driver was later stopped along I-235 and faced charges of operating while intoxicated, as well as interference with official acts. An internal department investigation led to the discovery that hadn't felt hadn't been completely truthful in her report. In reality, she'd never been struck by the vehicle as she claimed. The internal review also found that Haddon Felt lied under oath during a deposition preparing for the criminal charges against the driver, identified as Olesya Holker, 
As a result of the officer's untruthfulness, Holker had the charge of interference with official acts dropped. The woman claimed to have driven away from the traffic stop because Haddonfeld was being abusive. The officer acknowledged the inaccuracies in her official report, which she claimed to have written entirely from memory without reference in her body cam footage. In July of 2019, Haddonfeld was fired from her job. Number 15. Kashif Mahmoud a massive corruption scandal hit Greater London's Metropolitan Police Service in the spring of 2021. Per the findings of an official investigation, Officer Kashif Mahmoud collaborated with an organized crime ring based in Dubai to steal money from drug dealers. Five other suspects were charged in connection with the case and ended up receiving prison sentences of up to 16 years as punishment in court. The sophisticated crime group's leader in Dubai was identified as Mujaba Niazmund. Using encrypted messaging platforms to communicate, Niazmund would inform the gang's UK leader, Moshin Khan, about drug couriers carrying large amounts of money. In turn, Khan would pass the details on to Mahmoud, a police officer of 10 years. Mahmoud used police cars from Stoke Newington Police Station and had an accomplice pose as his partner. They would then stop and search the targets, many of whom had been given the cash by the Khan gang as part of a drug deal. After seizing the money under the guise of police procedure, Mahmoud would hand it over to his criminal associates, who ended up with both the drugs and money from the transaction. In total, the group stole over a million dollars from drug dealers, according to prosecutors. In early 2020, French police and cybersecurity experts penetrated EncroChat, the encrypted network used by the Khan gang. The collapse of EncroChat contributed to the crime group's demise, as did a series of blunders on the part of Mahmoud and his associates. During one of the gang's jobs, they unwittingly targeted a drug courier who was being monitored by law enforcement. Surveillance officers stopped Mahmoud and his partner after witnessing them seize cash from the courier. They forced him to create an intelligence report back at the police station, which would ultimately be used as evidence against him in court. Additionally, Mahmoud's body camera inadvertently turned on during the unauthorized stop, capturing his accomplice dressed in a police uniform. In May of 2021, Mahmoud was sentenced to eight years behind bars. Number 14. Matthew Rodriguez The police in Warren, Michigan, arrested a carjacking suspect and brought him to the city jail for booking on June the 12th of 2023. While the suspect, identified as Jaquan Smith, was being processed, Officer Matthew Rodriguez launched a vicious physical attack on him. As captured by the jail security cameras, 48-year-old Rodriguez suddenly lunged towards Smith and knocked him to the ground. He proceeded to bash the suspect's head against the floor before striking him again. Although the footage didn't include audio, Warren Police Commissioner Bill Dwyer indicated that there might have been words exchanged between Rodriguez and Smith prior to the attack. Nevertheless, Dwyer labeled the officer's actions as completely unjustified and unprofessional, stating he was shocked and appalled by the video. Rodriguez was placed on paid leave in the immediate aftermath. He was ultimately charged with assault and battery. A couple of weeks after the incident, he was fired from the police department. Number 13. Emily Hershowitz In August of 2022, Ossining Village Police Chief Kevin Sylvester filed a complaint with the Westchester District Attorney's Office in New York over threatening messages sent to one of his officers. 36-year-old Emily Hershowitz first revealed the alleged harassment she'd been suffering back in May of that year. She told the DA's office that she'd been receiving anonymous threats from multiple different phone numbers. The officer further claimed that some of her colleagues were likely behind the messages. As the issue drew more attention from the public and investigators, however, suspicions began to arise regarding the true source of the anonymous threats by October. Authorities had gathered enough evidence to obtain a search warrant for Hershowitz's phone and digital records. It was established that the woman controlled the phone numbers responsible for the menacing texts and that she'd actually sent the messages to herself. She was consequently charged with four counts of third-degree falsely reported an incident. 
as well as three counts of first degree filing a false instrument. During the investigation, police chief Sylvester had tried to blame the threats on officer Luis Rinaldi, who later sued the chief after being forced to resign. In the wake of Hershowitz's arrest, Sylvester suspended her with pay, which many viewed as lenient. When Rinaldi and co-plaintiff Andrea Zambrano filed litigation against Sylvester, they alleged that the chief was in an intimate relationship with Hershowitz and had therefore doled out a lighter punishment for her. They further claimed that Sylvester had tried to pin Hershowitz's crimes on them despite having no evidence to support his accusations. As of the latest developments, the multifaceted situation hadn't yet been resolved. Number 12. Alexander Shaoni a Seminole County Sheriff's deputy conducted a traffic stop along Florida Avenue, north of Oviedo, on June the 6th of 2023. The deputy had observed an Orlando Police Department cruiser traveling at upwards of 80 miles per hour in a 45 mile per hour zone with no lights or sirens activated. He gave chase in the area of Florida Avenue and De Leon Street, but the runaway cruiser refused to pull over. Eventually, the deputy managed to pull in front of the OPD vehicle to make it stop. The individual behind the wheel of the cruiser got out to meet the deputy dressed in full police uniform, later identified as Officer Alexander Shaoni. The man refused to show the deputy his driver's license, stating he was on his way to work. He subsequently got back in the cruiser and sped off. Shortly thereafter, the Orlando Police Department announced that Shaoni had been relieved of duty. Pending further investigation, he also faced criminal charges of reckless driving, fleeing, and eluding law enforcement and resisting an officer without violence. Body cam footage of the deputy's encounter with Shoney went viral in the incident's aftermath. In August of 2023, it was reported that Shoney had entered a pre-trial intervention agreement which required 12 months of supervision. The agreement included $500 worth of fines and fees, as well as a mandate that Shaoni complete 40 hours of community service and apologize to the deputy who pulled him over. If the officer completed each of the requirements, his criminal charges would be dropped. Number 11. Telvin Wilson an Arkansas cop was busted trying to solicit intercourse from a minor who was actually an undercover police officer during the summer of 2023. 31-year-old Telvin Wilson from Texarkana was one of three suspects caught through a sting operation conducted by law enforcement in the twin city of Texarkana, Texas. Investigators placed an advertisement on a website used by escorts then posed as a minor in subsequent conversations with potentially interested clients. Wilson and the other men agreed to meet up with the decoy at a house. However, when they knocked on the front door, they were met by police officers rather than the girl they were expecting. Wilson, who began his career in law enforcement in 2016, was charged with online solicitation of a minor. He was held in custody on a $100,000 bond. In an eerie twist, it was revealed that the man had once described himself as a figure that our young people can come and talk to in a spotlight Facebook post just a few months before his arrest. The two other suspects linked to the sting operation were 33-year-old Adarius Wills and James Willis, aged 37. As of the most recent updates, they were both in custody with several pending criminal charges. Number 10. Johnny Diaz. On May the 23rd of 2018, New York cop Johnny Diaz arrested a drug dealer but failed to report $1,000 in cash that he recovered from the man. In the days and weeks that followed, 48-year-old Diaz kept in close contact with the dealer and the two established a professional rapport. The officer reportedly offered to return the dealer's cell phone from an evidence locker and, in return, received a $250 bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Scotch. As their relationship developed, Diaz even offered to throw out the man's pending criminal case in exchange for $20,000. Then, on June the 15th, he helped the dealer transport over two pounds of cocaine in exchange for $4,000, telling his criminal associate, I should know better, I'm a cop. By the end of June, Diaz was arrested and was facing a slew of charges that included first-degree possession of a controlled substance. Diaz's undoing had been his relationship with the drug dealer, 
who, as it turned out, was an undercover investigator. Police officials had opened an internal probe into Diaz following allegations that he was offering criminals freedom in exchange for money. In August, the crooked cop pleaded guilty to second-degree criminal possession of a controlled substance, second-degree bribery, and petty larceny. He was sentenced to six years in prison for his crimes. Number 9. Alisa Bajrak Taravich On April the 29th of 2023, NYPD officers stopped a vehicle belonging to a local dealer who was described as a major player in the city's drug trade. Before they could investigate the suspect and potentially arrest him for trafficking, however, officers were met by the man's girlfriend, Alisa Bajrak Taravich, aged 33. The latter, a Yonkers resident who'd been a police officer for 11 years, launched a belligerent tirade in an attempt to prevent her colleagues from busting her boyfriend. Bajrak Taravich became so uncooperative, in fact, that the officers at the scene needed to call for backup in order to subdue her. In the end, the dealer was allowed to go free while law enforcement filed a report about Bajrak Taravich's behavior. Following the events of the traffic stop, the woman had her service weapon confiscated and was reassigned to desk duty while detectives investigated her association with the dealer. According to subsequent reports, Bajrak Terovich had been warned to stay away from the man who was already under police surveillance at the start of their relationship. She'd previously tried to intervene when cops showed up at the dealer's Manhattan residence and was subsequently urged by colleagues to end their involvement. Number 8. Nasia Stroud 29-year-old Nasia Stroud, a six-year veteran of the NYPD, assigned to the Fleet Services Division, was arrested for serving as a drug courier in the spring of 2017. Between the months of April and June, Stroud was paid $2,000 to transport illegal substances to another courier. She used codes to cover up her activities, devising the phrase, shopping at Woodbury, for any communications involving future drug drop-offs. Stroud allegedly told the courier that she was a police officer, stating that she would flash her badge to avoid further investigation if they were ever stopped by law enforcement. Her plan to avoid getting arrested evidently didn't work as she was in handcuffs by mid-June. Internal investigators had already been looking into Stroud by the time she'd started delivering drugs. She'd been placed on modified duty, which meant she'd been stripped of her service weapon and limited to desk work. The courier with whom she'd been doing business was actually an undercover detective. The woman consequently faced charges of criminal possession and official misconduct. In May of the following year, a judge found Stroud guilty on all charges. She tearfully begged for the verdict to be thrown out while appearing in Manhattan Supreme Court in June. She indicated that a felony conviction would prevent her from joining the army, which she'd always dreamed of doing. Nevertheless, the presiding judge showed no leniency, sentencing Stroud to eight years behind bars for her crimes. Number 7. Nidia Garcia Nidia Garcia, who worked for police in the Mexican city of Escobedo, was fired after a photo of her posing topless in her patrol vehicle made the rounds on social media in April of 2016. The racy picture showed Garcia flashing her bare chest while wearing her police uniform and holding a rifle. On Facebook, the woman admitted to taking the picture while on duty but denied uploading it to social media. Police officials opened an investigation into the matter but Garcia resigned before a resolution could be reached. Some have speculated that the woman quit her job in order to pursue one of the many modeling opportunities presented to her in the wake of the nude picture scandal. Subsequent reports mentioned that several men's magazines and local businessmen had expressed interest in capitalizing on Garcia's sudden popularity. The controversy caused irrevocable damage to the former cop's family as it reportedly prompted her husband to leave her. After ending her law enforcement career, the mother of two was said to have started working as a table dancer in gentlemen's clubs across Mexico. Number 6. Karina Salgado Early on the morning of November the 1st of 2019, Chicago police dispatched officers to the 3700 block of North Broadway. A tipster had contacted them about a woman who'd been denied entry to a Boys Town nightclub. The establishment, which featured a dance club and drag shows, had repeatedly 
turned the woman in question away, but she kept trying to sneak in regardless. Officers tracked down the individual, who was reportedly wearing red and white face paint, apparently as part of a Pennywise Halloween costume. They informed her that she wasn't allowed to go into the nightclub, but nevertheless, she attempted to get into the building yet again, so they physically blocked her path. Shortly after, the woman, who was intoxicated, slapped an officer in the face with an open hand. She was consequently arrested and charged with misdemeanor counts of criminal damage to property, battery, and resisting or obstructing a peace officer. Subsequent reports on the matter identified the suspect as 30-year-old Karina Salgado, an off-duty police officer. Following her arrest, Salgado was moved to a non-emergency role within the department pending further investigation. Number 5. Melissa Adamson A Pennsylvania cop lost her job after a Snapchat selfie with text that included a racial slur started circulating online on September the 27th of 2016. The offensive post, uploaded by McKee Sport Police Officer Melissa Adamson, triggered a social media firestorm following its re-emergence. It was determined that Adamson had originally taken the picture several months prior when she'd worked for a different police department in Pitkin. While speaking with a local media outlet, Adamson said the post was a stupid mistake. She claimed that it was making the rounds months after she uploaded it because she had an altercation with a former colleague who was bringing up dirt from her past and trying to ruin her career. The controversy surrounding the selfie, which prompted an official statement from the mayor of McKeesport, caused Adamson to lose her job with the local police department. She was also terminated from her part-time position with Versailles Police. Number 4. Lester Brown On the evening of December the 1st of 2018, Jose Garcia was arrested by Miami area police after a complaint was made about a drunk man breaking a house window. The suspect was taken to Miami-Dade County Jail for processing on charges of disorderly intoxication and resisting arrest. As Garcia was being escorted into the booking room, a Homestead police officer abruptly shoved him face first into a concrete wall. The suspect immediately started bleeding from a cut on his forehead, which was treated with surgical glue at the hospital. In the resulting case report, Officer Lester Brown claimed that Garcia had been physically resisting him and was trying to attack other officers at the jail. Brown further stated that at one point, Garcia fell forward and cracked his head on the wall accidentally. None of the officer's colleagues could substantiate his claims. The other officers at the scene reportedly observed Brown pushed the suspect unprovoked. Witness testimony was corroborated by video footage taken from the jail security cameras. As a result, Brown was arrested and charged with felony battery and official misconduct. Homestead Police Chief Alexander Raleigh Jr. stated in a press conference that Brown had been suspended without pay pending his likely termination. Number 3. The Dirty 30 During the early 1990s, corruption was rampant among New York City police officers, especially those stationed in the Harlem neighborhood of Upper Manhattan. The issue became so pervasive that the city's mayor appointed a judge to create the Mullen Commission. The mandate was aimed at investigating and removing corrupt forces within the NYPD. In 1992, Sergeant Kevin Nannery began overseeing a collection of about 30 corrupt officers. The group, most of whom were stationed at the 30th Precinct in Harlem, would regularly take part in booming. The illegal process entailed making fake radio calls to cover up unauthorized search and seizures at known drug dealers' apartments. The Dirty 30, as they would come to be known as, would steal drugs and money from criminals' homes, then sell the illegal substances at half price right from the 30th Precinct. The group was also accused of extorting criminals, forcing illegal drug wholesalers to give them a weekly payoff in exchange for freedom. The Dirty 30 eventually collapsed after a former member went undercover for an internal investigation. A total of 33 officers, including Nannery, were arrested in connection with the scandal. They faced charges that included civil rights conspiracy, perjury, extortion and grand larceny, as well as the possession and distribution of narcotics.
Number two, Betty Jo Shelby. On the evening of September the 16th of 2016, police in Tulsa, Oklahoma, received a call about an abandoned vehicle blocking traffic in the middle of 36th Street North. Responding officers encountered a man later identified as 40-year-old Terence Crutcher standing in the street near the apparently stalled vehicle. One of the officers, Betty Jo Shelby, would later state that she believed Crutcher was under the influence of PCP, which turned out to be an accurate assessment. A police helicopter arrived at the scene and the officers inside were recorded saying, this guy's still walking and isn't following commands. It's time for a taser, I think. That looks like a bad dude too. Could be on something. Shortly thereafter, as Crutcher was walking back to his vehicle with his hands up, Officer Tyler Turnber deployed his taser while Shelby fired her service weapon. It took multiple minutes for someone to administer Crutcher aid after the bullet Shelby fired struck him in the chest. He succumbed to his injuries in the hospital later that day. The officers involved were placed on paid leave in the immediate aftermath. Eventually, authorities launched a criminal investigation into the shooting. A week later, the Tulsa County District Attorney filed first-degree manslaughter charges against Shelby. She turned herself into the county jail and was held for 20 minutes before posting bail. A vocal contingent of the general public denounced Shelby's actions on the day of Crutcher's death. The incident sparked protests outside the county courthouse and a civil rights probe by the U.S. Department of Justice during the trial. The jury questioned Shelby's judgment as a law enforcement officer. They also expressed their belief that serious consideration should be given to whether she be allowed to return to the force. In the end, however, the jury found Shelby not guilty of first-degree manslaughter. She quit the Tulsa Police Department, subsequently becoming a Rogers County Sheriff's Deputy. Number 1. Galib Chowdhury In June of 2023, Houston authorities responded to the 10300 block of Clay Road near Shadowdale, where a woman had reportedly been shot in the face. The victim, 30-year-old Sadeth Iqbal, was taken to the hospital for emergency surgery but ultimately survived. Investigators determined that Iqbal had been shot by her husband, Galib Chowdhury, a Houston police officer who was off duty at the time. The man was arrested and charged with aggravated assault of a family member with serious bodily injury. In a subsequent press conference, HPD Chief Troy Finner mentioned that the department was viewing the matter as a case of domestic violence that started as an argument. During initial talks with Iqbal, she told investigators that the shooting had been an accident. However, after Chowdhury's charges were filed, the woman changed her tune. She said she'd initially protected her husband because she was afraid that his position as a policeman might prevent him from getting criminally charged. Local media outlets gained access to angry messages that Chowdhury sent to Iqbal shortly before the shooting. Investigators also recovered syringes and doses of clenbuterol, a stimulant typically abused by bodybuilders and athletes. The DEA reportedly linked the drug to significant adverse effects including agitation and anxiety. A sweep of the couple's Northwest Houston apartment also unearthed passports, weapons, ammunition, and various other items. Chowdhury was held in custody on a $125,000 bond. With his criminal case pending, the man was terminated by the Houston Police Department. Do you know who my boyfriend is? said Samantha Braxiak while being arrested for DUI on the evening of February the 25th of 2020. At the time, Braxiek was the girlfriend of New York Yankee star Aaron Judge. According to a police report, she was driving without her headlights near Hayden and Indian School Roads in Scottsdale, Arizona. Local police spotted her vehicle and followed her, signaling for her to pull over several times. Eventually, Braxiek finally pulled over and she was placed under arrest, all the while repeatedly telling the officer her boyfriend's name as if that would or should make a difference. After she was put in the back of the police cruiser, she claimed that her boyfriend was in the spotlight in the New York media and that her getting arrested was going to reflect badly on her. The police report indicated that she allegedly committed multiple traffic 
traffic violations, including driving without headlights at night, failing to drive in a single lane, going 5 to 10 miles per hour over the speed limit, and having a slow reaction when yielding to an emergency vehicle signaling to pull over. In her initial breathalyzer test, her results showed a 0.125 blood alcohol concentration. When she was booked at the Scottsdale Police Department, she blew 0.169 and 0.181 respectively on two more breathalyzer tests. Braxiek was charged with extreme driving under the influence in addition to the traffic violations. She reportedly took a deal with prosecutors and pleaded guilty to misdemeanor DUI in October of 2020. As part of the agreement, the charges against her were dropped. She was sentenced to 10 days behind bars, nine of which were suspended, and she was given credit for one day she'd already served. Additionally, she was ordered to attend an alcohol abuse screening and pay over $2,000 in fines and fees. Number 9. Charlene Diane O'Banion On November the 17th of 2021, Montgomery County Jail Deputy Charlene Diane O'Banion allegedly had intercourse with 28-year-old prisoner Jacob Parker. According to authorities, they became aware of the crime after O'Banion and Parker shared a recorded call on December the 17th, during which they discussed their intimate activity. When an internal investigation was conducted, O'Banion was questioned by detectives. She then confessed to having oral intercourse in the jail with Parker, in an area that was out of sight from cameras. Court documents indicated that the crime took place in a housing section inside the jail, which had no floor workers at the time. O'Banion claimed it happened only once. The 33-year-old was later terminated from work. She pleaded guilty to improper activity with a person in custody and was sentenced to 100 days behind bars. Number 8. David Carrick English serial abuser and former police officer David Carrick was sentenced to life imprisonment after pleading guilty to several counts of abuse against 12 women that took place over a 17-year period. After serving in the British Army for a brief period in the 1990s, Carrick became a police officer with the Metropolitan Police in 2001. Between 2003 and 2020, Carrick often met women in Hertfordshire, England, using the online dating apps Badoo and Tinder. Eventually, he developed multiple abusive relationships with some of those women. Carrick allegedly degraded his victims through physical abuse with a belt, imprisonment in small spaces, urinating on them and forcing himself upon them. In October of 2021, one of his victims reported to the police that he had indecently assaulted her during the course of their dating relationship in 2020. The former girlfriend claimed that Carrick had threatened her, saying, I can kill you without leaving any evidence. She also said that the man was charming in the beginning but later started putting her down. According to The Guardian, the woman had been coerced, intimidated, and controlled by Carrick while using his status, restraining her with his police issue handcuffs and flaunting that he was a powerful man who guarded the Prime Minister. After the ex-girlfriend's report, Carrick was arrested that same month and suspended from police work. Many more women came forward, and he eventually pleaded guilty to 49 counts of abuse against women in December of 2022 and a month later pleaded guilty to four more related charges during his sentencing at Southwark Crown Court on February the 6th of 2023. The 48-year-old received 36 life sentences with a minimum term of 30 years plus 239 days. The Metropolitan Police said that in the wake of Carrick's conviction, the force was re-examining past claims of domestic abuse or assault filed against Metropolitan officers and staff Number 7. Brian Philip Hayek In Rust Township, Michigan, local law enforcement received two reports of a truck that nearly hit several vehicles and almost ran off the road several times on November the 17th of 2016. According to a Montmorency County deputy, they spotted the pickup truck weaving along a road. When the deputy pulled over the vehicle, he learned that it was being driven by an off-duty officer named Brian Philip Hayek from the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office. 
The deputy's body camera footage showed Philip Hayek trying to talk his way out of the arrest based on his position as a lieutenant. He went as far as to beg the deputy to let him go so that he could sleep it off. The deputy told him that he should be arrested because even police officers weren't above the law. Philip Hayek continued to plead, but after the deputy took out a taser gun, the lieutenant complied and was placed under arrest. Back at the station, Philip Hayek's breathalyzer tests registered blood alcohol levels of 0.28 and 0.27, which were three times the legal limit. Two months later, Philip Hayek pleaded guilty to operating a vehicle while intoxicated. On March the 3rd of 2017, the 47-year-old was sentenced to one-year probation, which included no drinking and frequent alcohol testing. He was also ordered to perform 40 hours of community service and to pay $1,266 in fines and costs. In the aftermath, Philip Hayek lost the title and pay of a lieutenant, but remained employed at the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office. However, the department said that he was no longer a sworn officer. Number 6. Andrea Griffiths In December of 2019, British woman Andrea Griffiths resigned from her position as a police constable at the North Wales Police Headquarters in Colwyn Bay due to misconduct. According to North Wales Live, 44-year-old Griffiths submitted her resignation on the morning of a disciplinary hearing saying she deeply regretted the one-time tryst she had with a vulnerable man she was supposed to be looking after. The man was reportedly an alleged victim of historic abuse. She admitted that the incident occurred on June the 29th of 2015 while she was on duty. The hearings panel determined that Griffiths was guilty of gross misconduct by her admission, noting that if she remained a serving officer, she would have been dismissed from the force. In the aftermath, she was placed on a banned list of former officers not allowed to work for the police again. Number 5. Hayley Mae Greenwood Australian woman Hayley Mae Greenwood, who worked as a police officer in the Christie's Beach suburb in southern Adelaide, was accused of corruption offences. The 25-year-old officer was arrested in August of 2015 following a probe by the police's anti-corruption branch and the Independent Commissioner Against Corruption. Greenwood was charged with abuse of public office, trafficking in a controlled drug, dishonestly dealing with property without consent, and possessing or using a dangerous item. She responded to her arrest by posting a YouTube video called Sky High, in which she rapped about being a superhero and wearing a disguise like Batman. She also resigned from the force. According to the newspaper The West Australian, Greenwood's prosecution was long and tortuous, delayed by her unfounded, baseless claims that she needed anonymity because she was the target of bikey gang retribution. Eventually, she admitted to the court that she'd been involved in dealing more than 0.23 ounces of methyl amphetamine and $1,000 cash while she was still employed as an officer. She was convicted of failing to act honestly as a public sector employee. In addition to having worked with the force and dealing drugs, Greenwood allegedly moonlighted as an escort at a Finden brothel. Some would call her a busy bee. Her lawyers confirmed this information while asking for leniency during the sentencing submissions in April of 2018. Later that month, Judge Julie McIntyre sentenced Greenwood to 53 months in prison with a non-parole period of 18 months. McIntyre told her that she was in a position that required her to uphold the law, not repeatedly disobey it. Number 4. Jill Curry and Brett Robinson Two former female prison workers who'd worked at the Washington County Jail, located in Hillsborough, Oregon, were jailed for releasing a maximum security inmate to have intercourse with him. Authorities said they received an anonymous tip on July the 8th of 2014 that civilian jail services technician Jill Curry, aged 38, was having an intimate relationship with 25-year-old inmate Jeng Lee Delgado Galban. Curry allegedly unlocked Delgado Galban's cell door and made sure he had a safe passage to a supply closet where the two would have intercourse. This happened at least 13 times in 2014. While law enforcement were investigating Curry, they discovered that 31-year-old Brett Robinson, another civilian service employee at the jail, had also been having a tryst with Delgado Galban. Investigators believed that Robinson had intercourse with the inmate at least six times. Apparently, both women were unaware they were involved with the same prisoner. 
In September, Robinson and Curry resigned after their shocking affairs came to light. They were accused of felony custodial misconduct and eventually pleaded guilty to the charge. During Curry's sentence hearing on March the 16th of 2015, the woman reportedly trembled and cried as she apologized to her former co-workers and family. Judge Charles Bailey called out Curry's crocodile tears, saying her hedonistic pleasures were more important to her than those whom she addressed in her apology. Ultimately, Bailey sentenced Curry to four years and two months behind bars. In June, Robinson was also sentenced and received a jail term of three years. On March the 3rd of 2016, Delgado Galban filed a lawsuit against Washington County, alleging among other claims that his Eighth Amendment right had been violated by the coercive activities of his jailers, to which he purportedly did not consent to. The lawsuit was dismissed in 2017. Number 3. Kenneth Skeens In July of 2023, the New Mexico Attorney General's office filed charges, including unlawful arrest, against a former Albuquerque police officer. The former officer, 28-year-old Kenneth Skeens, reportedly played a role in the unlawful arrest of a person with disabilities in August of 2022. The victim was struggling to complete a purchase at a retail store on Paseo del Norte Boulevard in Albuquerque. Police body camera footage revealed that Skeens dragged the victim from the store by his arm and placed him on the ground outside the store. When the man refused to give his name, Skeens told two other responding officers to put him in handcuffs. As he was cuffed, he screamed out and tried to call 911. Apparently, he was confused about whether the officers were real police or not. The officers then forcefully took the phone from the man while pressing down on him. According to Attorney General Raul Torres, rather than acting as a professional public servant, Skeens engaged in abusive and unlawful behavior. Torres added that the former officer's behavior undermined public safety and violated the peace officer's oath in the state of New Mexico. While Skeens, the primary officer in the incident, was charged with false imprisonment, it was unclear if the other two officers involved in the incident were also facing disciplinary action. Keynes was also charged with perjury, making a false report, and battery. Subsequent information indicated that he entered a not guilty plea on August the 7th of 2023. Number 2. Pleasure P On March the 5th of 2020, law enforcement were called to 18100 Northwest 2nd Avenue in Miami Gardens, Florida, after a disturbance at the Checkers drive through was reported. According to an arrest report, a Checkers employee told responding officers that a male customer had been yelling at her through the intercom system for several minutes before he pulled up to the window and continued to yell louder and become more disrespectful. The worker said that the man subsequently gave her $60 in exchange for his food, then pushed her in the chest with the food. When one of the responding officers approached the suspect, the man told him, I'm Pleasure P, to which the officer responded, I don't care who you are. The man was later identified as Marcus Ramon Cooper Sr., famously known as R&B singer Pleasure P from the hip-hop group Pretty Ricky. The 35-year-old singer confirmed to the police that he'd been involved in a verbal altercation with the employee, but said he didn't throw food at her. While Cooper spoke, he emitted a strong odor of alcohol, as the arrest report indicated. After the police investigated, evidence at the scene and witnesses' testimony reportedly corroborated the victim's claim. Cooper was arrested and booked into the Turner Guilford Knight Correctional Center on a charge of battery. He was released a few hours later after posting his $15,000 bail in the immediate immediate aftermath, Cooper posted on Instagram saying he was wrongfully arrested in the incident. He noted that his order had been wrong and the worker refused to refund him. Number 1. Jackson Jones A teen from Tennessee was arrested in Oklahoma on New Year's Day of 2023 for allegedly abusing fake power by acting as a deputy and pulling cars over in Choctaw. The suspect, later identified as 19-year-old Jackson Jones, was reportedly dressed in a vest marked Sheriff, carrying handcuffs, knives, a flashlight, and wearing a duty belt. A witness said that Jones was parked in a driveway ready to pretend he was on the job. The witness added that the teen claimed to be an undercover Wellston police officer, an odd detail given the flashy police outfit he was donning. Jones allegedly pulled over cars by flashing his headlights. 
According to the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office, when Jones was questioned by deputies, he insisted that he worked for the Campbell County Jail and said he had just left work. However, the jail administrator in Campbell County said that Jones no longer worked for the jail and couldn't be rehired. After impersonating an officer in their jurisdiction, deputies also found five bottles of Mike's hard lemonade in the vehicle, two of which were empty, with a third bottle being half empty. The WBIR reported that Jones was arrested on charges of impersonating a police officer and having an open container in his car. He was booked into the Oklahoma County Jail on a $5,000 bond. On November the 30th of 2018, Valen Hardison had a package delivered to her residence in Bel Air, Maryland. The box, which reportedly contained a new pair of boots, disappeared, and the woman consequently checked the surveillance camera aimed at the front porch of her home. Footage showed a girl run into her door. She briefly stopped and motioned to the street before she picked up the package and left with it. Hardison sent the images to the police who suspected that the child had been directed by an adult to take the box. Following an investigation, officers identified 46-year-old Gary Martin and issued an arrest warrant in his name for instructing his young daughter to steal. The man was detained and charged with theft under $100, conspiracy to commit theft, contributing to the delinquency of a minor and fourth-degree burglary. Number 9. Aristele Rios 35-year-old Aristele Rios accompanied her young daughter to Hylia Middle School in Florida. On March the 4th of 2014, the woman wanted to confront another student, Ashley Perez, for allegedly bullying her child. Rios left her daughter in the car and approached Perez. Several students gathered around them as she started yelling at the girl. Bystanders began recording the confrontation, which escalated to Rios swinging at Perez and striking her with her fists. An unidentified woman managed to break up the fight temporarily before Rios charged the student once again and punched her in the mouth. When the two were separated once more, Perez managed to call the police. Rios was arrested and charged with simple battery. The student was left with multiple scratches and a broken tooth following the beating. Perez admitted to having disagreements with the woman's daughter but claimed that she'd walked up to Rios's car thinking that they would talk things out when she was attacked. Eighth grader Damien Portal captured the brawl on his cell phone, and his mother later chose to upload the footage to social media. She motivated the decision saying that everyone has to know what's happening in school. Number 8. Karina D'Andrea On January the 28th of 2020 at around 2.45 p.m., Law enforcement was called to a home in Pinson, Alabama, after a 49-year-old woman had attacked her teenage daughter following an argument over money. Karina D'Andrea was reportedly enraged as she suspected that her 18-year-old daughter had taken money from her. She slashed the teen with a machete, nearly severing her hand, while also inflicting severe injuries to her arms and skull. The victim was taken to the University of Alabama at Birmingham Hospital's trauma center in critical condition, but she was expected to recover from the machete attack. DeAndrea was booked at the Jefferson County Jail on a $90,000 bond and charged with first-degree domestic violence and attempted murder. A grand jury indicted her on the charges in February. Number 7. Ashley Ruffin On September the 7th, of 2021. Police were called to the Indian Trails Middle School in Palm Coast, Florida, after a fight had occurred on the school's premises. Students who'd witnessed the brawl told responding officers that they'd seen 30-year-old Ashley Ruffin, the mother of one of the boys involved in the fight, helping her son beat up another child. They claimed Ruffin held the boy back so that her son and his friend could hit him. Ruffin was arrested and charged with felony abuse and with battery. She was accused of grabbing the victim by his hair and arm, as well as of flashing a taser during the fight. After she was released, the woman posted a 15-minute video on social media tearfully telling her side of the story and claiming the other boy had attacked her son and that she was only trying to break up the fight, as she would never hurt a child. The school eventually decided that the altercation was mutual and suspended both boys. The felony charge against Ruffin was eventually dropped and instead she was left 
with a misdemeanor battery charge, which was eventually dismissed as well in February of 2022. In December of that year, however, Ruffin was arrested on a first-degree felony charge of selling cocaine within a thousand feet of a child care center. She faced a maximum sentence of 30 years in prison. Number 6. Mary Alice Hernandez On October the 16th of 2017, students at Miller High School in Corpus Christi, Texas witnessed a schoolmate getting savagely assaulted by 34-year-old Mary Alice Hernandez. The circumstances surrounding the incident were centered on Hernandez's daughter challenging the other teen to a fight over an unspecified rumor going around the school. The girl's mother accompanied her and only intervened after her daughter had ended up losing the fight. A video which went viral in the aftermath would show Hernandez relentlessly punching the teenager while firmly holding her by the hair. She continued delivering strikes even after the victim had dropped to the pavement. The victim's mother, Julie Pinion, wrote about the incident in a Facebook post the following day. She said that her daughter didn't want to fight Hernandez partly out of respect but also because the woman had brought an entourage with her that could have intervened and hurt her even worse. Hernandez was shown on video running away from the scene but she was subsequently arrested on a warrant for assault causing bodily injury. Number 5. Carla Wiles in February of 2017, an English teenager, identified in the media as Olivia, got into a fight with another girl at school. She then complained about the incident to her stepmother, 36-year-old Carla Wiles, who nicknamed herself The Iron Lady. On social media, Wiles, a resident of Stockport in Greater Manchester, then got into her car along with Olivia and drove around until they spotted the teenager who had assaulted her. Wiles stopped the car and ambushed a girl on the street, grabbing her by the hair and asking if she had been hitting her daughter. Wiles then began kicking and punching her in the face and about the body. Olivia soon joined in the attack and started throwing kicks to her classmate's face and back. Her stepmother then threatened the victim to slit her and her mother's throats if she would touch Olivia again. The mother-daughter duo then abandoned her on the ground got back into the car and fled. The victim was left with a broken nose, a cut to her upper lip and multiple bruises. In January of 2021, Wiles was convicted of assault, occasioning actual bodily harm and making threats to kill, and was sentenced to two years in jail, suspended for two years. Her stepdaughter was given a nine-month youth rehabilitation order and was ordered to pay the victim 250 pounds compensation after being convicted of assault. Number 4. Ernst Latter, La France On March the 27th of 2017, Ernst Latter, La France, went to Carroll City Senior High School in Florida after she learned that her teenage daughter had been in an altercation with a group of students at a fair. Upon arrival, La France met the sister of one of the teens with whom her daughter had fought and confronted her in the parking lot. The woman allegedly punched the student repeatedly in the face, causing her to drop her iPhone 6. 30-year-old La France grabbed the device and drove away. The victim later went to the woman's Opa Loca home along with a group of friends in an attempt to retrieve her phone. La France hit her again with a stick, breaking her finger, before attacking her car with an axe. The woman's girlfriend, 28-year-old Elisa Evans, exited the home holding a gun, then fired it in the air three times. La France later talked about the confrontation on her social media account, warning other students to leave her daughter alone. She was also reported to have bragged about hurting the teen, saying that two black eyes was not the end of it and that she would use a gun next time. Following the incident, the woman refused to open her door to a detective when they came to inquire about the fight. She surrendered to law enforcement the following day and faced charges that included strong-armed robbery, child abuse and aggravated battery. Evans was arrested as well and charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and firing a gun into the air. In court, La France claimed self-defense, telling the judge she'd had no intention of attacking anyone when she went to the high school parking lot. The woman claimed that she'd been ambushed and consequently acted to protect herself and her daughter. Number 3. Jeanette Woods On Thanksgiving 
2015, Jeanette Woods found her teenage daughter sleeping next to a boy after they'd reportedly had intimate relations in the girl's bed at Woods' home in Mesa, Arizona. The 36-year-old woman straddled the teenager on the bed and he awoke to her punching him in the face. The boy managed to break free and escape with only his jeans, leaving his things behind. As Woods chased him out of the house and followed him down the street, the woman continued punching him and only stopped when he began throwing up. After the boy left, Woods grabbed a baseball bat and struck his car which had been parked outside her house. She was reported to have inflicted about $5,300 worth of damage. She then took the car keys from her daughter's room and moved the vehicle down the street. Woods was arrested on December the 11th. She claimed that she didn't know the boy before finding him in her home and told officers that he looked like an older man as he lay in bed next to her daughter. Woods was already a convicted felon, and for the latest incident, she was charged with the felony of criminal damage, car theft, and an assault misdemeanor. Number 2. Gary Johnson Jr. 35-year-old Florida man Gary Johnson Jr. offered to monitor a fight between his teenage son and another boy in the backyard of his home in Palm Bay in August of 2011. The man agreed to act as a referee in order to make sure the fight would be fair. 35-year-old Johnson became enraged upon seeing his son lose the fight by giving up and began arguing with his teenage rival. In a clip that subsequently went viral, the boy shoved Johnson. Moments later, the latter took him down and began punching him in the head. Johnson kept striking the teenager until he was pulled away by his son. The incident was filmed by onlookers, who stood by as the fight unfolded and didn't intervene. In the aftermath, the teen would remember falling to the ground but stated that he blacked out during the beating. He described the injuries he'd sustained for a media outlet and said, I had a split eyebrow and my teeth were pushed back. Johnson was arrested on multiple charges. He was released from jail on a $15,000 bond until his trial. In March of 2012, he was found guilty of battery, child abuse, contributing to the delinquency of a minor and disorderly conduct. He received a sentence of nearly four years behind bars. Number 1. Candy Lynn Walker Hannah Fine, her boyfriend Deshaun Donson, and Eric Mora drove to a home in Pepper Tree Court, Georgia, on October the 18th of 2018. The teenage trio were looking for Jessica Klein, who was the girlfriend of Mark Walker, the estranged husband of Fine's mother. Once they reached their destination, Fine left the other two teens in the car and went out with a machete. Just as Klein was leaving her home, the teen used the bladed weapon to attack the woman and her pre-teen daughter when she intervened. After the assault, the teenager ran back to the car and drove off with her friends, leaving her victims bloodied. Both suffered grievous injuries but survived and Klein was able to identify Fine as her attacker. Police arrested the teen and she told investigators that her mother, Candy Lynn Walker, had been pressuring her to commit the crime. The woman and her husband had been having marriage troubles for years and multiple family members testified that Walker harbored a great deal of animosity towards Klein. Fine also talked about her mother's previous efforts to solicit another one of her friends to kill the woman. The person in question, Brandon Manley, was asked to purchase a gun and Walker bought bullets to be used in the hit. Manley ultimately backed away from the plan and was consequently cut off from contacting Fine or visiting her home. Fine claimed that Walker had been planning to kill Klein since August or September and that she'd given her the deadline of October the 18th. Fine didn't have a gun and Donson suggested using a machete which was provided by Mora. By January of 2020, the legal proceedings on the matter were finalized. Walker was sentenced to 55 years on one count of principle to first-degree premeditated or felony murder with a weapon and solicitation to commit first-degree premeditated felony murder with a weapon. Fine received a sentence of 15 and a half years in state prison, while her boyfriend, Donson, was sentenced as a youthful offender to 40 months of probation with the condition of serving 15 months in state prison for one count of accessory. Mora entered a plea deal and admitted one count of principle to aggravated battery and was sentenced as an adult to a year and a day in state prison, followed by two years of community control and one year of probation. Number 7. Jason Road 
In July of 2016, prominent real estate executive Jason Rode organized a company retreat at the Spire Wine Estate in Stellenbosch, South Africa. As the CEO of the international luxury realty brand Lou Geffen Sotheby's, Rode was a well-respected figure within the property industry. While attending the retreat, he and his wife Susan had been staying at the Spire Wine Farm Hotel. Rode would later tell investigators that he'd awoken early on the morning of July the 24th to find that the bathroom door in the hotel room had been locked from the inside and that his wife was nowhere to be found. He solicited the help of a maintenance worker who managed to open the locked door. Rode claimed that he then made the horrific discovery that his wife was dead. Susan's body was found on the floor of the bathroom with the cord of a clothes iron wrapped around her neck. However, a medical examination of her corpse revealed it was far more likely that her cause of death had been manual strangulation. Roughly a month later, law enforcement officers arrived at the Rose's Randberg home to arrest the real estate executive on suspicion of murdering his wife. A police investigation uncovered that Rode had been having an affair with a woman by the name of Jolene Altersky. Susan had reportedly discovered her husband's infidelity and the couple had gotten into an argument the night before she was found dead. In the end, investigators concluded that Rode had fatally strangled his wife and staged the scene. He was ultimately convicted of the murder and sentenced to 15 years in prison. Number 6. Patrick Weeks The CEO of the U.S. Marshals Museum in Fort Smith, Arkansas was taken into police custody on December the 21st of 2021. The arrest of 53-year-old Patrick Weeks stemmed from allegations made by two employees of the regional utility company Oklahoma Gas and Electric. The two men had reportedly been dispatched to Weeks' neighborhood in order to repair streetlights near his house. According to the resulting police report, Weeks had refused to allow the workers into his yard to make the repairs. A short time later, the two men were sitting in their work truck when the homeowner approached them with a handgun and pointed it in their direction. The workers then drove around the corner, but Weeks allegedly pursued them on foot and continued to hold them at gunpoint. The men quickly left the neighborhood and reported the incident to local authorities. Police officers arrived at Weeks' residence at around 3 p.m., where they found the man sitting in an armchair with a pistol set down next to him. The weapon reportedly matched the description of the one that had been used to threaten the utility workers and Weeks was then arrested and charged with two felony counts of aggravated assault. Number 5. Sam Johnson On April the 24th of 2021, a high school senior named Dalton Stevens was at the Harpeth Hotel in downtown Franklin, Tennessee, where he and his boyfriend planned to take pictures before going to their prom. The 18-year-old soon became the target of ridicule and harassment of a man who was later identified as Sam Johnson, the CEO of the telehealth technology company Visuel. Stevens' boyfriend recorded the degrading exchange in which the 46-year-old man had hurled verbal abuse at the team for wearing a red dress. The 45-second video, which later went viral after being posted to TikTok, showed Johnson insulting Stevens incessantly and making several comments that were described as homophobic in nature. At one point, the visual executive reportedly attempted to knock the phone out of the boyfriend's hands but ended up hitting Stevens instead. Bystanders pleaded with Johnson to stop the harassment, although it wasn't reported how the altercation concluded after the recording had been cut off. Franklin police officers arrived at the scene in response to the incident, at which point Johnson vehemently denied accusations that he'd harassed the teenager. The video of the heated exchange spread quickly with the help of comedian Kathy Griffin, who posted it to her Twitter account on April the 26th. A few days later, it was reported that Johnson had been fired from his executive position at Visual. In August of 2021, the disgraced CEO reportedly filed a lawsuit against his former employer, in which he alleged that his termination had been unjustly prompted by an incomplete, edited, and out-of-context cell phone video clip. Number 4. Gabaksh Chahal On August 5th of 2013, Silicon Valley tech mogul Gabax Chahal was captured on CCTV footage brutally beating his girlfriend inside his multi-million dollar San Francisco penthouse. The 34-year-old CEO of the online marketing company Radium One 
was consequently taken into custody and charged with a total of 47 felony counts. His arrest occurred after law enforcement officials had obtained the 30 minutes of security footage that allegedly showed Jahal striking and kicking his girlfriend an estimated 117 times before attempting to strangle her. The tech executive's attorneys successfully contended that the security video had been illegally seized by the authorities and a judge ruled that the footage was therefore inadmissible as evidence in court. As a result, most of Chahal's charges were dropped and he ultimately pleaded guilty to just two misdemeanor counts of domestic violence. Chahal's eroding reputation continued to degrade as he was pushed out as Radium One CEO. He would later deny the assault accusations in a blog post, claiming that he'd simply lost his temper during a normal argument with his girlfriend but hadn't beaten her. Jahal was sentenced to three years of probation and was also ordered to undergo a 52-week domestic violence rehabilitation course. In 2016, the disgraced millionaire executive was accused of domestic violence by a second woman, an incident that was considered a violation of his probation. He subsequently resigned from his position as CEO of Gravity 4, a software company he had started in 2014. Jahal was also sentenced to serve six months in San Francisco County Jail following his second offense. Number 3. Steve Easterbrook In March of 2015, McDonald's senior executive vice president and chief brand officer Steve Easterbrook became the company's CEO after his predecessor had stepped down a few months prior. That same year, it emerged that Easterbrook had been romantically involved with 46-year-old Denise Paleothodorus, who'd been assigned to work alongside McDonald's public relations department by the PR firm Golin. Although the fast food giant had a policy that forbade managers from engaging in romantic relationships with subordinates, the board of directors ultimately concluded that Easterbrook's involvement with Paleothodorus didn't violate the company's code of ethics. In 2019, reports surfaced that Easterbrook had developed a relationship with yet another company employee, at which point the board voted to remove him as chief executive officer. McDonald's later filed a lawsuit against the former executive in which they alleged that he'd been untruthful regarding the number and extent of his relationships with subordinate employees during his tenure as the company's CEO. Court documents reveal that Easterbrook had allegedly been involved with a total of three female subordinates in the year before his termination and had even awarded one of them stock options worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. The company also claimed that the former CEO had used his corporate email account to exchange explicit photographs and videos with his various love interests. In December of 2021, Easterbrook reportedly returned $105 million in cash and stock to the company in what was described as one of the largest clawbacks in the history of corporate America. Number 2. Elizabeth Holmes In 2003, entrepreneur Elizabeth Holmes founded the biotechnology firm Theranos in Palo Alto, California. The company's express purpose was to democratize healthcare, and by the end of the decade, Holmes' venture was valued at upwards of $92 million. In 2015, Forbes listed the 31-year-old CEO as the youngest and wealthiest self-made female billionaire in the United States, after Theranos had risen to a $9 billion valuation. The impetus for the company's exponential growth was attributed to their purportedly revolutionary work. They claimed to have developed innovative procedures in which unprecedentedly small samples of blood could be used to run effective blood tests. In spite of legal and financial threats from Holmes herself, journalist John Carreyrou published an article in October of 2015 which delivered a devastating blow to Theranos' reputation and its CEO's public standing. Carrie Rue claimed that Holmes had lied about her company's supposedly pioneering work in the field of health technology. She'd allegedly misled investors and the US government regarding the accuracy of Theranos' blood testing methods. Holmes consequently faced fraud charges from the US Security and Exchange Commission. She was forced to pay a half million dollar fine, return $18.9 million in shares to Theranos, and relinquish voting control of the company. The former executive was also banned from serving as an officer or director of a public company for 10 years. Holmes and her former COO later faced criminal charges of wire fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. In January of 2020, she was convicted of defrauding Theranos investors 
but wasn't found guilty of defrauding the company's medical patients. She was scheduled to be sentenced for her crimes on September the 26th of 2022. The maximum available penalty for Holmes's charges was reported as being 20 years in federal prison and millions of dollars in fines and restitution payments. Number 1. Martin Screlly On December the 17th of 2015, FBI agents descended on the Manhattan residence of former hedge fund manager Martin Screlly. The reviled business executive who served as the CEO of Turing Pharmaceuticals was taken into custody in connection to a federal indictment that had been filed in a U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of New York. Screlly had become a controversial figure leading up to his arrest due to his company obtaining the manufacturing licenses to various drugs and then grossly raising the prices. The most notable case was with the anti-parasitic Daraprim, which Turing sold at $750 per pill from the previous $13.5 an increase by a factor of 56. As per the federal indictment, Screlly had defrauded investors while he was in command of the hedge fund MSMB Capital Management and the biopharmaceutical company Retrofin. Federal prosecutors likened Screlly's fraudulent operation to that of a Ponzi scheme, as he had perpetually relied upon new investments to pay back old debts associated with the funds. Unbeknownst to MSMB Capital's investors, however, Screlly had actually lost all of the hedge fund's investments and was using false performance updates to convey the illusion that it was still financially prosperous. He also allegedly siphoned money from his company, Retrofin, to pay off personal and professional debts that he'd accumulated while running the scheme. In total, Retrofin and its investors lost an estimated $11 million due to Screlly's misuse of company funds. Following his arrest, he was charged with conspiracy to commit securities fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. In August of 2017, the former pharmaceutical executive was found guilty by a jury of his peers and he was ultimately sentenced to seven years in a federal prison. Screlly was also ordered to forfeit nearly $7.4 million in assets and pay $388,000 in restitution. Number 8. Krista Shevchik For seven years leading up to her arrest in 2018, Georgia woman Krista Shevchik had been posing as a dentist in an illegal operation ran alongside her husband, John, a former Paulding County Sheriff's deputy. Shevchik ran county dental providers, which claimed that it was a service organization that didn't practice dentistry but handled the business aspect while connecting dentists and patients. The issue was that when dentists weren't available, Shevchik, who didn't have the required license, took it upon herself to do the work. Not only that, but she also wrote fraudulent prescriptions. Dozens of accusers came forward, some with horrifying stories. One of Shevchik's patients claimed to have developed a tennis ball-sized infection that required a trip to the hospital. After she'd extracted two of his teeth, another claimed that he had to glue his crown on every morning. Because of her husband's influence, Shevchik was able to evade justice and carry on with her illegal practices. In December of 2018, the Shevchiks were indicted under Georgia's Racketeering, Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. The trial is ongoing and they face accusations in a 52-count criminal indictment. Number 7. Jacobus van Nierop In April of 2016, Dutchman Jacobus van Nierop, dubbed by the media as the Dentist of Horror, was jailed for eight years in France. His practice had operated out of the small central town of Chateau Chinon, where Van Nierop reportedly took pleasure in mutilating the mouths of roughly 120 patients. One of them claimed that he'd ruined her life after filing her teeth down. A pensioner stated Van Nierop had left flesh hanging everywhere after an extraction. Another patient was left gushing blood for three days after he'd pulled eight of her teeth in one sitting. More of his horrendous practices meant to deliberately inflict pain included breaking patients' jaws, pulling out healthy teeth and leaving abscesses untreated. After being questioned by the police in 2013, the dentist had fled to a small town in New Brunswick, Canada, from where he was eventually extradited on an international warrant. At his trial, Van Nierop, whose defense argued had psychological problems, admitted responsibility while also claiming that he wasn't interested in people and didn't remember his patients' names. Number 6. 
Enrique Sanabria Gravia and Adriana Gutierrez Hoyos. In 2019, Florida couple Enrique Sanabria Gravia and his wife Adriana Gutierrez Hoyos were arrested for running an illegal dental practice out of their garage. The couple, both in their late 40s, had performed extractions, braces and crowns for several years. Patients would wait in the living room prior to being escorted to the garage where the dentistry equipment was held. The patients were reported as undocumented immigrants of Hispanic descent. The only way to get an appointment was for potential patients to call Gravier, ask him for a cleaning in Spanish and say who recommended them. The authorities received a tip about the illegal operation and in February, an undercover detective arrived at the address. The practice Enrique Dentistry didn't have medical insurance and hadn't been paying taxes. The couple was arrested on charges of practicing dentistry without a license and conspiracy to commit a felony. Number 5. Clara Suarez Following their marriage in 1992, dentist Clara Suarez and her orthodontist husband David Lynn Harris owned and operated a chain of offices. Through their successful business, the Texas couple enjoyed an upscale home and lifestyle. They raised three children, twin boys, and Harris's daughter from a previous marriage. In 2002, Suarez, who at one point was named Mrs. Columbia Houston, came to suspect that Harris was having an affair. She hired a private investigator and in July of 2002 was notified that her husband and his former receptionist, Gail Bridges, were at a hotel together with her teenage stepdaughter, Lindsay, as a passenger in her Mercedes-Benz sedan, Suarez went to the hotel to confront them. She attacked Bridges and hotel employees escorted Suarez back to her car. As the adulterous couple came out, Suarez fatally struck Harris with her Mercedes. Her defense would later claim that she hadn't seen him and a medical examiner stated that there was only one conclusive tire mark on the body. However, Lindsay and other eyewitnesses reported Suarez had run him over three times, which supported the idea that she'd meant to harm him. A video recorded by the detective agency she'd hired to spy on Harris showed her circling the block three times, but the victim's body wasn't clearly distinguishable in the footage. The defense was unable to prove Suarez had run Harris over only once. She was found guilty of murder and given 20 years, the maximum sentence for a crime of passion which the jury deemed it to have been. Number 4. Laurel Ike On May the 4th of 2021, deputies from Reno, Nevada responded to a burglar alarm at a dentist cabinet on Sun Valley Boulevard, where they found a broken back window and a disturbed cash drawer. Over $20,000 in cash and checks were stolen. The investigation led the authorities to 42-year-old Laurel Ike, who'd worked as a dental assistant at the cabinet. Following her arrest on July the 14th, Ike made one gruesome revelation. Even though she wasn't a licensed dentist, she at one point pulled 13 teeth from a patient using anesthesia from the office. She claimed to have performed the extractions on her own time, but didn't reveal the patient's identity. Aside from performing surgery on another without a license, Ike was charged with burglary of a business and grand larceny, as well as three counts of violating probation and one misdemeanor for conspiracy to commit burglary. Number 3. Alberto Graupera In 2020, a complaint was registered with the Florida Department of Health after Miami-based dentist Alberto Graupera left part of a hand file inside a patient's mouth. The patient, only identified as JV, had opted for a root canal to try and save the tooth after Graupera had proposed extraction and an implant. The patient became upset during the procedure and told the dentist he wanted a second opinion. Graupera sealed the incomplete root canal but failed to notify JV that a piece of hand file had broken off and was still inside. An endodontist later found the fragment and JV informed the authorities, but it's unclear what disciplinary action Graupera faced in the aftermath. Number 2. Bert Franklin in July of 2016, Oklahoma woman Roxanne Randall found her son Lincoln unresponsive and took him to a hospital. The 19-month-old was in critical condition and had to be airlifted to a medical facility in Tulsa. His eyes were bleeding as a consequence of two skull fractures, which one doctor described as the worst they'd ever seen. The authorities had been informed, as the injuries were deemed too severe to have occurred as the result of a fall, and staff concluded they were consistent with abuse. 
Lincoln would later be pronounced dead. Bert Franklin, a respectable Tulsa dentist and a married father of four, had secretly started seeing Randall, a former patient, at his practice for over a year. He deceived her that he was in the process of getting a divorce when they'd begun dating. Franklin had spent the night at Randall's home when her son had sustained the fatal injuries. Security footage from a camera in the kitchen would show Franklin coming down the stairs with Lincoln in his arms, alert and awake. He then walked out of view, but not completely. He was captured kicking and throwing something in the living room. Corresponding with his actions, Randall heard a loud thud and came downstairs, but was assured by Franklin that it was just the dog and that everything was all right. The camera then captured Franklin carrying Lincoln's limp body back into the kitchen and casually grabbing a slice of pizza. He was arrested following inconsistencies in his police interview and charged with murder. Oklahoma City investigators believed that Franklin had slammed Lincoln into the ground or another hard surface head first. It was subsequently revealed that Franklin hated the boy's biological father, whom he had threatened to skin and mutilate. His hatred, as he confessed to friends, was exacerbated by Lincoln's likeness to him. With his murder trial fast approaching, there was evidence that Franklin had tried orchestrating a hit on Randall from prison, presumably suspecting she'd be able to incriminate him. He was found guilty of murder as well as of soliciting murder and sentenced to life without parole. It also emerged that his professional career was just as insidious as his personal life. A number of patients revealed that it was actually Franklin's dental assistant, Paige Maples, who'd done most of their work. She'd repaired at least one patient's denture and also wrote prescriptions. Maples pled guilty in 2017 and received a suspended five-year sentence for unlawful practice of dentistry, had to surrender her assistant permit and never work in dentistry again. Number one. Alexandria Pierce Baderly. In 2021, out of pandemic-related fears, 29-year-old Alexandria Pierce Baderly decided to treat a large abscess in her mouth herself. Even though she didn't have the proper medical training, her decision to act as her own dentist proved fatal. Pierce Baderly feared catching the COVID-19 virus due to previous medical conditions that included pneumonia, sepsis, and hepatitis. She took pain medication and applied a turmeric paste to the affected area. The mother of one inadvertently overdosed on painkillers, which she'd taken with a considerable amount of alcohol. Pierce Baderly's mother went to her home and found her lifeless body lying on the bed. The night of her death, Pierce Baderly's boyfriend had ended their relationship. Hours before slipping into unconsciousness, she'd sent him a picture of her medication saying, in 20 minutes, I won't be able to move. While it was initially suspected she'd taken her own life, the overdose was ultimately deemed accidental, a fatal consequence of her treating the painful abscess on her own. Number 7. Nicolette Munez Officer Nicolette Munez was investigated by her own colleagues at the San Antonio Police Department following allegations that she'd assaulted a love rival. In April of 2019, a report created in connection to the incident detailed how Munez a three-year veteran of the force had FaceTimed former SAPD officer Kenneth Moreno, with whom she was allegedly having an affair. The call was answered by Moreno's girlfriend, however, and an argument between the two women subsequently ensued. Munez eventually coaxed a rival into revealing her home address and the off-duty officer then went to her residence. In the early hours of the morning to confront her upon Munez's arrival, Reports indicated that there was a physical altercation between the women. The officer allegedly elbowed the homeowner in the stomach and struck her in the face and neck in an attempt to elicit a similarly violent reaction. Rather than strike Munez in retaliation, however, Moreno's girlfriend called the police. It was later discovered that Moreno himself had been hiding in the backyard before he ultimately left the premises through a back alleyway. Officer Munez was arrested and placed on administrative leave following the incident. Although she'd initially faced criminal charges, they were later dropped due to insufficient evidence. In June of 2020, Munez reportedly told a fellow SAPD officer that she'd been in contact with Moreno, which violated the terms of the order she'd received from her superiors to stay away from her former romantic partner. She was consequently issued a 15-day suspension in mid-December of 2020. Number 6. Maria Velez in 2015, Ohio woman Maria Velez left her job as a bilingual teacher's aide at Clark School to enter Cleveland's Police Academy. In December of that year, the 22-year-old reportedly started working basic patrol in the department's 5th district. The mother of a male student came forward in September 
of 2017 to report that the officer had had an inappropriate relationship with her son during her time as a teacher's aide. Velez allegedly had several intimate encounters with the respective student throughout much of 2015. In response to the accusations against the young officer, detectives in the Cleveland Police Department's Internal Affairs Unit launched an investigation into the matter. It led to Velez being arrested during her shift on October the 19th. She was charged with multiple offenses, including attempted tampering with evidence and intimidation of a crime victim or witness. The charges stemmed from a phone call she'd reportedly made to the victim's mother in which she told her to lie about the illicit relationship when questioned by investigators. It was reported that the patrol woman agreed to resign from the police department in the wake of her arrest. In April of 2018, Velez pleaded guilty to the charges levied against her and was ultimately sentenced to 24 months in prison plus five years of supervised release. Number 5. Davin Cole At around 6 p.m. on November 3rd of 2021, off-duty San Francisco Police Sergeant Davin Cole entered a Rite Aid in San Mateo. Cole, who was allegedly armed with a loaded firearm that wasn't his service weapon, handed the pharmacist a note demanding painkillers for which he didn't have a prescription. It's unclear if anything was ultimately stolen, but Cole was confronted by two San Mateo police officers upon exiting the store. They tackled the off-duty sergeant to the ground after he'd resisted arrest, and he was eventually taken into custody on suspicion of robbery. Cole was reportedly admitted to a rehabilitation facility after posting bail. The suspect's attorney detailed how his client had secretly been battling an addiction to painkillers ever since a doctor had prescribed them to him for a severe canine bite in 2010. He also revealed the darkly ironic fact that Cole had been working in the police department's Healthy Streets Outreach Command and Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program, where he helped individuals with substance abuse issues stay off the streets. He was placed on unpaid leave pending an internal investigation into his arrest. Cole reportedly appeared in court via video conference in February of 2022. Number 4. Dave Rodriguez California man Don McComas uploaded a video to YouTube on July the 29th of 2015 which showed a troubling encounter he'd had with a local police officer in front of his Ronert Park residence. During the five-minute clip that went viral on social media in the incident's aftermath, McComas noticed a police cruiser slowly approaching his house while he was hooking a boat up to his vehicle in his driveway. After a couple of minutes, the officer inside the patrol car was shown taking a picture of McComas with his own cell phone. He then exited the car and approached the homeowner, ordering him to take his hand out of his pocket. The officer subsequently unholstered his service weapon and pointed it at the ground. McComas maintained that he'd done nothing wrong and asked the policeman if he was suspected of committing a crime. The officer admitted that the homeowner wasn't under any such suspicion and he then walked back to his cruiser before leaving the scene. The Santa Rosa Press Democrat later identified the officer in the video as Dave Rodriguez. Ronet Park Police Chief Brian Masterson reportedly declined to comment on the incident and it was reported that the city of Ronet Park would investigate the matter. The official probe concluded that Officer Rodriguez had acted within his rights during his interaction with McComas. The latter filed a lawsuit against the city seeking more than $25,000 in damages for what he described as a violation of his civil rights and the negligent infliction of emotional distress. Court documents indicated that a settlement was eventually reached by the two parties, but the specifics of the agreement weren't made available to the public. Number 3. Rodney Dunn On July the 9th of 2020, Arkansas woman Nicole Harper was traveling on US Highway 167 in the city of Jacksonville. The 38-year-old woman, reported as being pregnant at the time, was clocked at a speed of 84 miles per hour in a 70 mile per hour zone by Arkansas State Trooper Rodney Dunn. The officer subsequently began pursuing Harper, who didn't immediately pull over to the shoulder. The woman would later justify the delay by explaining that she didn't think there was sufficient space for her vehicle. Instead of instantly stopping, Harper had reportedly reduced her speed to that of roughly 60 miles per hour and turned on her hazard lights as she searched for a safe location to pull over. Dunn, however, believed that the woman was attempting to flee from him. The trooper then rammed Harper's bumper in an attempt to execute a pursuit intervention technique, commonly referred to as a pit maneuver. The woman's car was sent careening into the adjacent lanes before it flipped over and slid to a complete halt. Harper reportedly avoided any serious injury during the accident 
and her baby was ultimately born without complication a few months later. She was, however, charged with speeding and failing to yield to an emergency vehicle. Harper subsequently filed a civil lawsuit against the state of Arkansas and, in November of 2021, the two sides reportedly reached a settlement agreement. Court records detailed how the agreement would lead to policy changes on the use of pit maneuvers by state police. Number 2. Daria Jalali and Austin Hopp On June the 26th of 2020, an elderly Colorado woman named Karen Garner exited a Walmart location in the city of Loveland with $14 worth of unpaid merchandise. Employees at the store detected the theft and retrieved the item from the 73-year-old, who allegedly pulled off one of the worker's face masks during a minor altercation that ensued. Garner subsequently began walking home and the employees contacted local police to report the incident. A first-year officer with the Loveland Police Department named Austin Hopp found Garner picking flowers in a field alongside the road a short time later. Hopp reportedly approached the woman aggressively with the intention of arresting her. Garner, who appeared scared and confused in video captured by the officer's body cam, started to walk away from him, at which point he grabbed her arms and pulled them backwards in order to handcuff her. The officer then forced the 80-pound woman to the ground repeatedly as she continually attempted to get up and walk home. Officer Daria Jalali arrived at the scene soon after that and helped Hop hold down Garner against the hood of a patrol car and hogtie her. A bystander reportedly questioned the officer's use of force on the frail woman, but Jalali and Hop dismissed their concerns. Garner was taken to the police station where she was handcuffed to a bench as a small group of officers laughed and joked while watching Hop's body cam footage of the arrest. In the aftermath of the incident, it emerged that Garner had sustained a fractured arm a dislocated shoulder, a sprained wrist, and several bruises on her body as a result of the officer's aggressive exertion of force. It was also revealed that the woman suffered from dementia and sensory aphasia. Ghana filed a federal lawsuit against the city of Loveland and five members of the police department in April of 2021. The elderly woman was ultimately awarded a $3 million payout after a settlement was reached and officers Jalali and Hop resigned from the department after facing criminal charges. The latter's trial was scheduled to begin on April the 18th of 2022. Number 1. Yvonne Wu On the evening of October the 13th of 2021, an off-duty New York police officer named Yvonne Wu broke into her ex-girlfriend's Brooklyn apartment and lay in wait. Shortly after Wu had arrived on the premises, 23-year-old Jenny Lee arrived home with her new girlfriend, Jamie Liang, aged 24. Wu confronted them and promptly opened fire, shooting both women in the torso. One of the victims was able to contact 911 and Wu could reportedly be heard in the background of the phone call screaming, I told you not to mess with me. When officers made their way to the scene, they came upon Wu standing outside the apartment and she was then taken into custody without incident. Li and Liang were both transported to the hospital following the shooting. The latter passed away a short time later while Li was stabilized by doctors and ultimately survived the shooting. Wu was taken to Mamanide's medical center where she underwent a psychiatric evaluation. The five-year police veteran was charged with murder and attempted murder in connection to the Love Triangle shooting. In January of 2022, the slain woman's family announced their plans to file a $25 million lawsuit against the New York Police Department and the City of New York. The family alleged that the police department had acted negligently in allowing Officer Wu to retain her service weapon in spite of the fact that they were aware of her distressed emotional state that had been exacerbated by her contentious breakup with Lee. Number 7. Grant Robichaux Orthopedic surgeon Grant Robichaux appeared on a 2014 episode of the reality television series Online Dating Rituals of the American Male, which chronicled his search for a girlfriend. Two years later, the 38-year-old reportedly matched with a math and physics teacher named Lauren Hayden on Tinder. The California surgeon invited the woman over for dinner at his luxury Newport Beach apartment. Hayden would later report that she'd intended to keep their first date purely platonic, However, within hours of her arrival at his home, Robichaux made repeated attempts to remove her clothes, prompting the woman to cry out for help. An elderly neighbor was awoken by her screams and contacted the police. Hayden had narrowly escaped the encounter without being harmed any further, but it would later emerge that she hadn't been the first woman assaulted by Robichaux at his apartment. In 2018, the wealthy surgeon and his girlfriend, Sarissa Riley, 
were arrested for drugging and abusing at least seven women. Orange County authorities suspected that there might have been tens or hundreds more victims that had been targeted by the couple. During a search of Robichaux's Newport Beach residence, investigators found a substantial number of videos that show the man performing non-consensual acts with women who'd been chemically sedated. As of the latest updates on the case, Robichaux and Riley were still awaiting their criminal trial. Number 6. Jonathan Brooks on January the 14th of 2021, retired plastic surgeon Graham Perks was stabbed by an intruder during a break-in at his home in Northamptonshire, England. The 65-year-old was left with critical injuries to his chest and abdomen, and he consequently spent time recovering in an intensive care unit, while investigators set out to identify his attacker. Within a few days, local police arrested plastic surgeon Jonathan Brooks, who'd previously worked alongside Perks at the Nottingham University Hospital's NHS Trust. Brooks was charged with attempted murder, attempted arson with intent to endanger life, and possession of a knife in a public place. The Southwold-based surgeon denied having had any involvement in the stabbing of his former colleague and pleaded not guilty to his charges during a hearing at Nottingham Crown Court. While gathering evidence against Brooks, the authorities struggled to determine a potential motive for the brutal attack. Investigators then learned that in 2016, the 56-year-old had appeared before an employment tribunal at Nottingham University Hospital that Perks had helped oversee. After having expressed concerns about poor working conditions at the hospital, Brooks was reportedly seeking approximately $6.5 million in compensation from the institution's trust. The panel ultimately rejected Brooks's claim and shortly thereafter, he lost his position at Nottingham University to work with the charity Doctors Without Borders. Information released in the aftermath of his arrest indicated that Brooks's criminal trial had been scheduled to begin on April the 4th of 2022. Number 5. Carlos Hernandez Fernandez Colorado man Carlos Hernandez Fernandez was taken into police custody in August of 2016 after pretending to be a medical doctor for over a year. The 36-year-old was arrested by an officer who'd entered his Denver clinic reportedly while an unauthorized procedure was being performed. Although Fernandez had actually only attained the level of a surgical assistant, he posed as a cosmetic surgeon and performed multiple operations on unsuspecting women who'd believed him to be a legitimate doctor. It was reported that at least four women had suffered serious bodily harm as a direct result of the man's unlicensed procedures. According to Denver's district attorney, Fernandez had been running his deceptive surgical clinic since early 2015, and he consequently faced 14 felony counts, including second-degree assault, unlawful contact, and criminal impersonation. In April of 2017, he reached a plea deal that reduced his charges to just three counts. Fernandez was ultimately sentenced to six years in prison, followed by 15 years of probation. He was also ordered to pay approximately $190,000 to the victims of his illegal operations. Number 4. Neri Carvajal Gonzalez In early 2014, South Florida woman Neri Carvajal Gonzalez agreed to perform a series of cosmetic surgeries on an unidentified man, even though she wasn't reported as being a licensed medical practitioner. The patient, described as being in his 50s, initially sought to have work done only on his face, but he eventually decided to have additional procedures for various other body parts, including his manhood. The surgery was performed at a warehouse in Hialeah, an area known to local authorities as a hotspot for sham doctors offering cheap cosmetic procedures. Following the operation, the patient's organ failed to function properly, and it was also reported that he'd begun experiencing excruciating pain in his genital region. Embarrassed by his predicament and fueled by a sense of urgency, he went back to Carvajal Gonzalez, hoping she'd mend the issue. The latter called upon plastic surgeon Mark Schreiber to help fix the damage caused by the botched procedure. Schreiber had formerly worked at the Plastic Surgery Arts Center in Boynton Beach, but had lost his medical license in 2008. Around that same time, he'd been sentenced to two years in prison for charges related to practicing medicine without a license. After the patient had started questioning the legitimacy of his doctor's credentials, Carvajal Gonzalez fled to Colombia 
In August of 2015, she returned to South Florida, at which point she was arrested and charged with unlicensed health care, causing serious injury and practicing without a medical license. The woman ultimately agreed to a deal with prosecutors that sentenced her to 40 months in prison, plus an additional three years of probation. Under the conditions of her plea agreement, Carver Hal Gonzalez agreed to testify against Schreiber, who also faced criminal charges in connection to the incident. Number 3. Matthew Bonanno In August of 2019, a plastic surgeon from the village of Great Neck on Long Island, New York, was arrested after local authorities had been alerted to threats that he'd made against his estranged ex-wife and her family. The police took 47-year-old Matthew Bonanno into custody outside of a bar in Tuckahoe, where he'd allegedly told one of his friends about his intention to shoot his former partner. Officers found a fully loaded handgun inside of his friend's car, and the surgeon was subsequently taken to police headquarters for further questioning. While Bonanno was in custody, investigators were dispatched to the man's Great Neck apartment, where they came upon a cache of weapons, ammunition, and specialized equipment. The stash included rifles, tasers, military-style knives, brass knuckles, and body armor. Dozens more weapons were found at the Mount Pleasant home belonging to the man's parents, as well as in his car, which was reportedly parked outside of his ex-wife's residence. Bonanno wasn't formally charged for the threat against his former partner, but he did ultimately face several weapons charges, including 11 counts of criminal possession of a weapon in the second and third degrees. In 2021, it was reported that the former plastic surgeon, who lost his medical license in the wake of his legal troubles, had agreed to a plea deal with prosecutors for reduced charges. Bonanno pleaded guilty to one count of attempted criminal possession of a weapon, which stemmed from the firearm found in his friend's vehicle on the night of his initial arrest. In October of 2021, he was sentenced to five years of probation. Number 2. Jeffrey Kim 18-year-old Emmeline Nguyen was scheduled to undergo a chest augmentation procedure on August the 1st of 2019 with cosmetic surgeon Jeffrey Kim. He operated out of an office in Greenwood Village, Colorado and had garnered a reputation as a trustworthy medical professional. On the day of her operation, however, Nguyen stopped breathing shortly after Kim's assistant had administered the anesthesia. The nurse then attempted to manually ventilate the teenager, but about an hour later, she went into cardiac arrest and became unresponsive. Kim and staff tried reversing the anesthesia by injecting the patient with various medications, but she never regained consciousness. As was later detailed by investigators, Kim neglected to call 911 for at least five hours since Nu Yen had initially stopped breathing. By the time emergency responders arrived at the scene and transported her to the hospital, the teen had already suffered severe brain damage. Nguyen remained minimally conscious but was unable to speak or walk for the next 14 months. Then in October of 2020, she passed away as a direct result of the medical complications caused by her botched surgery. In February of 2022, Kim was formally charged in connection to Nguyen's death. Court documents indicated that he faced multiple felony counts, including negligent homicide and reckless manslaughter. Kim was released from custody on a $5,000 bond shortly after turning himself in to the authorities. The anesthesiologist involved in Nguyen's operation was also charged, according to the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office. Number 1. Ingolf Chuak Shortly after 4.30 a.m. on May the 15th of 2020, Ingolf Chuak texted his friend a message which partly read, I am sorry, but she is a vindictive devil. The text, as the police in Dover, Massachusetts would soon learn, was in reference to 58-year-old Chuak's wife, who was reported missing later that same day. Investigators located both of the couple's vehicles at the residence inn in Dedham, where they ultimately found Chuak with several cuts on his body and seemingly unresponsive in one of the rooms. While he was being treated at the hospital, the following day, the man confessed to strangling his wife during a drunken argument at their Dover residence. Upon realizing that he'd accidentally killed her, Chuak had panicked and ended up dumping her body in a nearby pond. A state police dive team was later called to retrieve the victim's remains from the water. There were reportedly rocks found in her pants at the time of her recovery, which Chuak had used in an attempt to make her body sink. As was detailed in a police report, the couple had been involved in a number of domestic abuse incidents 
over the course of several months. During one of their rows, Chuak had allegedly choked his wife until she nearly lost consciousness. The suspect who was ultimately charged with murder was a renowned Boston area urologist who'd risen to prominence by specializing in the innovative practice of robotic surgery. It later emerged that a couple of months prior to his arrest, Chuak had lost his job after neglecting to see any of his patients for over a year. Around that same time, his wife had filed for divorce only a few days after she'd brought the allegations of abuse to the authorities' attention. Number 8. Joshua Lee Hunsucker In September of 2018, North Carolina woman Stacy Hunsucker passed away at her Charlotte residence and officials initially ruled that she'd died of natural causes. However, Stacy's mother soon grew suspicious that her son-in-law, paramedic Joshua Hunsucker, might have been involved in his wife's mysterious and sudden demise. He'd reportedly collected $250,000 in payouts from two separate life insurance policies and had also started publicly dating another woman less than six months after his wife's death. Joshua's mother-in-law ultimately accused him of having had an affair prior to Stacy's passing and demanded the authorities investigate the matter further. Adding to the mounting suspicion was that after his wife had been pronounced dead at the hospital on September the 23rd, Joshua reportedly refused to allow an autopsy to be performed. Nevertheless, a blood sample was taken from the woman's body. It was then tested by medical examiners and it emerged that Stacy's blood contained elevated levels of tetrahydrozoline, which is commonly found in over-the-counter eye drops and nasal sprays. An attorney for the Fraud Investigations Unit of the North Carolina Department of Insurance claimed that the amount of tetrahydrozoline in the woman's system would have had a dramatic effect on her heart and likely would cause heart stoppage in a short amount of time. It was ultimately concluded that Joshua had fatally poisoned his wife with Visine eye drops and he was consequently arrested in December of 2019 on a charge of first-degree murder. The case's pre-trial motions were heard in a Gaston County court on January the 7th of 2022. Number 7. Lisa Darlene Glaze On October the 16th of 2019, Gloria Robinson was transported to Shy Street Vincent Hot Springs Hospital in Arkansas after experiencing an undisclosed medical emergency. The woman was ultimately pronounced dead and her personal effects were given to her sister and her husband by a female paramedic later identified as 50-year-old Lisa Darlene Glaze. The victim's sister reportedly noticed that three of Robinson's rings were missing. Upon asking Glaze about the misplaced items, the woman received no answer and the paramedic walked away. Two of the three rings were recovered a couple of days later, but the third piece of jewelry remained missing for roughly a week, at which point investigators learned that the item had been sold to Hot Springs Classic Guns and Pawn for $45. The victim's sister and husband identified the ring and recovered it from the pawn shop. They later had it appraised and reportedly discovered that it had an estimated value of approximately $8,000. Hot Springs police determined that the ring had been sold to the pawn shop by Glaze, who was consequently taken into custody and charged with a felony count of theft by receiving over $5,000 and a misdemeanor count of unlawful transfer of stolen property to a pawn shop. The paramedic faced a maximum prison term of 10 years for her crimes, but she agreed to a plea deal that sentenced her to six years of supervised probation in lieu of jail time. Number 6. Sarah Romine Shortly before 8 p.m. on July the 31st of 2021, Tennessee paramedic Sarah Romine got into a confrontation with two women in the parking lot outside the Soaky Mountain Water Park in in Sevierville. Local police reported that Romine, who worked as an EMT for American Medical Response, opened fire on the other women after their dispute had abruptly escalated. The victims, Kelsey Cook and Angie Russell, were transported to nearby hospitals to be treated for the gunshot wounds they'd sustained. Cook was airlifted to the University of Tennessee Medical Center in Knoxville, where she was later pronounced dead. Russell received treatment for non-life-threatening injuries at the Conte Medical Center. Romine fled the scene in the shooting's wake, but she was eventually tracked down and taken into police custody, along with a male suspect named Joshua Daniels. Investigators identified Romine as the shooter and consequently charged her with second-degree murder, multiple accounts of aggravated assault, and possessing a firearm while intoxicated. Daniels was also charged with the latter count, and both suspects were subsequently detained at the Sevier County Jail in January of 2022 
Romine was indicted on charges of first-degree murder, two counts of aggravated assault and five counts of reckless endangerment in connection to the deadly incident. Number 5. William Buckley Stout On January 8, 2021, William Buckley Stout was released from his position as a paramedic with Rowan County Emergency Services in North Carolina. The 43-year-old's termination occurred following allegations that he'd stolen a controlled substance from an ambulance that wasn't in use. According to an arrest report on January 5th, Stout had taken a 10-milligram vial of morphine from the emergency vehicle and then forged the name of another employee in the ambulance's inventory logbook. The paramedic's actions were described as unacceptable by Rowan County government officials. It emerged that in 2018, Stout, who'd previously been promoted to EMS lieutenant, was demoted to paramedic for what was described as non-disciplinary reasons. Approximately two weeks following the morphine theft, Stout was charged with embezzling a controlled substance. Number 4. Kevin McCorvey On the evening of November the 12th of 2021, a non-emergency ambulance driven by Kevin McCorvey carried a dialysis patient through the town of Fairburn, Georgia, roughly 20 miles south of Atlanta. At about 7.30 p.m., McCorvey reportedly lost control of the vehicle and veered off the road, which resulted in the ambulance turning over and rolling into a ditch. Police officers who arrived at the scene shortly thereafter used the ladder to climb into the back of the ambulance, where they found McCorvey, a female paramedic and the patient, identified as 66-year-old Wilton Thomason Jr. The paramedic was extricated safely from the overturned vehicle, and it was reported that she'd only suffered a minor scratch in the accident. The officers came upon McCorvey attempting to resuscitate an unconscious Thomason, who was later pronounced dead as a result of trauma that he'd suffered in the crash. As first responders were working to remove Thomason's body from the ambulance, McCorvey and the other paramedic called for an Uber in which they had allegedly planned to flee the scene. The pair were quickly tracked down by local police, who noted that McCorvey's breath smelled distinctly of alcohol. The ambulance driver ultimately admitted to having been intoxicated at the time of the crash, and he was thereupon detained by law enforcement. He was booked into the Fulton County Jail in charge with a DUI, second-degree vehicular homicide, failure to maintain lane and possession of an open container. According to the most recent updates on the case, McCorvey was denied bond during a hearing at Fulton County Superior Court on November the 15th. Number 3. Joshua Colon Florida man Joshua Colon, who'd been named Polk County's Paramedic of the Year in 2020, was taken into police custody in January of the following year, days after his resignation from Polk County Fire Rescue. His arrest occurred following an investigation by the County Sheriff's Office, which had been launched after a battalion chief noticed inconsistencies in paperwork that Colon had filed. The decorated paramedic had reportedly been tasked with administering the COVID-19 vaccine to other first responders. Investigators discovered that three of the documents filed in connection to Colon's assignment had been forged, one with the name of a former Haines City firefighter and two with fake names. Upon being interviewed by county deputies, Colon reportedly admitted to falsifying the paperwork on behalf of fire rescue captain Anthony Damiano. The latter had allegedly asked Colon to obtain doses of the vaccine for his elderly mother. The paramedic initially refused, but Damiano then threatened to tell his supervisors that Colon was stealing the vaccine for himself. Pressured by the threat, he begrudgingly went along with the fire captain's scheme. Colon was consequently charged with forgery, uttering a false instrument, criminal use of personal identification, creating a fictitious person, and falsifying an official record as a public servant. Damiano, a 17-year veteran of the fire department, reportedly resigned with the intent to retire before turning himself into the authorities. He was charged with petty theft and falsifying official records. Number 2. Jonathan Vass Nurse Jane Clough was walking to her car on the night of July the 25th of 2010 after she'd just finished her shift in the accident and emergency wing at Blackpool Victoria Hospital in Lancashire, England. Before the 26-year-old made it to her vehicle, however, she was reportedly stabbed multiple times by a male assailant. Police were called to the hospital staff parking lot at about 8.30 p.m. and Clough was rushed to the emergency room, located only about 100 yards from where she'd been brutally attacked. Her co-workers fought to save her life, but she ultimately passed away a short time later. Clough's autopsy concluded that she'd succumbed to excessive blood loss 
resulting from the 71 stab wounds she'd sustained. The morning after the incident, law enforcement went to the home of paramedic Jonathan Vass in the village of Barrowford and took the 30-year-old into custody. According to subsequent findings, the man had previously left his wife to move in with Clough. Before her tragic death, Clough alleged that Vass had assaulted her in their home, a crime for which the paramedic eventually faced charges. He posted bail and Clough, upon learning he was out of police custody, reportedly wrote several entries in her personal journal expressing fear that he might violate the terms of his release and come after her. Her prescient concerns came to tragic fruition on the night of July the 25th, when Vass ambushed her in the hospital parking lot and stabbed her to death. He was consequently sentenced to a minimum prison term of 30 years. Number 1. Daniel Murphy Florida paramedic Daniel Murphy, aged 23, got into an altercation with his girlfriend at their Lakeland residence on June the 26th of 2020. Court documents detailed how the emergency worker had been confronted by his partner of seven months about his alleged infidelity, which led to heated arguments between them. As the victim would later tell investigators, she'd been on the phone with a friend when Murphy grabbed her arm, snatched the phone and threw it against the wall. The woman consequently suffered bruising and she called the police. By the time deputies arrived at the home, Murphy had already fled the scene, although he too called the authorities a short time later to report that he'd actually been the victim during a conflict with his girlfriend. When officers made contact with the young man, they discovered that he had prescription drugs, multiple IV lines and needles, as well as saline bags and syringes in his possession. After being questioned by detectives, Murphy ultimately confessed to stealing the medical equipment from his place of work. During police interviews with the paramedic's girlfriend, more dramatic revelations followed. It emerged that after passing out from drinking too much one night, she'd awoken to find an IV in her arm and what appeared to be blood being drawn out. One of Murphy's ex-girlfriends had also allegedly told the victim that the paramedic frequently asked her if he could draw her blood during the course of their relationship. Murphy later denied the allegations but did admit to drawing people's blood as part of a friend's art project. He was taken into custody and charged with domestic violence battery, petty theft and possession of prescription drugs without a prescription. Murphy's employment with Polk County Fire Rescue was reportedly terminated following his arrest. Number 7. Kane Velasquez in the early 2010s, Cain Velasquez was arguably the UFC's most feared and dominant heavyweight. He went on to become a two-time champion for the promotion before he was ultimately forced to retire from MMA following a string of injuries. Velasquez had a brief professional wrestling career in the WWE before he was released amidst pandemic-related budget cuts in 2020. The former professional athlete was officially charged with one count of attempted murder in addition to several counts of related weapon charges on March the 2nd of 2022. The incident for which 39-year-old Velasquez was charged stemmed from a shooting that had taken place on February the 28th, roughly a week after a man named Harry Goulart Jr. had been released from custody on a personal recognizance bond. Goulart had been detained on felony charges for allegedly abusing one of Velasquez's younger relatives. On a stretch of a main freeway in Santa Clara County, California, the former MMA star chased after a pickup truck that contained 43-year-old Galate, his stepfather and one other person. He rammed the truck with his own vehicle, then fired a 40 caliber pistol at Galate through the window. Velasquez missed his intended target and instead struck the man's stepfather, inflicting non-life-threatening injuries. Velasquez was later arrested and booked into the Santa Clara County Jail. Many within the MMA community expressed their support of the athlete in the aftermath, sparking a movement to free Kane. The same message was written on the t-shirts of nearly 100 people that showed up outside the California court where he was formally arraigned. Number 6. Shamik Holdsclaw Following an accomplished WNBA career that spanned over 11 years, Shamik Holdsclaw retired in 2010. Throughout her professional run, Holdsclaw earned an Olympic gold medal, while domestically, she was a six-time WNBA All-Star. In her autobiography entitled Breaking Through, Beating the Odds Shot After Shot, the former sports star wrote that she'd battled with mental health issues during her basketball career. In November of 2012, Holdsclaw went to see her ex-girlfriend, Jennifer Lacey, who at the time was working out at a church on Atlanta's Ponce de Leon Avenue. The 35-year-old former sportswoman approached Lacey, a player for the WNBA's Tulsa Shock, 
to say that she wanted to return some items. Upon driving away from the church in her Range Rover, 29-year-old Lacey noticed that Holdsclaw was following her. The former drove to a friend's house and upon exiting her SUV was approached by Holdsclaw, who was wielding a baseball bat. Lacey fled into her friend's house and then watched as her ex used the bat to smash the windows of her car prior to firing a handgun into it. It was reported that Holdsclaw had earlier poured gasoline into Lacey's vehicle and that she'd fired the gun in hopes of blowing it up. Lacey and her friend were unhurt in the incident and a warrant was put out for Holdsclaw's arrest. After she was taken into custody, the former WNBA star was charged with aggravated assault, criminal damage, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. She pleaded guilty in June of 2013 and was sentenced to three years probation, ordered to perform community service and pay a $3,000 fine. Number 5. Dennis Rodman Dennis Rodman, one of the most celebrated defensive players in NBA history, rose to superstardom during his three championship run with the Chicago Bulls, playing alongside Michael Jordan. Rodman was a controversial figure during his time as a professional athlete, mostly stemming from a wild man persona, much of which he maintained after retiring from the NBA in 2000. He struggled with alcohol abuse, even appearing on rehab-related reality TV shows and developed a highly publicized friendship with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, whom he visited several times. In early 2003, Rodman was arrested on domestic violence charges for assaulting his then fiance at his home in Newport Beach, California. The following year, he was ordered to serve 30 days of home detention after pleading no contest to charges of drunk driving in Las Vegas. Additional arrests for spousal battery and driving under the influence followed in 2008 and 2018, respectively, with Rodman receiving three years of probation for the latter. More recently, in 2019, the former NBA athlete was charged with a single misdemeanor count of battery for slapping an acquaintance of his, named as Jeff Saluk, at the Buddha Sky Bar in Delray Beach, Florida. Rodman was celebrating his 48th birthday at the time and according to an arrest affidavit, he abruptly turned around and struck Saluk, who had been standing behind him. He hit him twice with an open hand in what was described as an unprovoked attack. The 30-year-old victim reported that he was left with considerable swelling and a corneal abrasion that rendered him unable to work. An agreement was reached the following year that required Rodman to pay Saluk $250 in restitution, maintain his distance from him, and avoid further legal trouble in order for the battery charges to be dropped. Number 4. Mike Tyson Once nicknamed the baddest man on the planet, boxer Mike Tyson has been embroiled in a plethora of controversies and legal problems ever since his pre-teens, through his professional career and after his retirement. Tyson had already been arrested 38 times by the age of 13 before he was taken under the wing of trainer Cus Diamato and molded into an elite boxer. After making his professional debut in the mid-1980s, an aura of invincibility followed Tyson, who became the youngest heavyweight champion in history at the age of 20. He was the most feared and dominant pugilist in the sport up until his loss to Buster Douglas in 1990, considered one of boxing's biggest upsets. In July of the following year, Tyson was arrested for allegedly forcing himself upon 18-year-old Desiree Washington. He was found guilty, sentenced to six years in prison, and paroled after three. Tyson enjoyed sporadic success following his release, even briefly regaining his WBC and WBA titles before retiring from professional boxing in 2005 following back-to-back -back losses. Prior to his last fight, an USA Today interview with Tyson was released in which he was quoted as saying, I just want to escape. I'm really embarrassed with myself and my life. In late December of 2006, Tyson nearly crashed into a police SUV after driving away from a nightclub in Scottsdale, Arizona. According to a probable cause statement filed by Maricopa County Superior Court, Tyson admitted to having used drugs and to being an addict upon being questioned by the authorities. He was charged with felony drug possession and paraphernalia possession counts as well as two misdemeanor counts of driving under the influence of drugs. While awaiting trial on the charges, he checked himself into an inpatient treatment program. He pleaded guilty to cocaine possession and driving under the influence in September of 2007 and spent 24 hours in an Arizona jail. A judge praised Tyson for seeking help for his addiction and, in lieu of more jail time, ordered him to serve three years probation and complete 360 hours of community service. Number 3. Ronaldinho Ronaldo de Assis Moreira, 
commonly known as Ronaldinho, is often regarded as a standout of his generation and as being among the most gifted soccer players of all time. He was an integral member of the Brazilian national team that won the World Cup in 2002 and also had a celebrated club career, particularly at Barcelona, which contributed to him becoming the 2005 Ballon d'Or winner. Following his retirement from the sport, Ronaldinho has had several legal troubles. In July of 2019, dozens of his properties were confiscated, along with his Brazilian and Spanish passports for unpaid taxes and fines. The following year, the former soccer superstar and his brother Roberto were detained by authorities in Paraguay for attempting to enter the country using fake passports. On March the 6th, they'd arrived to launch an online casino and promote a book but were taken into custody after presenting passports which had been issued to two women before being modified. The documents falsely claimed that they were naturalized Paraguayan citizens and immediately attracted attention due to Ronaldinho's international fame. He spent his 40th birthday in jail but was allowed to move to Asuncion's Palmaroga Hotel along with his brother as part of a house arrest agreement. A judge eventually released Ronaldinho and Roberto following a plea deal with fines of $90,000 and $110,000 for the brothers respectively. After a forced stay of nearly six months in Paraguay, they returned to Brazil in August of 2020. Number two, Joanna Nalborska. A former North Carolina State University tennis star was arrested for domestic assault alongside her boyfriend following an altercation at their home off of Trinity Ridge Road in Raleigh. The incident took place in November of 2018 and it involved Joanna Nalborska and Gilmore Desjois, aged 25 and 22, respectively. The former had been a prodigious player for the Wolfpack from 2014 to 2017. An unspecified heated argument had occurred between the Polish native and her partner that ultimately devolved into a physical struggle. As reported by arresting officers, Desjois had choked Nalborska to which she'd responded by striking him with a meat tenderizer. Consequently, the former star athlete was charged with assault with a deadly weapon while her boyfriend was taken into custody on a charge of assault by strangulation. Number 1. Anthony Smith Defensive end Anthony Smith played football professionally with the Oakland Los Angeles Razors for seven seasons. He was the team's top pick in 1990 out of the University of Arizona and retired from the sport in the late 1990s when he was 31 years old. Smith became affiliated with street gangs and was involved in criminal activities within only a few years of ending his career. In 2008, the former NFL athlete and two associates were charged with the murder of mechanic Marilio Ponce, who had been found beaten and shot to death in Lancaster, California. Smith and Ponce had reportedly been involved in a cargo theft together and after the latter's death, Smith was seen driving his car. A jury deadlocked in April of 2011 and a retrial was expected, but as he awaited new legal proceedings, Smith was charged with three other killings. In 1999, brothers Kevin and Ricky Nettles were kidnapped from a Los Angeles car wash by two individuals posing as police officers. The brothers were tortured as evidenced by a clothing iron-shaped burn on Ricky's stomach and then executed. Their bodies with their heads wrapped in duct tape were found a day after their abduction. On June the 25th of 2001, Smith was alleged to have kidnapped Dennis Henderson in the LA neighborhood of Mar Vista. The following day, his body was discovered in Watts in the back of a rental car. Henderson had been beaten and stabbed to death. After a preliminary hearing in October of 2012, a judge determined there was enough evidence for Smith to stand trial for the four murders of which he stood accused. A jury again deadlocked on Ponce, but in November of 2015, Smith was convicted of the murders of Henderson and the Nettles brothers. Prosecutors didn't seek the death penalty and the once promising NFL athlete was given three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Number 7. Tishon Hightower Roughly a week after he'd entered his name into the 2020 NBA draft, a gifted college basketball player was taken into police custody on murder charges. 21-year-old Tishon Hightower a guard for Tulane University was identified as a suspect in the fatal shooting of 24-year-old Georgia man Devontae Long. Prior to transferring to Tulane, Hightower, a native of Georgia, had played two seasons for the Georgia Bulldogs. He was one of six people suspected to have been involved in the killing with the list including his brother Jeffrey. The shooting of Long took place on April the 8th at an apartment complex in Spindletop Way, Stockbridge, shortly before 11 a.m. 
According to an arrest warrant obtained by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Long had allegedly pistol-whipped a man named Tyreek Farmer during an altercation earlier in the morning. The latter called for assistance and Hightower arrived at the apartment complex along with the others accused in the case. They confronted Long in a breezeway and his girlfriend would later report seeing Hightower pull out a turquoise and black handgun out of his pocket. She then ran to hide in the apartment and heard gunshots. Later that evening, the basketball star tweeted out, God protect my people, a message that investigators suspected had been connected to the shooting. While detectives pointed to Hightower as the gunman, his attorney, Averick Walker, claimed that the authorities were trying to make him out to be a monster. Walker reported that it was actually Jeffrey Hightower who'd fired the weapon and that he'd done so in self-defense. The legal representative mentioned that Jeffrey and the others had had a right under state law to stand their ground, as Long had emerged from the apartment with a gun that he pointed at the college athlete. No convictions had been made and the investigation was ongoing as of the latest updates on the matter. Number 6. Avante Williams Avante Williams, a sophomore safety for the Miami Hurricanes, was arrested and charged with one count of aggravated battery on a pregnant woman in July of 2021. As Williams left for football practice, he and his girlfriend, who was 31 weeks pregnant with his child at the time, had gotten into an argument about his new relationship. In subsequent interviews with the police, Williams would refer to the unnamed woman with whom he lived and had two other children as his ex. During the verbal exchange, he'd reportedly told her to leave the apartment they shared in the West Kendall area by the time he returned from practice. Williams then flew into a fit of rage when he found her still packing at the apartment when he came back. The football player was reported to have grabbed the mother of his children by the hair and thrown her around the apartment before pushing her outside, causing her to fall and hit her head on the pavement. The woman, who was later treated for bruising to her neck and arms at West Kendall Hospital, alerted a neighbor and they called 911. Williams was taken into custody and immediately suspended from all team activities at the University of Miami. Number 5. Danielle Puddyfoot In April of 2015, a University of Bridgeport women's soccer player assaulted a teammate over what police reported had been a perceived snub at an awards ceremony. 22-year-old senior Danielle Puddyfoot, originally from Slough, England, had already been drinking on April the 30th prior to attending a sports awards banquet at the Connecticut University. Another athlete had received the coach's player award, which upset Puddyfoot. The young woman felt that she'd been repeatedly passed over as she hadn't received any official recognition during her four years playing for the team. Puddyfoot was already heavily intoxicated by the time she went to a post-banquet dorm party, where she reportedly began berating her teammates. An altercation ensued between Puddyfoot and 18-year-old Haley Marquis. Puddyfoot headbutted the teen and the strike was delivered with such force that Marquis was knocked over two chairs and onto the floor. She was left with facial swelling and two black eyes. Puddyfoot then continued slamming her own head against the wooden wardrobe closets in the room. After a struggle, Puddyfoot's teammates got her into the hallway where she began ramming doors and walls with her head until she passed out. The young woman was arrested and charged with third-degree assault and disorderly conduct. She was subsequently granted accelerated rehabilitation by a Bridgeport Superior Court judge, with her charges to be dismissed upon the successful completion of one year of probation. Number 4. Michael Harris in February of 2020, an employee at a business in Grove City, Ohio, called the police to report that an aggressive man refused to leave their building, noting that he appeared to be unaware of his surroundings. He would later be identified as college football player Michael Harris, a linebacker at Eastern Kentucky University. Two officers arrived at the scene and a confrontation that took place outside of Harris's vehicle was captured by their monitoring equipment. Officer Carrie Rose, who was trained as a crisis negotiator, was the first at the scene and talked with Harris for several minutes, noting that he was agitated and unable to stand still. A male colleague of Rose's then approached Harris, who kept his arms raised but continued exhibiting erratic behavior. Both officers then decided to handcuff him, suspecting he was under the influence. Before he could be restrained, however, Harris pushed the male officer away and tried to get back in his car. Fearing an escalation of the altercation, the officer pepper sprayed Harris, but it proved ineffective as he pulled the hood of his sweatshirt over his face. Then, as Rose and her colleagues struggled to handcuff a crouched Harris, the football player lifted the male officer high into the air and then slammed him into the concrete, falling to the ground with him. 
Efforts to restrain the 6'3", 245-pound athlete continued with the intervention of Rose and that of a third officer who approached the scene from a separate cruiser. Lieutenant Eric Scott with the Grove City Police Department described the officer at the scene as a very strong man in his own right, but quoted him describing the altercation with Harris as saying, I cannot believe the strength this man had. The college athlete was successfully taken into custody and charged with assault against a police officer, a felony in Ohio, as well as with resisting arrest and disorderly conduct while intoxicated. A digital scale and drugs were also allegedly found in his vehicle. Number 3. Emily Heiz and Corrine Varney Two volleyball players from Florida Atlantic University were arrested and charged with grand theft in April of 2017. Emily Heise and Corrine Varney had entered a Macy's retail store in the town center of Boca Raton with Pacific Sunwear bags that were relatively empty. Luca Rispoli, the store's asset protection representative, had reportedly noticed suspicious activity on behalf of the students in the women's active wear department. The pair had entered several fit-in rooms and two Macy's employees subsequently determined that a number of items were missing. Rispoli noticed that Heise and Varney had emerged with their bags considerably larger. They had allegedly passed all points of sale and made no attempts to purchase the concealed merchandise, the combined worth of which was estimated at $1,400. Rispoli recovered the items and the two prominent college athletes were arrested by the police, charged with theft and issued trespass warnings for Macy's. They were described as extremely remorseful by the responding officers. It's unclear what type of punishment they received from FAU's athletic program, but both were set to appear at the 15th Judicial Circuit of Florida Court in Palm Beach County in June of that same year. Number 2. Kamaya Street A promising basketball player at Georgia's Kennesaw State University was charged with robbery and murder along with four other suspects. In November of 2019, on July the 16th of that year, businessman Nashim Hubbard Etienne, age 21, was gunned down at the Heritage Station Apartments in Atlanta. While her role remained unspecified, 21-year-old star athlete Kamaya Street would later admit to her involvement after she was identified by the Atlanta Police Department. Through surveillance footage of the homicide, it was reported that Street's group had begun shouting at Hubbard Etienne and an unidentified man accompanying him as they emerged from a car in the apartment complex's parking area. The former suffered fatal gunshot wounds, but some sources proposed He'd been the collateral victim of an ongoing dispute. In an interview with the media, Mayan Hubbard Armster, the deceased mother, reported that the other man had been the intended target of the shooting as he'd allegedly owed money to Street from a game of dice. Hubbard Armster also noted an utter lack of remorse on the sportswoman's part as she returned to playing basketball in the murder's aftermath. Street's accomplices were named as Don Tobias Bradley, Jonathan Gilstrap, Tobias Wells and Cortez Banks. All but Bradley were apprehended within months of the shooting. Street was arrested just days after she'd been named Player of the Week by the ASUN Conference for the fourth time in her basketball career. She risked spending the rest of her life in prison as her numerous charges included three counts of felony murder, two counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and one count each of armed robbery and firearm possession. While no further information has been made available since, it's believed that Street might be granted immunity or a more lenient sentence under a deal to testify against the others. Number 1. Rashawn Jones On the evening of November the 7th of 2006, Brian Patter, a defensive lineman for the Miami Hurricanes was fatally shot in the head as he got out of his SUV in front of his apartment complex, located about four miles from the Miami campus. Investigators determined that the gunman, who'd most likely been lying in wait, had ambushed the college sports star and then fled the scene within minutes. Before his life was cut short, 22-year-old Patter had been only months away from likely being selected in the NFL draft. He was found by his girlfriend, Jada Brody, who'd reportedly heard the gunshots. Police interviewed dozens of people and amassed thousands of pages in the case files before ultimately arresting Patter's former teammate, Rashawn Jones, roughly 15 years after the incident. Multiple reports indicated that their relationship was marred by conflict during their time at the Hurricanes. Jones had previously dated Brody, an aspect that became a source of contention between the two men. Two months before his death, Patter had reportedly bested Jones in a physical altercation to which the latter reacted by threatening to shoot him. 
Investigators claim that Jones, aged 35 when he was arrested in 2021, had always been a suspect, but building the case against him required time. After the shooting, a witness had given the description of a man fleeing in the area and the rendering of a sketch artist closely resembled Jones. The same witness picked him out of a photo lineup in 2007 and again in 2020. On the night of the killing, Jones had missed a mandatory team meeting and while he claimed to have been at home, cell phone location data placed him near Patter's apartment. The bullet recovered from the victim's head also matched a caliber of handgun that Jones was known to have owned. Number 7. Flordelis Dos Santos In 2019, a former evangelical Christian singer and pastor named Flordelis Dos Santos was elected to represent Rio de Janeiro in the Brazilian government's Chamber of Deputies. On June the 16th of that same year, Dos Santos' husband, Anderson do Carmo, was fatally shot over 30 times outside their home in the city of Niteroi, the 60-year-old politician who was with her husband at the time of his murder, wasn't injured in the shooting. Investigators subsequently determined that Docamo's killer was one of the couple's four biological children, Flavio dos Santos. The gun he'd used to execute his father had reportedly been purchased by Lucas dos Santos, one of the couple's 51 adopted children. They both ultimately pleaded guilty to murder charges. In August of 2020, however, more dramatic details were discovered regarding Doc Carmo's death. The authorities came to the conclusion that Flordelis had been involved in orchestrating the murder herself, and several more of her children were implicated in the plot as well. She was formally charged on August the 24th, the same day law enforcement officials took five of her adopted children, two of her biological children, and one of her grandchildren into custody in connection to the deadly incident. Police suggested that Flordelis had been motivated to kill her husband by a struggle for power and the prospect of her financial emancipation. According to Brazilian digital news outlet G1, the politician had attempted to fatally poison Docamo on several occasions, starting in 2018, which had resulted in a number of hospital visits for him. In June of 2021, the Ethics Council of Brazil and the Chamber Floor voted to remove Flordelis from her political office and she was thus stripped of her parliamentary immunity. Number 6. Gregory Scott Hopkins On September the 1st of 1979, Catherine Janet Walsh was found dead inside her home in the western Pennsylvania town of Monaca. The 23-year-old's father had reportedly been unable to reach her over Labor Day weekend and consequently went to her apartment. It was there that he stumbled upon his daughter's body bound and strangled in her bed. Walsh, who was working for a refrigerator company at the time of her death, had no children and lived alone in an apartment owned by her parents. The murder case subsequently went cold for roughly three decades. In 2010, a state police serologist found new DNA evidence on Walsh's nightgown, the rope that had been used to bind her hands and the bedsheet that had been placed over her body. Investigators were able to positively match the forensic evidence with the DNA of a Bridgewater Borough councillor named Gregory Scott Hopkins. It later emerged that Hopkins had been in a casual romantic relationship with Walsh at the time of her killing. He was ultimately convicted of third-degree murder in November of 2013 and consequently sentenced to serve 8 to 16 years in prison. In April of 2020, it was reported that Hopkins, who was by then in his mid-70s, had been granted a retrial by the Superior Court of Pennsylvania. As of the latest updates on the matter, it wasn't clear whether or not Hopkins' new trial was yet underway. Number 5. Alison Eichley Freeman On the morning of May the 22nd of 2020, Oklahoma State Senator Alison Eichley Freeman was traveling down the Turner Turnpike as she headed towards the Capitol building. At the time of her commute, the 29-year-old was reportedly driving recklessly at speeds of up to 91 miles per hour. And in conditions of heavy rain, Eichley Freeman ultimately lost control of her vehicle which then skidded across the rain-slicked road and crashed directly into a Chevy Camaro. The second vehicle was at the time stuck in a ditch after having veered off the roadway as well. The driver of the Camaro, later identified as 44-year-old Enrique Lopez, was killed on impact, while Eichley Freeman was left critically injured by the collision. Highway troopers later detailed how the state senator was trapped inside of her car for roughly 40 minutes before first responders extricated her from the wreckage and 
transported her to Oklahoma University Medical Center. Subsequent reports suggested that Ikeley Freeman had largely recovered from her injuries. In November of 2020, she lost her re-election bid and less than a week later, she was charged with first-degree manslaughter in connection to the fatal car accident. Number 4. Efren Carrillo In the early morning hours of July the 13th of 2013, a woman from Santa Rosa, California, called the police to report that someone was attempting to break into her house. When officers arrived at the scene, they came upon Sonoma County Supervisor Efren Carrillo, who was reportedly wearing only socks and underwear while carrying a cell phone. The local politician was taken into custody on charges of prowling and burglary, but was released that same day after posting his $40,000 bail. The homeowner would later tell Sonoma County detectives that, on the night in question, she'd awoken to the sound of rustling on the blinds of her bedroom window and that she'd also heard a knock at her front door. Investigators found that the screen on the woman's bedroom window had been torn open by Carrillo as it attempted to gain access to the home in the wake of what was widely considered to have been an embarrassing incident. Carrillo publicly expressed his remorse over his actions. The politician attributed his bizarre behavior to the fact that he'd been drinking heavily on the night prior to the attempted break-in. He immediately checked himself into an alcohol rehabilitation facility following his arrest, which had marked his second run-in with the law in the span of less than a year. In September of 2012, Carrillo was arrested for taking part in a brawl at a San Diego nightclub in which a man was seriously injured. He was charged with misdemeanor battery and disturbing the peace, but the case was later dropped. Number 3. Sean Cattle A political consultant from New Jersey was arrested after it was discovered that he'd solicited the services of two hitmen to murder his colleague in April of 2014. The court documents associated with the case didn't disclose the names of the victim or the suspects involved. However, the description of the situation that was provided by prosecutors reportedly matched the circumstances surrounding the 2014 death of 52-year-old Michael Galdieri, a longtime political operative who'd worked for Cattle's consulting group. It was previously assumed that Galdieri, who'd been arrested on drugs and weapons charges in 2007, had been killed during a drug-related dispute. In January of 2022, however, investigators were able to connect Cattle to the incident. The latter reportedly confessed to paying thousands of dollars for a pair of hitmen to carry out the fatal stabbing at the victim's Jersey City residence before setting the apartment ablaze in an effort to conceal any evidence of the murder. 44-year-old Cattle appeared in federal court via video conference and ultimately pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder for hire. It was reported that the maximum penalty for his crime was life imprisonment and a $250,000 fine. Cattle was released from custody on a $1 million unsecured bond and he was subsequently ordered to remain inside his home until his criminal trial. Today's topic was requested by KPG Doxima, Christian Gooman, Stax the Hustler, Bal Bustos, and Ricardo Garcia. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Rebecca Warren Michigan State Police received multiple reports of a car swerving perilously across the painted lines on Interstate 75 on the night of December the 26th of 2019. An officer patrolling the highway reportedly witnessed the vehicle in question veering onto the hard shoulder and making contact with a guardrail. The car was then pulled over and its driver, who identified herself as Rebecca Warren, a member of the Michigan House of Representatives, was given a field sobriety test. As was captured by the trooper's dash cam, Warren was unable to walk in a straight line and also unsuccessfully attempted to recite the alphabet. The politician reportedly told the officers that she was driving to her home in Ann Arbor after an event at the Renaissance Center in Detroit, at which she claimed to have consumed only two or three glasses of wine. Throughout her interaction with the state troopers, Warren boasted about her status within the community. She reportedly begged them not to take her into custody, claiming that doing so would end her career and go down as their most famous arrest. The lawmaker refused to consent to a breathalyzer test at the scene of the traffic stop, but two vials of her blood were eventually collected at a nearby hospital. It was ultimately determined that her blood alcohol level was 0.212, which is nearly three times the legal driving limit. Warren pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of misdemeanor driving while intoxicated and was consequently sentenced to one year of probation and 10 years of community service. Number 1. 
Mario Zelaya. Mario Zelaya served as the director of the Honduran Institute for Social Security during the administration of President Porfirio Lobo from 2010 to 2014. While he was on a business trip to Chile, Zelaya reportedly became infatuated with a local woman named Natalia Kiyofari, age 28. He showered her with lavish gifts in an effort to impress her with his purported wealth. Zelaya allegedly vowed to help Kiyofari leave the Platinum Club in Santiago, where she worked as a high-class escort and exotic dancer. During the course of their relationship, which the Honduran politician kept secret from his wife and three children, Zelaya reportedly bought Kiyofari two apartments, a beachside property, two SUVs, as well as high-end perfumes, watches, and clothes. In addition to the opulent gifts, Zelaya was alleged to have given his mistress roughly $4,000 in cash on a monthly basis. Honduran authorities began investigating Zelaya's financial affairs in 2013. It was ultimately discovered that the politician had been siphoning money directly from the Institute for Social Security, which is reportedly granted an annual budget of approximately $165 million. In all, Zelaya had embezzled an estimated $300 million in federal funds, only a small portion of which ended up going to Kiyofadi. The latter, who'd become pregnant with Zelaya's child during their affair, was investigated as part of the corruption probe as well. She, however, maintained having had no knowledge of her lover's financial misdeeds. Zelaya went on the run in January of 2014, but following a seven-month-long manhunt, he was tracked down and taken into custody on charges of fraud, bribery, abuse of public funds, and money laundering. Number 7. Valerie Cincinelli In May of 2019, a New York police officer was arrested after it emerged that she'd attempted to orchestrate her estranged husband's murder. The FBI had reportedly been tipped off about 34-year-old Valerie Cincinelli's sinister plot by the woman's boyfriend, John DeRuba. According to a federal criminal complaint, Cincinelli, a 12-year veteran of the NYPD, had approached DeRuba in February. She'd expressed an intention of hiring a hitman to kill Isaiah Carvalho, with whom she'd been embroiled in a contentious divorce and custody battle. The officer also reportedly sought to eliminate her boyfriend's teenage daughter, who was only identified in court records as Jane Doe. Cincinelli allegedly paid DeRuba $7,000 after he claimed to have found someone willing to carry out the murders for that amount. As part of a sting operation organized by federal investigators, the police were sent to Cincinelli's home in Oceanside, Long Island, on the morning of May the 17th to notify her that her husband had been murdered. Shortly thereafter, Cincinelli received a text message from an FBI agent posing as the hitman Deruba had supposedly hired. The agent instructed her to wire an additional $3,000 as payment for the hit on Deruba's daughter. Later that same day, law enforcement officials took Cincinelli into custody and she was charged with conspiracy to commit murder. She was subsequently held without bail in Central Islip in October of 2021. It was reported that the former NYPD officer had been sentenced to four years in federal prison as part of a plea deal with prosecutors. Number 6. Newman Raja In the early morning hours of October the 18th of 2015, Corey Jones's car broke down on a highway exit ramp in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. The 31-year-old was heading home after, on the previous night, his band had performed at Johnny Mango's Tiki Bar and Grill in the town of Jupiter. Jones was awaiting the arrival of a tow truck off Interstate 99 when a plainclothes police officer named Newman Raja noticed his disabled vehicle and approached it in an unmarked white van. Jones, who was armed with a firearm for which he had a concealed carry license, reportedly confronted Raja, whom he believed to be a burglar. The officer then discharged a total of six shots in the motorist's direction. Jones was hit with three bullets, one of which fatally pierced his aorta. Raja, who'd been doing burglary surveillance on the night later, claimed to have been under the impression that Jones was a carjacker. In court, Raja maintained that he'd identified himself as a police officer before firing his gun. His claims were refuted after investigators reviewed a recording of the officer's conversation with Jones, which had been extracted from the victim's cell phone. Not only had Raja neglected to identify himself as a member of law enforcement, 
He also reportedly hadn't been wearing the designated police vest that his supervisor had instructed him to put on while performing burglary surveillance. Following his criminal trial, Raja was convicted of manslaughter by culpable negligence and attempted first-degree murder with a firearm. He was ultimately sentenced to 25 years in prison. Number 5. Matthew Kinney at about 2 p.m. on May the 19th of 2019, a boy from Lafayette County, Mississippi, made the horrific discovery that his mother, 32-year-old Dominique Clayton, had been fatally shot in her sleep. It was quickly determined that the mother of four had been murdered by an Oxford police officer named Matthew Kinney, who was arrested the following day. During the investigation that followed the shooting, a connection was found between the victim and her killer. It emerged that Kinney, who was married with children at the time, had been having an affair with Clayton. As his shift was nearing his end on May the 19th, the officer reportedly drove his marked police cruiser to Clayton's house and broke in. To find that the woman was asleep, he went back to his car and retrieved his Glock 9mm handgun which he then used to shoot her in the back of the head. Clayton's family later revealed to investigators that she'd become afraid of Kinney and worried he might harm her after she'd told him she might be pregnant. Another version of the underlying motive suggested that Clayton had threatened to divulge the details of their relationship to Kinney's wife after he'd attempted to break up with her. Although prosecutors had initially pursued the death penalty, Kinney was ultimately sentenced to life in prison after reaching a plea deal. Number 4. Henry Solis Henry Solis, a probationary officer for the Los Angeles Police Department, got into a heated argument with a man at a bar in downtown Pomona, California, on March 13, 2015, after the man, later identified as 23-year-old Salome Rodriguez, had left the establishment. Solis reportedly followed him on foot. The officer, who was off duty at the time, then fatally shot him multiple times. Solis subsequently fled to the Paso del Norte border crossing in Texas, from where he was escorted into Mexico by his father via a pedestrian bridge. Solis remained in hiding for roughly two months until he was eventually tracked down by the authorities. He was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. During his consequent trial, Solis claimed to have been acting in self-defense when he'd shot Rodriguez, a contention that the jury assigned to his case ultimately rejected. In February of 2020, Solis was convicted of murder and later sentenced to 40 years to life in prison. His father was charged with making a false statement to law enforcement after it was discovered that he'd lied about helping his son flee the country. He was sentenced to three years of probation and ordered to pay a thousand dollar fine. Number 3. Rosemary and Lovu South African police constable Rosemary and Lovu was taken into custody in 2018 following the revelation that she had attempted to orchestrate the murder of her sister. Prior to her arrest, Ndlovu had reportedly been a well-respected member of the South African Police Service, having risen to the rank of sergeant while posted at the Tembisa Precinct Station. The officer's murderous scheme was exposed by an undercover officer whom Ndlovu had unwittingly hired as a hitman. She was caught on tape enlisting the latter and another man to burn her sister, Joyce, and her five children to death inside their house. And Lovu had allegedly hoped the fire would be viewed as an accident, allowing her to collect the large amount of insurance money that would subsequently be paid out. It soon emerged that the sergeant had previously hired hitmen to carry out the killings of her living partner and five of her own relatives, all of whom had been murdered at various points between 2012 and 2018. And Lovu was reportedly living lavishly off the insurance payouts from policies she'd taken out on the victims. According to the South African media outlet News24, the officer had pocketed nearly a million dollars after cashing in on her family's life and funeral insurance. In November of 2021, Endlovo was sentenced to six concurrent life sentences by the South Gauteng High Court in Johannesburg. Number 2. Wayne Cousins Shortly after 9.30 p.m. on March 3rd of 2021, marketing executive Sarah Everard, aged 33, was arrested by a Metropolitan Police officer in Clapham, South London. The officer, identified as 48-year-old Wayne Cousins, 
had reportedly stopped the woman on the street as she was walking home from a friend's house. He then proceeded to handcuff her under the false pretense that she'd violated local COVID-19 guidelines. Cousins then forced her into a white car that he'd rented only a few hours earlier. The officer's cell phone was later pinged in the village of Sibbetswold. The authorities would determine it to be the area where the officer had assaulted and fatally strangled Everard in the early morning hours of March the 4th. The victim's boyfriend contacted local law enforcement to report her missing later that day, and an investigation into her whereabouts was subsequently set into motion. Roughly a week later, Cousins was arrested on suspicion of kidnapping Everard. They'd been spotted together in CCTV footage, corresponding to the night of her disappearance. The following day, the police found human remains in Hodes Wood, near Ashford, and a medical examiner was subsequently able to identify the body as Everard by her dental records. Cousins had allegedly burned the victim's body in a refrigerator before disposing of the remains in a pond near the woods where she was found. The officer pleaded guilty to Everard's murder and on September the 29th, he was given a whole life sentence, which is the most severe punishment possible under British law. Number 1. Daniel Holtzclaw after completing his shift, 27-year-old Daniel Holtzclaw, an officer for the Oklahoma City Police Department, drove his assigned police car back to his residence on the morning of June 18th of 2014. Even though the officer was off duty at the time, he reportedly initiated a traffic stop while on his way home. The driver he'd pulled over was later named as Janine Ligons, aged 57. Holtzclaw chose not to report the traffic stop to police dispatch and didn't run a background check on the driver, as standard procedure dictated. Instead, the officer reportedly forced Ligons to engage in intimate relations with him. The woman would later tell investigators that she'd feared for her life and had desperately pleaded with Holtzclaw to stop the assault. The officer eventually left the scene without causing any further harm to Ligons, who promptly filed an incident report with the OKCPD. The following day, Holtzclaw was pulled aside during his afternoon shift at the Spring Lake Division Police Station. He was subsequently interrogated for two hours by detectives Kim Davis and Rocky Gregory. Holtzclaw vehemently denied the accusations levied against him by Ligons, but he was placed on paid administrative leave, pending a more thorough investigation. Eventually, the detectives learned that Ligons had not been Holtzclaw's first assault victim. In all, investigators brought together 13 women who were willing to testify that the officer had abused them in a manner similar to the way he'd preyed on Ligons. Holtzclaw had reportedly targeted an impoverished area of Oklahoma City, where he would initiate unreported traffic stops. He then allegedly ran record checks to find information that could be used to coerce prospective victims into having non-consensual relations with him. Following his criminal trial, Holtzclaw pleaded guilty to 18 of his 36 charges and was ultimately sentenced to 263 years in federal prison. Number 7. Joe Brown The star of the hit reality court show, Judge Joe Brown, was arrested on March the 24th of 2014 and charged with five counts of contempt of court. In addition to regularly appearing on television during his series' run of 15 seasons, Brown formerly served as a criminal court judge in Shelby County, Tennessee. As a favor to an acquaintance, Brown had agreed to review a child support case being presided over by Magistrate Harold Horn. According to Horn's account of the incident, Brown grew increasingly hostile towards the magistrate after he refused to discuss ancillary details of the case that were not written in the schedule. Brown repeatedly shouted at Horn and challenged his judicial authority. The outburst resulted in the former TV judge being sentenced to five days in jail at the Shelby County Corrections Facility in Memphis. Brown's behavior proved detrimental on a grander scale as his arrest occurred during his campaign for the county's district attorney position. He went on to lose the general election to the Republican incumbent, earning just 35% of the vote. Number 6. Jessica O'Brien Jessica O'Brien stepped down from her position on the Circuit Court of Cook County, Illinois, after it emerged that she'd committed mortgage fraud during her career as a realtor. O'Brien had owned and operated a real estate company for a number of years prior to her judicial election. In November of 2012, the 51-year-old had risen to prominence as the first Filipina judge elected in Cook County's history. Her husband, Brendan, was a fellow circuit judge, and the couple were well-respected within their community. 
According to O'Brien's 2017 indictment, the judge and her former business partner, Maria Bartko, had exaggerated their company's sales numbers in an effort to fraudulently obtain mortgages on two properties in the city of Chicago in 2004 and 2006. The inflated figures that O'Brien put on her mortgage applications ultimately defrauded her lenders of $1.4 million. She was brought to trial on bank and mortgage fraud charges and convicted of her crimes in February of 2018. O'Brien appeared remorseful during her court proceedings, tearfully shouting, I'm an embarrassment at one point in the trial. Despite her apparent contrition and her cries for leniency from the federal judge in charge of her case, she was ultimately sentenced to a year and one day in prison. In the wake of her conviction, O'Brien formally resigned from the court. Number 5. Cynthia G. Impareto Cynthia G. Impareto of Florida's 17th Circuit Court was arrested and charged with driving under the influence on November the 5th of 2013. On the night of her arrest, the call was made to 911, reporting an erratic driver who'd almost crashed their white Mercedes-Benz into multiple vehicles on the roadway. An hour later, a Broward County police officer initiated a traffic stop with Imperetto, who was driving a vehicle that matched the 911 caller's description. The officer had spotted Imperetto as she swerved and came perilously close to hitting a parked car and thus pulled her over. The circuit judge initially refused to follow the policeman's request for her to exit the vehicle, claiming she was going to call her attorney. She was unable to dial the numbers on her cell phone, however, and she then begrudgingly agreed to step out onto the sidewalk. The officer noted that Imperetto was visibly unstable as she made strenuous attempts to get out of the car, having to use the door to prop herself up. Imparetto refused to take a breathalyzer test, causing her driver's license to be suspended automatically. She pleaded not guilty to DUI charges in December of 2013, but was ultimately sentenced to 20 days of house arrest and a year of probation. The judge stopped presiding over criminal cases following her conviction, and in 2015, the Florida Judicial Qualifications Committee recommended she be given a 90-day suspension, as well as a $20,000 fine as a result of her DUI. While awaiting a final ruling by the Florida Supreme Court, Impareto made the decision to resign in February of 2016. Number 4. Diane Vittori Caraballo A former Mahoning County Court judge was convicted of stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from one of her deceased clients in June of 2019. 50-year-old Diane Vittori Caraballo of Youngstown, Ohio, was first elected as a Sebring Court judge in 2002 and was subsequently re-elected to the position in 2006 and 2012. In addition to her judicial responsibilities, Caraballo also operated a private law practice. One of her clients was Robert Sampson, whose will she drafted prior to his death in 2015. She then submitted an application to administer Sampson's estate, falsely claiming that he'd passed away without leaving a will. The court instead handed administrative duties over to Sampson's sister, Dolores Falgiani. Caraballo prepared Falgiani's will on November 3, 2015. Most of her estate was left to various friends and family members, while the rest of it was given to two animal charity organizations in the area. Falgiani ultimately passed away in March of 2016, at which point Caraballo filed an application to probate her deceased client's will. While reviewing Falgiani's estate, the judge reported the discovery of $20,000 in cash in the woman's home, which was then purportedly deposited into her estate. During the next two years, Caraballo filed reports of newly discovered assets on a number of occasions. With each report, the judge secretly siphoned varying amounts of money from her late client's fortune. In total, Caraballo stole $328,000 from Falgiani's estate, the full amount of which she was ordered to pay in restitution upon her conviction. She was also sentenced to 30 months in prison and three years of supervised release. Number 3. Timothy Nolan In 2018, a district judge from Campbell County, Kentucky, was found guilty on human trafficking charges and other related felonies. Timothy Nolan, aged 71, held his judicial office for nearly three decades, during the course of which he'd become well-known for his strict sentences and hardened courtroom demeanor. He was also a staunch political activist, having worked closely with Donald Trump's presidential campaign in 2016. The former judge became the focus of an investigation which revealed that he targeted a total of 19 young women over a period of many years, forcing them to perform intimate acts against their will. 
Nolan reportedly made his victims take sedatives so as to prevent them from resisting his advances. As per his predatory modus operandi, he would threaten to arrest them or evict them from their homes if they contacted law enforcement or refused to perform the acts he demanded. Nolan ultimately pleaded guilty to the 21 various charges levied against him in court. Although he attempted to prolong his trial by firing his attorney and threatening to withdraw his guilty plea, Nolan was eventually sentenced to the maximum prison term of 20 years and was also ordered to pay a fine of $100,000. Number 2. Lynn Rosenthal Florida Judge Lynn Rosenthal was taken into custody by police after she'd collided with a concrete median and struck a patrol car on the way to work. Rosenthal approached the judge's parking lot at the Broward County Courthouse shortly before 9 a.m. on May the 27th of 2014. A deputy present at the scene witnessed the sitting judge driving erratically as she sideswiped a parked police car with her BMW. She kept driving eventually crashing into the security gate near the entrance to the parking lot. She reversed her vehicle and hit the gate several more times. The deputy stopped her and requested she exit the car. Rosenthal was noticeably unsteady and struggled to step out onto the pavement. Her speech was slurred and she freely volunteered the information that she'd been involved in another crash earlier that morning. Rosenthal said that a truck had tried to run her off the road, causing her to collide with a median on the interstate. She claimed to have recorded the incident with her cell phone camera. Officers reviewed the footage Rosenthal had captured, only to discover that the judge had crashed into the divider due to her own inability to stay in a single lane and not because of any other vehicle. Although there was no alcohol found in Rosenthal's system, she did admit to taking an Ambien pill the night before her arrest. She was charged with a DUI and eventually resigned from the 17th Circuit Court in October of 2015. She was the third Broward County judge found guilty of driving under the influence within a six-month period after the convictions of Cynthia Imparetto and Giselle Pollock. Number 1. John A. Westhafer On March the 4th of 1996, an innocent woman was wrongly convicted of murder and arson. She was sentenced to 60 years in prison by Circuit Judge John A. Westhafer of Decatur County, Indiana. Christine Bunch, who was 22 years old and pregnant at the time of her conviction, had survived a house fire which had engulfed her living trailer and taken the life of her son, Anthony. An investigation into the origins of the blaze was subsequently conducted by a state arson analyst named Brian Frank. He determined that the fire had been started at two separate locations within the mobile home and that a liquid accelerant such as kerosene or lighter fluid had helped spread the flames throughout the rest of the residence. Based on Frank's findings, which were corroborated by a federal forensic investigator, Bunch was arrested for igniting the deadly fire. At Bunch's 1996 trial, Judge Westhafer baselessly accused the woman of getting herself impregnated in order to avoid serious punishment. He insisted that she would not be the one to raise the child she was carrying before handing down the maximum prison sentence of 60 years. Bunch served more than 17 years behind bars before she was eventually exonerated of the crime. Investigators ascertained that the kerosene present in the home at the time of the fire could have been attributed to the kerosene-powered heater in the living room. As a result of this discovery, it was determined that the accelerant was not poured on the floor by Bunch as the prosecution had previously argued in court. West Hafer retired in January of 2012, just a few months prior to Bunch's release from prison. Number 7. La Rosa Maria Walker Asakir and Dwight Broom Palmer Two high school basketball coaches at the Elite Scholars Academy in Jonesboro, Georgia, were criminally charged following the death of a student at basketball practice. Before she succumbed to heat stroke, 16-year-old Imani Bell was participating in a mandatory conditioning activity for the girls' basketball team on August the 13th of 2019. Outdoor temperatures had reached the upper 90s that day and the area in which the school was located had been put under a heat advisory. In spite of the dangerous heat level, head coach La Rosa Maria Walker Asakir and her assistant coach Dwight Broom Palmer forced the players to continue their conditioning training outside. Bell was running up the steps of the bleachers when she suddenly indicated that she was under some sort of distress. She required physical assistance to walk during the final lap of the exercise. Shortly thereafter, the student-athlete collapsed at the top of the stairs. The adults at the scene attempted to cool her down by 
dousing her in ice water, but Belle remained unresponsive. Paramedics arrived at the school within minutes and Belle was taken to Southern Regional Medical Center, where she would later go into cardiac arrest. She was pronounced dead at 8.23 p.m., less than three hours after her initial collapse. Walker, Asakir and Palmer faced charges of second-degree murder in connection to the incident. A local district policy requires schools to cancel outdoor athletic activities in the event that the heat index rises above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. On the day of Bell's passing, the heat index had swelled to 106. Number 6. Esther Stephen and Shelby Heistand, a pair of high school softball coaches from Portland, Indiana, were arrested following the fatal shooting of Shea Breyer, aged 31, on January the 12th of 2020. Esther Stephen, also 31, and Shelby Heistand, aged 18, conspired to carry out the murder while the former and Breyer were in the midst of a heated legal battle over the custody of their child. The two women had first met up at a church in Fairview on the night the killing took place. They called Breyer and made plans to pick him up at his home in Portland. Upon doing so, the three drove to a bridge on County Road 125 West. While on the bridge, Stephen distracted Breyer long enough for Heiston to grab a 22 caliber rifle and shoot the man in the back. Breyer was found lying in the middle of the road at approximately 2 a.m. and was subsequently transported to the hospital where he was later pronounced dead. Stephen and Heiston, who both served as coaches for the Fort Recovery High School softball team, were arrested two days later in connection to the shooting. Stephen reportedly told law enforcement that she'd become angry with the victim after he expressed an intention of establishing his paternity for the child they shared. Breyer also allegedly petitioned for child custody, filed for parenting time and sought a name change for the child. Both suspects were ultimately sentenced to 55 years in prison for the murder. Number 5. Joyce Churchwell The volleyball coach at Berry Hill High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was taken into police custody after allegedly engaging in intimate relations with a male student and a former teacher. Joyce Churchwell, aged 40, first contacted the student via Snapchat in mid-2019, sending him explicit videos and photographs. The coach, along with the unidentified female teacher, then invited the student over to her house, claiming her husband was out of town at the time. The student would later admit to law enforcement that he subsequently went to Churchwell's residence and had intercourse with the two adult females. In January of 2020, a warrant for Churchwell's arrest was issued by Tulsa police. She turned herself in and was placed on a leave of absence by the Berry Hill School District. Investigators discovered that the coach had sent additional messages to another student who hadn't followed through in her office to meet up. Churchwell faced criminal charges as a result of the incident and her teaching certification was revoked by the Oklahoma State Board of Education. Number 4. Logologoa Tevasu A member of the coaching staff for the Santa Rosa Junior College football team was sentenced to a lengthy prison term following a fatal DUI accident on a frequently circulated California roadway. On the evening of November the 5th of 2017, 35-year-old Logalagoa Tavasu was driving southbound down Lakeville Highway while under the influence of alcohol. The assistant football coach was reportedly swerving in and out of the painted lines, recklessly passing other vehicles in his 2006 Dodge Ram pickup truck. Tavasu's hazardous driving turned deadly when he crossed all the way over to the other side of the double yellow lines, moving directly into the path of oncoming northbound traffic. The drunk driver collided head-on with a 2015 Toyota Corolla being driven by Paulette Quiba, aged 21, a business student at Sonoma State University. The violent crash not only involved the vehicles driven by Tavasu and Quiba, but three additional cars as well. Emergency responders were dispatched to the scene and three of the individuals involved in the wreck were transported to Memorial Hospital. A total of five people suffered minor to moderate injuries, while Quiba ultimately passed away from hers. She had been driving to her home in Ronert Park after spending the night with family members. They had been celebrating the 10th anniversary of their arrival in the United States from the Philippines. Tavasu's blood alcohol level was roughly three times the legal driving limit at the time of the accident, and in the aftermath, he was held on charges of murder and drunken driving. 
the former football coach would have faced the lesser charge of manslaughter for Kweba's death, but he'd already been given a DUI conviction back in 2011. This caused his charge to be upgraded to second-degree murder, and a judge sentenced him to 15 years to life behind bars. Number 3. Hayley Renault A 23-year-old volleyball and basketball coach from Washington, Illinois, was arrested after it was discovered that she'd slept with a student. In 2018, Hayley Renault was chosen to become a member of the coaching staff for both the girls' volleyball and basketball teams at Washington Community High School. She'd previously been a standout athlete at the school herself, before going on to play basketball at Eureka College. On July the 29th of 2019, Renault resigned from her coaching roles after allegations surfaced that she'd used her position of authority to establish an inappropriate relationship with a Washington student. Local police arrested the former coach on August the 5th and she subsequently faced criminal charges in relation to her improper conduct. She was sentenced to 90 days in jail and two years of probation, during which she was ordered to perform an unspecified number of community service hours. Today's topic was requested by P. Calls, Mary Broom, Dove Master and Sea Witches on Rye. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Taylor Boncal Taylor Boncal, aged 22, was accused of maintaining an inappropriate, intimate relationship with a high school student while she served as the coach of the school's track team. In 2017, Boncal was finishing up her teaching degree at Central Connecticut State University when she first came into contact with the 18-year-old male. As part of the requirements associated with her field of study, Boncal was a student teacher at Conard High School in West Hartford. The student with whom she would eventually strike up a relationship was in the social sciences class she taught. After graduating from her collegiate program, the Beacon Falls native was asked to join the school staff as an assistant track coach. The male student subsequently asked for Boncal's phone number and the two began dating in December of 2017. During the course of their involvement with one another, Boncal and the student reportedly had intercourse on multiple occasions with all of their meetings occurring outside of school property. The details of their relations were revealed to the school resource officer in West Hartford by an uninvolved student. Boncal was promptly fired by Conard High School and a warrant for her arrest was issued by the authorities, at which point she turned herself into the police. Rather unexpectedly, the parents of the male student claimed that he and Boncal were in love and consequently requested the former track coach not be prosecuted. While Boncal did initially face charges stemming from their relationship, she was admitted to a special rehabilitation program that resulted in the dismissal of all her charges. Number 1. Joseph Mills On September the 4th of 1981, 31-year-old Linda Patterson Slayton of Lakeland, Florida, was found dead in her apartment, with evidence indicating that she'd been fatally strangled. Nearly four decades later, investigators were able to use DNA analysis to identify Slayton's killer as her son's former football coach, Joseph Mills, who hadn't been on the initial list of suspects. According to documents from the original court proceedings, Slayton's son Tim, who was 12 at the time of the incident, had told police that Mills had driven him home from practice on September the 3rd, the day before his mother's murder. In an interview with law enforcement, Mills claimed to have had a brief conversation with Slayton after she came outside to thank him for giving Tim a ride. According to Mills, he then left the residence and never returned. DNA recovered from the crime scene didn't match anyone in criminal databases and the case subsequently went cold for 38 years. It wasn't until June of 2019 that police were finally able to name Coach Mills as the perpetrator of Slayton's killing. The positive identification was made by investigators through a process called genetic genealogy. Forensic analysts cross-reference DNA from a crime scene with public genealogy databases, which consist of DNA that has been voluntarily uploaded by members of the general population. In doing so, scientists at Parabon Nano Labs were able to select Mills as the most likely culprit of the decades-old crime. Upon confirming that Mills was responsible for the crime, Lakeland police took the 58-year-old into custody. Mills insisted that Slayton had died while the two were engaged in consensual intercourse, 
but evidence at the crime scene suggested otherwise, and he was charged with first-degree murder. Number 11. Caroline Jury On April the 4th of 2021, 28-year-old Caroline Jury was arrested for snatching the crown from the new Miss Sri Lanka's head. Jury, who'd won the title in 2019 and was also the reigning Miss World at the time, claimed that 31-year-old Pushpika da Silva didn't deserve the title because she was divorced. During the ceremony, which took place at Nelam Pakuna Mahinda Rajapaksa Theatre in Colombo, Jury yanked the crown from da Silva's head, leaving her with head injuries. She was charged with assault and arrested, but was seen leaving a police station on April the 8th after being released on bail. De Silva needed hospital treatment after the incident and was given back the prize as the event organizers announced that she wasn't a divorcee. Because jury refused to make a public apology, Miss Sri Lanka was determined to take things to court. Following the incident, the woman resigned from her title of Miss World. Number 10. Madison Cox on May the 23rd of 2016, 17-year-old Madison Cox was arrested and charged for forging doctor's notes to skip class at her high school in South Carolina. A year prior, Cox had won Most Photogenic at the Miss South Carolina Teen International Beauty Pageant. The former beauty queen was allegedly caught counterfeiting slips from a chiropractic practice in Duncan named the Paris Family Chiropractic. According to police statements, Cox had stolen a notepad from the practice and penned the letters to cover her absence from class. However, the date she'd written on the slips could not be accounted for as the doctor's office was either closed on those days or Cox hadn't been registered as a visitor. Number 9. Laura Zuniga On December the 22nd of 2008, 23-year-old Mexican model Laura Zuniga was arrested along with seven suspected drug traffickers at a military checkpoint in Zapopan outside Guadalajara. They were traveling in two trucks filled with guns and ammunition as well as 16 cell phones and $53,300. One of the men in the group was identified as Hangel Orlando Garcia Urquiza, the brother of an alleged drug trafficker and appeared to have been her boyfriend. Zuniga, a former preschool teacher, was due to represent Mexico in an upcoming international pageant after winning the Miss Sinaloa title in 2009. She told police that she was planning on traveling to Bolivia and Colombia to do some shopping. In a later interview for Radio Formula, Zuniga claimed to have been kidnapped by her boyfriend, Urquiza, and that she had no knowledge of his illegal activities. She was initially sentenced to 40 days in custody but was released and charges against her were dropped as there was no evidence that tied her to criminal activity. Her story inspired the 2011 film Miss Bala. Number 8. Kendra Gill On August the 3rd of 2013, 18-year-old Kendra Gill was arrested in Utah for making and throwing potentially fatal bombs from a moving car. She was charged with felony bomb possession along with three other friends after driving around a suburban area and throwing plastic bottles filled with tin foil and toilet cleaner. Following the arrest, Gill expressed remorse and stepped down from her position as Miss Riverton. The former beauty queen and her friends had reportedly targeted other friends as a prank and claimed to have meant no harm. Although nobody got hurt, officials stated that the improvised bombs could have caused great injuries or even death. They were initially charged with possession of an explosive device, punishable by 1 to 15 years in prison. However, in September of 2013, the teenagers pleaded guilty to the reduced charges of attempted possession of chemical or incendiary devices and were required to complete 200 hours of community service. Number 7. Kia Hampton On May the 28th of 2017, 28-year-old Kia Hampton was arrested in Allen County, Ohio for bringing drugs onto government facility grounds. Hampton, who'd been crowned Miss Kentucky USA in 2010 as the first African-American woman to represent Kentucky in the competition, was caught smuggling 2.82 grams of marijuana into the Allen Correctional Institution in Lima. She was bringing the drugs to Jeremy Kelly, an inmate at the prison. 
officers from the Ohio State Highway Patrol caught on to Hampton after listening to recorded phone calls. After gathering sufficient evidence, they warranted a cavity search and later reported that while the woman was interrogated, she reached into her pants leg and pushed out a marijuana-filled balloon to the floor. Although prosecutors pushed for a prison sentence, Hampton received probation following a hearing in March of 2018. Number 6. Laura Mojico Romero In February 2021, 25-year-old Laura Mojico Romero was detained in Huatusco, a city in the Mexican state of Veracruz, on accusations of being part of a kidnapping gang. Romero was originally from the city of San Juan Bautista Tuxtepec in Oaxaca and had won the Miss Oaxaca Regional Beauty Contest in 2018. The beauty queen faced up to 50 years in prison, if proven guilty. She was captured along with three other women and five men after a sting operation held by personnel specialized in kidnapping. According to the latest update on the case, Romero and the seven other alleged kidnappers remained in custody for two months after the arrest. The investigation is ongoing. Number 5. Nikki Potit In August of 2020, 34-year-old American woman Brittany Nicole Potit was charged with two counts of serious assault for allegedly whipping her ex-boyfriend with a metal dog chain. The woman, who'd moved to Australia in 2014, was reported to have left gashes across the 43-year-old's back after flogging him inside their Sydney home. Police charged her with a second count of assault for also breaking the man's nose. Known by her nickname as Nikki, she had performed as a professional wrestler for Kingdom Wrestling Entertainment and was also crowned Miss Virginia USA in 2011. However, soon after, Nikki was forced to give back her crown after posting a picture of herself wearing it with the caption, Miss Alcoholic USA. Her accusations were adjourned to Burwood Local Court in September. Number 4. Oria Vasquez Rios On June 30, 2013, Puerto Rican woman Oria Vasquez Rios was arrested in Madrid by the Spanish National Police on accusations of conspiring to murder her estranged husband. The former Miss Puerto Rico Petite winner had been on the run for over seven years. On September the 23rd of 2005, Rios and Adam Joel and Hang, from whom she was finalizing a divorce, were leaving a nightclub together after paying hitman Alex Babon $3 million to kill her husband, Rios, Lord and Hang, to an agreed upon spot in Old San Juan, where Babon stabbed and beat him to death. To hide her involvement, Rios claimed to have also suffered minor injuries during the attack and made it seem like a mugging gone wrong. Initially, authorities mistakenly arrested and jailed an innocent man for the assassination. Rios was not suspected until a subsequent independent FBI investigation found Pabon guilty for the murder in 2008. However, by that time, the former beauty queen had fled to Italy in 2006 and managed to stay in hiding until June of 2013. After being detained by the Spanish police while incarcerated, Rios became pregnant and had a baby. She then married the father in jail in an attempt to have the Spanish court prevent her extradition as being the mother of a Spanish citizen. However, only one month after giving birth, in September of 2015, she was extradited to Puerto Rico under FBI custody. Her trial was set to begin on August the 28th of 2017, but it was delayed until August the 21st of the following year. In October of 2018, Rios was found guilty of her indictment and sentenced to life in prison. Number 3. Adayane Matthias In September of 2012, 20-year-old beauty pageant contestant Adayane Matthias confessed about conspiring to murder Oliveira aged 21 after losing to her during a Brazilian competition. Oliveira beat Matthias in the final round of the contest, which took place in Cariesica, southeast Brazil, winning the chance to play a starring role in the music video of a popular local band. Craving recognition as a dancing duo, Matthias and her partner, Julia Messon Baston, plotted to kill Oliveira, hoping that eliminating her rival would gain Matthias the pageant prize. The 20-year-old also involved Diavid Correa 
in the plot, her boyfriend at the time, convincing him to be the one to kill Oliveira as a proof of love. On September the 21st of 2012, just hours before the filming of the music video was due to take place, Oliveira was shot dead in a hotel garden by Correa. After the killing, he allegedly texted his girlfriend saying, now you can have some ham with your breakfast, where ham is believed to be Brazilian slang for dead body. Soon after, Matthias and Baston confessed to planning a killing and all three involved have been charged with first-degree murder. Today's topic was inspired by Lizzie Melizzy Johnny. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Darlene Gentry In February of 2007, Darlene Gentry was found guilty of murdering her husband and sentenced to 60 years in prison. Born in Cameron, Texas, she was married to Keith Gentry, whom she'd met at Texas State Technical College. The former homecoming queen and Keith had been married for six years when on the morning of November the 9th of 2005, Darlene called 911 for her husband. She told the operator that they hadn't slept together the night before and that when she'd gone into his room in the morning, she found him gurgling with pink foam around the mouth. She also stated that all his guns were gone and that their back door was open. When police arrived, they found Keith Gentry had been shot in the head but was still alive. However, there were no signs of forced entry around the house. The man was rushed to the hospital and while searching the area, police found a stack of weapons just outside the Gentry home. They also found it suspicious that Darlene, a registered nurse, had done nothing to help her husband. So they took her to the station for interrogation. An hour into the woman's interview, Keith was deemed brain dead. After taking Darlene to the hospital to sign papers that would take her husband off life support, officers returned her to the station, where they decided she was the prime murder suspect. Further investigations revealed that Darlene had shot Keith herself with a nine-shot, 22 caliber revolver his father had given him that she later disposed of in a pond. Number 1. Ruth Commande in May of 2018, 24-year-old Kenyan Ruth Kamande was sentenced to death for murdering her boyfriend, Fareed Mohammed, three years prior. While awaiting trial, Kamande won a beauty pageant in jail and was crowned Miss Langata Prison in Nairobi. After the verdict, she repeatedly tried to appeal the country's Supreme Court decision to sentence her to death, but her efforts proved fruitless. Mohammed's family reportedly requested a sentence to match the crime after Kamande had stabbed him 25 times with a kitchen knife. The Kenyan woman claimed that her boyfriend had tried to infect her with HIV. However, the judge accused her of manipulative behavior and showing no remorse after the brutal attack that had left her boyfriend's dead body drenched in blood. Number 6. Henry Ruggs III on November the 2nd of 2021, professional football player Henry Ruggs III was involved in a fiery car crash that resulted in the death of a 23-year-old woman and her dog. Prior to the fatal incident, Ruggs had been regarded as a promising young player, having been selected by the Las Vegas Raiders with the 12th overall pick of the 2020 NFL Draft. The 22-year-old man and his girlfriend, Kiara Kilgo Washington, had allegedly been seen drinking at a top golf location in Las Vegas on the eve of the accident. They reportedly left the venue around midnight. According to local police, Ruggs was traveling down the roadway at speeds of up to 156 miles per hour. As he approached, a Toyota RAV4 driven by Tina Tintor at approximately 3.40 a.m., the man slammed on his brakes in an attempt to avoid the imminent collision. Unfortunately, his Chevrolet Corvette Stingray had been traveling too fast for his preventative efforts to succeed and it plowed into Tintor's vehicle at 120 miles per hour. Rugg struck the SUV with such violent force that the woman's car immediately burst into flames, trapping her and her dog Max inside. The Clark County coroner later determined that Tintor burned to death while she was stuck in the flaming vehicle. Ruggs and Kilgo Washington were taken to the University Medical Center of Southern Nevada to be treated for the minor injuries they'd sustained during the crash. Doctors discovered that Ruggs' blood alcohol level was 0.161% at the time, which was more than twice the legal driving limit in the state of Nevada. Upon his release from the hospital, 
Ruggs was remanded into police custody and charged with felony counts of DUI resulted in death and reckless driving. He was released by the Las Vegas Raiders less than 24 hours after his arrest. The case's preliminary court hearing was scheduled for March the 10th of 2022. Number 5. Mylan Cyrus An Instagram influencer known to her followers as Mylan Cyrus was jailed in the aftermath of a drug raid at an Indonesian hotel in November of 2020. At the time of her arrest, Cyrus had amassed more than 1 million social media followers and was regarded as a role model by many within the transgender community. She and a male friend had been suspected of partaking in the use of illegal drugs, which prompted officers to raid the Pierce Hotel room in North Jakarta. Cyrus and her companion were reported as having crystallized methamphetamine in their possession, and they were consequently taken into custody. Indonesian law enforcement's perceived mistreatment of Cyrus was met with outrage by her fans. They were particularly up in arms about the fact that she'd been placed in a men's detention facility at Tanjung Priok Port Police Station, rather than in a women's cell. The local police chief defended the decision by claiming that she'd been placed in the detention area that corresponded with the sex written on her citizen's identity card, which identified her as male. Amidst mounting condemnation of the police's handling of the situation, the social media celebrity was moved to a private cell. The charges levied against Cyrus in connection to her drug possession carried a maximum penalty of four years in prison. Number 4. Stephanie Peterson A Florida schoolteacher was arrested in February of 2018 after it emerged that she'd engaged in intimate relations with a male student. 26-year-old Stephanie Peterson, who was married at the time, had been employed as a science teacher at New Smyrna Beach Middle School. The boy with whom she'd been involved eventually told his parents about their illicit affair and law enforcement officials subsequently launched an investigation into Peterson's activities. According to the student's testimony, Peterson had begun sending him explicit photographs of herself in November of 2017. The boy alleged that in the months that followed, the teacher drove to his house during the late evening hours on several occasions in order for them to spend time together without his parents' knowledge. Peterson was also accused of purchasing marijuana for the victim as well as other drug-related paraphernalia. Her position was by definition one of a role model, but the woman used her authority to manipulate the young boy into keeping their romantic involvement a secret. As their relationship continued, the student's school performance reportedly began to suffer, which prompted him to inform his parents about the affair and finally put an end to it. Following her arrest, Peterson was charged with two counts of lewd battery and one count of transmission of harmful materials to a minor, to which she pleaded guilty in October of 2018. She was sentenced to serve three years in prison and an additional two years under house arrest. Number 3. Lisa Nowak One of the astronauts that was on board the Discovery during its mission to space in 2006 was later dismissed from both NASA and the United States Navy for assaulting a love rival. Lisa Nowak had cultivated a successful career as an aerospace engineer and a naval flight officer in the years preceding her dismissal. During her time in the Navy, Nowak had been awarded the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, the Navy Commendation Medal, and the Navy Achievement Medal. In 1996, she was selected to be part of NASA Astronaut Group 16, qualifying as a robotics specialist. Nowak was thus responsible for operating the robotic arms of the Discovery during the STS-121 mission to the International Space Station in July of 2006. The following February, Nowak was involved in a violent altercation at Orlando International Airport. The conflict had allegedly been triggered by Nowak's jealousy towards a U.S. Air Force captain named Colleen Shipman. The latter had recently started a romantic relationship with astronaut William Oifelein, with whom Nowak herself had previously been involved. Nowak drove her husband's car a total of 900 miles from Houston to Orlando where she confronted Shipman at the airport. The former astronaut pounded on Shipman's car window and pleaded with her to open the door. The Air Force captain eventually rolled the window down a couple of inches, at which point Noak sprayed mace into the vehicle. Shipman then fled the scene and contacted the police. When officers arrived, they reportedly watched Noak dispose of a trash bag at a parking shuttle bus stop. It was later discovered that she'd brought latex gloves, a black wig, a BB gun and ammunition, pepper spray, a hooded trench coat, a power drill, and an 8-inch folding knife with her to Orlando. 
She was thereupon charged with attempted kidnapping, battery, attempted vehicle burglary with battery, and destruction of evidence. After agreeing to a plea deal, Nowak was sentenced to one year of probation. She was terminated from NASA and discharged from the Navy under other than honorable conditions as a consequence of the incident. Today's topic was requested by Tiago. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Oscar Pistorius In February of 2013, a South African sprinter who had previously competed at both the Paralympic and Olympic Games was accused of murdering his girlfriend. Before his criminal charges put an end to his professional athletic career, Oscar Pistorius had become world famous for participating in and winning several international sprinting competitions. Having had both of his feet amputated as an infant due to a congenital defect, Pistorius eventually became a Paralympic champion in the summer of 2008. He was also the first amputee to earn a non-disabled world track medal at the 2011 World Championships in athletics. His role model status was further elevated the following year when he competed at the Summer Olympics, becoming the first double-leg amputee to do so. According to court records, Pistorius had been romantically involved with 29-year-old Reva Steenkamp for a period of three months before her death. In the early morning of February the 14th of 2013, Pistorius reached for his gun and fired four rounds through a locked bathroom door at his Pretoria home. In his defense, he claimed to have acted under the belief that an intruder had barricaded themselves inside. The bullets ended up hitting Steenkamp, who would gotten up during the night to use the restroom, and the injury she sustained ultimately proved fatal. Pistorius's ensuing murder trial was held at Pretoria High Court, where it was established that the former sprinter was, in fact, mentally stable at the time of the shooting and could therefore be held criminally responsible for his actions. On September the 12th of 2014, Pistorius was formally convicted of culpable homicide. He was initially sentenced to only five years in prison, but following a motion for a longer term by state prosecutors, the Supreme Court of Appeals increased the sentence to 15 years. Number 1. Aaron Hernandez Aaron Hernandez's burgeoning career in the NFL came to an abrupt end in 2013 when he was arrested and charged with the murder of his friend. Prior to his incarceration, Hernandez had come to be regarded as one of the premier tight ends in professional football while playing alongside quarterback Tom Brady for the New England Patriots. His prodigious athletic talent had been evident since his collegiate career, but many NFL teams were wary of selecting him in the draft due to off-the-field concerns regarding his personality and temperament. On June the 18th of 2013, police officers arrived at Hernandez's North Attleboro home. The police spent several hours searching the residence as part of their investigation into the fatal shooting of semi-professional football player Odin Lloyd, which had occurred the day before. Massachusetts State Police had obtained a search warrant for Hernandez's house after it emerged that he destroyed his home security system and hired a team of house cleaners on the same day authorities had located Lloyd's body at an industrial park, roughly one mile away. On June the 26th, Hernandez was taken into custody and officially charged with first-degree murder and other weapons-related offenses. He was released by the Patriots 90 minutes after his arrest had become public. It was subsequently reported that Hernandez's DNA had been found at the murder scene. Following his criminal trial, the former professional athlete was convicted of all charges and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. During the case's court proceedings, Hernandez was also indicted for an unrelated double homicide, which had taken place in 2012, but the additional charges were dismissed in 2017. Days after his acquittal, Hernandez was found dead in his prison cell, having reportedly hanged himself with a bedsheet. He was posthumously diagnosed with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, in connection to the routine head trauma he'd sustained while playing football. News of the diagnosis led to speculation that his medical condition might have been a factor in his erratic and violent behavior. Number 7. Kenneth Glasgow Reverend Kenneth Glasgow was charged with capital murder for his involvement in the fatal shooting of a 23-year-old woman. The half-brother of the famous Reverend Al Sharpton, Glasgow was a well-known human rights activist credited with founding a non-profit organization called the Ordinary People's Society. On the night of March 25th of 2018, 
Glasgow had reportedly driven an acquaintance of his named J.B. Towns around the city of Dothan, Alabama, as he searched for his stolen car. The two men ultimately tracked the car down and discovered that it had been taken by Brunia Jennings. Towns fired multiple gunshots at Jennings, who was sitting in the driver's seat of the stolen vehicle. She suffered fatal injuries while Towns and Glasgow subsequently fled the scene. Even though it was Towns who'd pulled the trigger, Glasgow was also hit with capital murder charges. Alabama law imputes charges to individuals found to have aided or abetted in the execution of a crime. While Glasgow awaited his murder case's final determination in court, he was arrested again following a traffic stop in which he was found to be in possession of cocaine. The pastor allegedly tried to swallow a packet of illegal substances in order to conceal them from the policeman who'd pulled him over. As the officer attempted to remove the bag from the reverend's mouth, Glasgow bit down on his fingers. He was charged with possessing a controlled substance, assault and tampering with evidence. In February of 2021, a grand jury ruled that there was insufficient evidence to convict Glasgow of capital murder and those charges were dropped while his other offenses were still pending in court. Number 6. David Love The pastor at New Hope Baptist Church in Independence, Missouri, murdered his best friend in cold blood in order to hide his decade-long love affair with the victim's wife. Pastor David Love and his mistress, Teresa Stone, came up with a plot to kill each other's spouses and run away together with the life insurance money they'd subsequently collect. On March the 31st of 2010, they set their plan in motion. Love fatally shot Stone's husband, Randy, in the insurance office where the man worked. The victim had been the pastor's best friend and a longtime member of his church's congregation. Love even went on to deliver an emotional eulogy at Randy's funeral. The next step of the scheme involved Love breaking his own wife's neck and staging a car accident to conceal the murder. Before he had the chance to commit a second murder, however, investigators began piecing together the details behind Randy's death. They ultimately landed on Love and Stone as the likely culprits. Police uncovered the fact that Stone had recently suffered a miscarriage, despite her husband having undergone a vasectomy many years prior. They deduced that Stone was having an affair and that she'd called on her lover to help to eliminate her husband. Stone eventually confessed to her extramarital activities and revealed that it had been Love who'd killed her husband of 19 years. The pastor maintained his innocence but after the evidence against him became indisputable, he was charged with first-degree murder. In November of 2011, he avoided the death penalty by taking a plea that reduced the charges down to second-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison while Stone was sentenced to eight years after pleading guilty to charges of conspiracy to commit murder. Number 5. Kenneth Copeland One of the most popular televangelists in the world publicly declared that he could cure his followers of COVID-19 and put an end to the pandemic altogether. He also encouraged viewers to continue paying tithes to his Fort Worth megachurch, even in the face of the economic crisis brought on by the outbreak. Kenneth Copeland is one of the most famous champions of the prosperity gospel, which supports the notion that God bestows material wealth upon those who are faithful in giving their money to the church. Copeland's net worth is estimated to be upwards of $300 million, largely as a result of the proceeds earned by his international ministry. He has long been criticized for his perceived misuse of church donations, having relied on his ministry's funds to purchase luxury mansions, private jets, and other personal indulgences. He faced further derision due to his behavior during the initial onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. In a televised sermon on March the 11th of 2020, Copeland told viewers to place their hands on their television sets so that he could permanently heal them of the disease. On March the 29th, Copeland claimed that he had executed judgment on COVID-19 and that the pandemic would come to an end as a result. During a sermon in April, in a video that was ridiculed online, he blew air out of his mouth in the direction of the camera, claiming to have blown the wind of God at the coronavirus. Copeland opened himself up to further criticism, as he'd also told members of his church who'd lost their jobs to continue paying their weekly tithe. Copeland's response to the pandemic was widely mocked, with many finding his statements 
dangerous, irresponsible, and to be minimizing the seriousness of the illness. Number 4. Jacob Malone 37-year-old Jacob Malone was accused of orchestrating a murder-for-hire plot while he was still incarcerated for a previous crime. Malone formerly served as the youth pastor at Calvary Fellowship Church in Downington, Pennsylvania. He eventually resigned from his position in November of 2015 after allegations had surfaced that Malone had abused a young woman who'd come to live with him and his wife. Church leaders learned of the assault, which had resulted in the victim getting pregnant, and Malone was consequently forced to step down. He pleaded guilty to the offense in 2017 and was sentenced to three to six years in prison by Judge Jacqueline Cody. While serving out his term, Malone reportedly asked fellow inmate Angelo Tomeo to murder both Judge Cody and the head pastor at the Fellowship Calvary, Harold Lee, who'd been a key witness in Malone's conviction. In exchange for carrying out the killings, Malone offered Tomeo over $5,000 but the latter turned him down and reported his proposal to detectives. Two months later, the former youth pastor approached yet another inmate with a similar proposition but was rejected once again. When investigators followed up on and confirmed Tomeo's claims about his former cellmate, Malone was ultimately charged with criminal homicide, aggravated assault, and terroristic threats. Number 3. Frederick Smith a pastor from Memphis, Tennessee, was arrested on felony theft charges after stealing the identity of a 77-year-old member of his church and using it to commit credit card fraud. The inception of Pastor Frederick Smith's scam dated back to May of 2015. Smith had asked Cleavy Williams, a founding member of the New Life Holiness Church congregation, to serve as a prayer leader on the church's motherboard. Williams was honored by Smith's request and enthusiastically accepted it but the decision swiftly proved to be ill-fated. Smith claimed that he would need certain pieces of personal information from Williams in order to make her position official. He subsequently obtained a social security number, driver's license, and information from one of her utility bills. Not long after giving this sensitive information to the pastor, Williams began receiving credit card invoices, showing charges between $10,000 and $60,000. She hadn't any knowledge of the purchases detailed on the statements, nor had she applied for the credit cards being used in the first place. Williams confronted Smith over the fraudulent charges, and her pastor admitted to signing up for the credit cards by using the personal information he collected from the elderly woman. He was taken into custody by Memphis police but later released. Smith failed to show up to his scheduled court appearance the day following his release and instead took to Facebook to declare his innocence. It was reported that Smith also committed a traffic infraction while awaiting his day in court. The vehicle he was driving at the time had been registered under Cleavy Williams' address. Smith was ultimately indicted on charges of felony theft and identity theft. Today's topic was requested by Miss Pratt, Stebo, Black Gemini, and Cat with the Strap. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Barry Minkow After masterminding one of the largest Ponzi schemes in history, Barry Minkow became a born-again Christian while serving out his 25-year prison sentence. As a result of his good behavior and apparent rehabilitation, he was granted an early release after just seven years served. During his incarceration, Minkow had become heavily involved in the prison's Christian ministry and had even taken biblical classes at Liberty University School of Lifelong Learning. Upon his release in 1995, he became the pastor of evangelism at a church in Chatsworth, California, also serving as the director of the church's Bible Institute. Two years later, Minkow was appointed as the head pastor at Community Bible Church in San Diego. In addition to his pastoral efforts, the infamous former convict also operated a for-profit investigative firm called the Fraud Discovery Institute, which worked to expose pyramid schemes and other forms of financial fraud. In an ironic twist, in March of 2011, Ming Kao pleaded guilty to insider trading in connection with his fraud discovery business and was sentenced to go back to prison for five years. Around the same time of his second conviction, rumors began circulating that Ming Kao had been defrauding members of his own church for some time. 
one elderly woman from the Community Bible Church claimed that the pastor had swindled her out of $300,000. A widower told investigators that Minkow had stolen $75,000 from him after claiming he would donate the money to a hospital in Sudan. Instead, Minkow directed much of the money given to the church towards helping to finance a movie about his life. He was sentenced to an additional five years as a result of his church-related scams. Minkow was ultimately released in June of 2019. Number 1. Matthew Phelps Matthew Phelps of North Carolina was working towards becoming a full-time pastor, having studied missions and evangelism at Clear Creek Baptist Bible College in Kentucky. On September the 1st of 2017, however, his plans for the future came to an abrupt end as he was arrested for the brutal murder of his wife, 29-year-old Lauren. The aspiring pastor had placed a call to 911 in the middle of the night, claiming that he had awoken to find his wife dead on the bedroom floor. He told the operator that there was a bloody knife on the bed and that he believed it was he himself who had carried out the fatal stabbing. Phelps admitted to taking coracidin, cough and cold medicine to help him sleep, but had reportedly ingested far more than the recommended dosage that night. He later told police that it was his medicine-induced stupor that caused him to unknowingly kill his wife. After initially pleading not guilty, Phelps ultimately pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to spend the remainder of his life behind bars. Although Phelps blamed his wife's death on his own abuse of coruscating, it was discovered in the case's legal proceedings that the couple's marriage had been fraught with rising tensions leading up to the incident. Phelps was allegedly spending more money than they could afford to lose and Lauren had consequently made plans to leave him. Additionally, it was revealed in court that Phelps had developed an obsession with the 2000 film American Psycho, which centers on a narcissistic man who is secretly a serial killer. Phelps had also expressed to a friend that he was curious what it would feel like to kill someone. The victim's autopsy indicated that she'd been stabbed a total of 123 times, including 44 cuts to her face and neck. Thanks for watching. Would you rather have to attend a two-hour church service every day of the week or have to brush your teeth once every hour you're awake? Let us know in the comments section below.